Hello everyone and welcome. I hope you're all doing well on this uh, fine Sunday morning, afternoon, night, depending on where you are in the world. Today we're going to be taking it back to the roots of competitive gaming. We're going to be having a clan war between XMT, the extreme meme team, and ODM. So for anyone who is wondering, you can probably see on the clan war tag here, it looks like the XMT does have quite a few more members, but actually they have a couple substitutes. So just in case certain players uh, can't stay as long or have to go, or maybe someone's not going to show up, they have a couple extra players. So uh, that's the reason why there's a couple more on that team. So welcome guys, thank you so much for joining. And I see that we also have a couple donations already. So a uh, big thanks to Grant E for the $2 donation. And uh, Professor Pipes, the leader and herald of the Extreme Meme Team with a $5 donation. Trying to pay me off a little bit before the uh, game start here, but it should be fun. So thank you guys so much for joining, welcome. We're gonna be jumping into our first match here in a, min in a minute, which is gonna be between, let's go ahead and take a look. It's gonna be Demi G and ODM Shidoku. So uh, it looks like we're going to have a Beastman versus Norskin matchup, and we are going to be on an open field map. So let me go ahead and let the players know that we can start. Start when ready. We should be good to go. Yeah, I know. You guys definitely have more players. But uh, like I said, they have substitutes. So it's not going to be like, you know, a 10 versus 7. And the format for today's tournament, it's not going to be a best of 7. Rather, each player is going to play every game, right? So it's going to be 7 on 7, 7 games in total, and the team with the winning score at the end of course, with that number of players, we're not going to have to worry about draws, but the, uh, the team with the winning score at the end will uh, be our champs for the day. So that's pretty much it. So yes, uh, I believe ODM is a French clan. I think uh, most of the players are in France. And the Extreme Meme Team heralds from all across the world. We have individuals from uh, Eastern Europe, America, all over the place. So so yeah, for anyone who is wondering. Yeah, it's just going to be seven games in total. So the stream will probably go about two hours today. This is the first game for anyone joining, so you guys have not missed anything. And like I said, it's going to be Beastmen versus Norska. So definitely, uh, it's a pretty fun matchup. I think that we're probably going to be seeing a lot of uh, Centigors, the throwing axes, and tools to take down the Femir and a lot of the heavy tools 
that Norska can bring, but who knows? Who knows, guys? Yeah, and let me know if the stream quality looks good, sounds good, everything's good on that front. Yeah. Make sure to support your clans as well. All right, so we're going to check in with the players, make sure they're good to go here. And yeah, we're going to have Norska versus Beastman, and uh, we can go ahead and take a look at the armies here. Oh, yeah, this is going to be good. Oh, yeah. So the players still picking the armies right now. We'll probably go back to the uh, desk here just so uh, no screen sniping can take place. Yeah, you guys are right on time. We're just starting. We're literally about seven minutes into the stream. This is the first game, first of seven games that we're going to have on stream today. And if you look here, you can see the uh, players. I don't know if it's going to be matched across the board, but essentially uh, each player is just going to play one game. So essentially it's a best of one between the players and the team with the winning score at the end will indeed win the, uh, the overall series. As a German, you're rooting for the non-French guys. <laughs> All right. Fair play, fair play. Hey, we'll see. Oh uh, yes, that intro that you guys saw before the video is on my channel. If you go and look, it's uh, I believe it's called uh, BFG Division uh, Warhammer version or edition. If you search BFG BFG Division and then search Warhammer, it will be one of the first videos that come up. It's was uploaded to my channel about five or six months ago. So yes, Arista Demo says I am German too, and he roots for his French neighbors. Yeah, the face cam is back for now. Yeah, it's not going to be on during the game, so I think it's a little bit distracting because I know a lot of you guys were saying that. Uh, making that in the comments, so just wanted to be fair there. No, it's not going to be seven games of them trying to beat Falcon because each player just plays one game. It's going to give each member of the clan a chance to play and kind of, uh, you know, fight for uh, supremacy here. So looks like the forces of Norska and Beastmen are ready to go. So I'm going to go ahead and initiate the starting of the battle. And as soon as the players are ready, let me go ahead and double check, make sure there's no concerns. He says, I'm ready. He says, let's go. And it's go time. So the first one, we're going to be on one of the Tomb Kings maps, which is very open field. Granted, neither of these factions are going to be super dependent on artillery or range tools, so it doesn't really matter that much. I mean, it does take away some sneaky vanguard options and things like that, but for the most part, I think it's going to be pretty much a, a null issue for uh, both of these factions here. Both very aggressive, going to be using you know heavy infantry and skirmishing tactics and things like that. So, um, let's see here. France for Germany is like Japan for China. <laughs> All right. All right. Yeah. No. Falcon is just going to be playing one game today. And the first one is going to be the team captain. So we have Demi G of the Extreme Meme Team and ODM Shidoku, of course, of Clan ODM, which is going to be good. Mirage, thank you for the kind words, man. Yeah, I thought about streaming every day. Yeah, maybe I will. Um, but again, I like to get video content out and maybe save the streams for the weekends when more people are on. Because if you stream during the week, oftentimes a lot of people are at work, things like that. So it's tricky. Hey, Ryan, thank you for the $2 donation. Bring me the Wookiee. Uh, we can get Wookiee halfway through the stream. We can go grab him. Yeah, we'll get him on the stream. He's, he just got a haircut, so he's not looking as decrepit and miserable as he usually does. Um, can you tell us the player matchups in advance? Uh, Petrucci, I'm not sure, actually. I'm just getting, I'm not, you know, admitting the back end of this tournament. I'm just mainly casting it today, so I don't know all the matchups in advance. But uh, as soon as we get into the games, the players will be picking their matchups and everything. I think they have it prearranged and everything, so. So, yeah, it's going to be good. All right, so uh, we're going to jump over here to the game. The Tomb of Shifting Sands, of course, one of the Tomb Kings map that did come with the Rise of the Tomb King. Uh, DLC, and it does have this massive uh, pillar in the middle, which is going to be interesting because it is going to cause line of sight issues. So if you guys take a little down the, the one faction is going to be deploying here. Granted, the Beastmen can uh, Vanguard deploy out of their deployment zone, so they might want to tr try and claim this high hill here. But for the most part, I think it's going to be a bit of a surprise as both forces rush up the hill. So let me go ahead and double check, make sure the uh, screen is looking good. So you can see up in the top left, we have Clan ODM and Clan XMT, and it's going to be seven games in total. The winning team, of course, will have the... Uh, you know, the winning record at the end of the day. Viva la France. Well, we'll see. We will see. You want to make some Macbeth puns, all right? So yeah, there might be some connection issues and some of the players are connecting from across the pond. But for the most part, I think all the players that are playing today have pretty good connections. So hopefully there won't be uh, any lag or anything. So we're going to be jumping into game one of this clan war. XMT ODM coming in here. And uh, we're going to see if the leaders of the clan can claim first blood for their uh, for the people here. And uh, Beastman vs. Norska. So we're going to see if we see some Mammoths. And uh, Airsick Hydra, thank you for the two, two euro donation. Go, go, XMT. You can do it. I have tea. <laughs> All right, man. Thank you. Thank you for the generous uh, donation there. All right. So here we are. Let's go ahead and take a look at the army of the uh, of the Beastman. So like I guess the Beastman, of course, some of the specialists of Vanguard deployment, they might be Vanguarding up in the hill. So for anyone who's new to the game in general, you can see that there's a deployment zone here. So this is where the Beastman can deploy and the Norskins or the Wild Savages of the North can deploy on this side of the map. So, you know, certain units, of course, do have Vanguard deployment. And a lot of the standard Beastman infantry have the capabilities of deploying up in the high ground here, which is going to be right in front of their opponent's army, which should be interesting. Uh, so as far as the, uh, oh my god, there's going to be a double Vanguard deployment. So yeah, the Norskins are going to be deploying right here, right on top of the Beastmen, which is going to be pretty disastrous, actually. So yes, Norskins have the capabilities of deploying outside of their Vanguard zone. And of course, when people are deploying, they can't see what the other person's doing. So right now, they're literally going to be deploying on top of each other. So 
for the forces of the Beastmen. In the front line, we got some Ungor Herds. These guys are just kind of a rank and file Beastmen. Very chaffy, low combat stats. They're pretty much going to lose to every single infantry unit, even the standard chaff unit of the uh, Norsekin roster, which are going to be the Marauders. So not going to be much there. On top of that, he does have a couple Raiders, which are a good choice. Uh, kind of a volume of fire unit, very poor missile quality overall. But for the most part, going to be okay against like Skin Wolves and lightly armored big targets. And uh, there's not any Mammoths here for the Norskins, but a lot of Skin Wolves, which are going to be pretty good targets. And for the rest of the Beastman army, it's going to be very mobile. So he has Centigors and Throwing Axes, which are pretty much a natural counter against a lot of the big targets with a 95 speed and the ability to run and kite and shoot 360 these guys are going to be throwing axes at skin wolves and just kiting and yeah they're just a solid pick i mean all around granted skin wolves do have the capabilities of regenerating through their damage so it's going to be a little bit scary but quite eager to see how they do on top of that he does have some minotaurs in the back somewhere i think he has the butchers of calcan guard so these are the regiment of renowned minotaurs and these bad boys are pretty solid. Good armor piercing, just solid combat stats across the board. But you know what's really good against them is the fact that they have light armor. Skin wolves, of course, with their bonus versus large, are going to be able to chew these guys up. So we're going to have some werewolves fighting minotaurs, which should be quite a bit of fun. Yeah, they're going to be healing. So in the back, we got spears, uh, more minotaurs with great weapons on the far side. So these are going to be the, the big papa anti-large armor piercing minotaurs. So these guys are going to be even better against large targets. So they're really going to make quick work of any of the uh, large Norskin targets they're able to get on. But... I don't know, it's going to be interesting. So, so far, I like Dimmy build. It's pretty well-rounded. Uh, of course, a lot of chaff units, and he does have a nice little kind of a layer. So he has an initial engagement force, and he's going to be pressuring the flanks using his speed. So it's going to be super micro-intensive for him. He's got some hounds. In the back, he does have a Bray Shaman with the Lore of Shadows. And uh, looks like he has Melkos Mystify Masma, as well as the uh, Enfeebling Foe, I think, is the other ability. And, of course, Morker. Morker is the most competitive choice. The ability to get 2,000 free gold worth of Chaos Spawn that you apply poison is very good. So the battle's underway. You can see the Norskins up on the high ground. A very Skin Wolf heavy build across the board. It looks like they have four or five Skin Wolves, a bunch of Norskin Hounds, standard Marauder Chaff, and on top of that we have a Marauder Chieftain. So going very cheap, very wide, and a Shaman Sorcerer with the Lore of Death. So the Vanguard deployment for the Werewolves. Uh, it looks like they were caught, but they're going to be jumping in here and actually karate chopping some of these guys. This is not going to be a good engagement for these infantry, but at the same time, they're also taking some missile fire from Overwatch. But what's really cool about Skin Wolves, if microed effectively, especially since these are the armored variant, he can pull them back and he's going to be able to heal them up pretty efficiently. So they're actually just making mincemeat of these Ungor herds, and they're probably going to be breaking pretty quick. Now, if we look on the flanks, there's some light skirmishing going on. Some of the Beastman Hounds are going to be collapsed on by the Hounds and the Werewolves of Norska here. And, oh man, it's looking a little bit tricky for the Beastman, but they're going to be collapsing in with the Butchers of Kalkengard. Minotaurs are going to be charging in here, and the Marauder Horsemen of the Norskin is going to be actually taking the engagement and the reason they're turning to fight here is just to kind of bait them in. And from there, they're going to be collapsing with this massive force. So the Skin Wolves and the Beasts of Tashnar are actually just regular Norskin Hounds. are going to be collapsing in the back. And the Beastmen here are going to have a really, really bad time. So, so far, the Norskins have certainly claimed dominance on this part of the battlefield. And some of the Skin Wolves coming down from the hill, they're going to be jumping on these Minotaurs. So the Minotaurs are going to be getting spanked pretty bad by the Anti-Large. And they're trying to get away. But Norska definitely has the mobility advantage here. The Skin Wolves are just swarming in numbers. And the Beastmen force on this flank has been completely pushed off. And now these Centigors, the Throwing Axes, aren't really going to be generating much value. They're just going to be getting chased by Norskin Warhounds and some of these Marauder Horsemen. On the other side, it's going uh, pretty good for Norska as well. Granted, the Minotaurs with Great Opens are coming in. Oh no, the Beastmen have actually claimed victory here. The Bray Shaman are doing really well. And these are standard combat Centigors who are also supported by Minotaurs with Great Weapons. So the Norskins are fended off here. Norskin Warhounds and the Skin Wolves completely pushed off. They have nine of their 18 models. So they're not going to be healing that much. So very good play from the Beastmen on this flank. And as far as the high ground goes, the Beastmen are still holding it. The Norskins are going to be pushing up the hill with their standard infantry, the Marauders, and these other troops. Uh, the Marauder Chieftain, in the meantime, is, uh, yeah, just kind of rolling on his uh, pimp chariot here, having a good old time. And you can see here the Beastmen have some of their Chaos Spawn. Some Morker is going to be using his first Chaos Spawn Summon to, uh, you know, kind of help support these uh, troops in the high ground here. And it looks like these Skin Wolves are kind of in a bit of a precarious situation. They're actually attacking Morker, and he's very, very tough to kill. He's got his Claw, he's got his Cane, he is ready to party. And if we look at the bounce of power, it's relatively even. I would say that the Norskins have a slight advantage. Uh, once their infantry do engage, they're vastly going to outclass the Beastmen infantry. But the Beastmen still have their Minotaurs with great weapons, but there's so many good natural counters. The Marauder Horsemen have those really good missile attacks, throwing these spears and javelins over here at the Minotaurs, who are unshielded. I mean, Centigors are a pretty good unit against them, but you can see the Centigors are already getting really beat up. They're being kited, and the Skin Wolves are just such a good answer here. And it looks like they're going to be taking the charge. So the Marauder Horsemen are going to be charging into the Centigors not going to be a good situation for those guys and so you just pretty much outnumbered i mean even though pound for pound one on one centaurs are a good choice if you look here it's not just marauder chieftains there's also some skin wolves and some of these bad boy werewolves kind of mixed in there so it's going to be tricky bounce power is still even we have a very pitched fight up here on the high ground it looks like the maws of savagery the marauder chieftain all these guys going in for a very heavy fight against uh against morker but morker is very tanky you don't want to focus him till the very end if you focus him earlier you're definitely going to be suffering some uh, pretty serious penalties here so the Shaman Sorcerer is going to be getting Enfeebling Focus on him by the Beastman Caster, and he's actually getting beaten down pretty bad. These Minotaurs with great weapons 
very good against anything that is not infantry size. So if you look at the Marauder Chariots, of course, it is a large unit. It's going to be taking quite a bit of damage there. And the Minotaurs are actually able to chase off the Marauder Chieftain. And these Maws of Savagery just got beaten into the dirt here by these Minotaurs with the very opens. You can see these guys are going down pretty bad. There's also a couple of Chaos Spawn in here. So yeah, it's not going to be long for the Skin Wolves. A couple of the Chaos Spawn actually getting punted by the charge of the other Skin Wolves. But Minotaurs with great opens are just such a damn powerful unit, especially the fact that they're saturated on top of the Chaos Spawn who are applying poison and just cutting these werewolves to pieces. So. So far, the Beastmen claiming a pretty serious advantage here in the monster fight, but if we look up here on the high ground, the Marauders are kind of working their way through the Beastmen chaff. The Beastmen invested a ton in Centigors, Minotaurs, very expensive units, so as far as their like, main infantry line goes, it's definitely pretty messy. The Norskin Barbarians are just going to be shield bashing these guys, just clubbing them into the Shadow Realm, basically. And yeah, it's not going to be the best situation. Looks like there's going to be an AoE debuff of some sort going off. It looks like it's going to be Enfeebling Foe cast on top of the Marauders. Not going to be the most effective because there's not anything really damaging them there. So perhaps that was a bit of a misclick. But if you take a big look at the battlefield overall, the Beastmen are going to be surging up here on the high ground, but I think it's going to be a losing battle. The Marauders are 89 models right here. We have 77 right here. Minotaurs aren't going to be want to be in sustained combat with just hordes of infantry with their light armor, but maybe they're going to be able to bull rush in there and get some fear and... I don't think they cause terror, these standard Minotaurs. I think only the Butchers of Kalkenbar do. And also something else for Norsk is that on the low ground, you can see the Norskins have kind of salvaged the battle. They've been able to chase off the Butchers of Kalkenbar and a lot of the very expensive Beastmen troops. So from here, the Maz of Savagery, the Marauder Chieftain, as well as the, uh, the Deathcaster, and all these guys are going to be charging in. And that's going to be a rear charge on the Beastmen. And as soon as any unit in this game is hit in the back or rear charge, it's immediately going to be a substantial penalty to their leadership, which means they could break. And yeah, the Marauder's honestly doing pretty good. And also, the thing about Norska that's really good in these sustained fights is the longer that the Barbarians fight, their rage mechanic is going to kind of kick in and make them very strong. So the Chariot's coming into the back, just riding into the back of these Beastmen forces. They're doing quite a bit of damage. And I think that's going to probably tank the leadership. You can see the Minotaurs are wavering. You know, these uh, Umbor Spears are going to be wavering. And with that rear charge coming in from the Norskins, now that they were able to kind of secure the rest of the battlefield, very good mobile play coming in here for uh, for Shidoku. He was able to pretty much just kind of route all the Beastmen, you know, reinforcements, make sure that they actually get pushed off the battlefield. I think he's probably just going to be collapsing here for an Alpha Strike. And the only thing that's really left, we have a Brace Shaman with Shadows. I think we have more for the Shadow Gave in here with this Claw. But uh, it's not going to be enough. I mean, he's going to fight for quite some time, but eventually he will just be surrounded and beaten down. And it uh, looks like yeah, there's some Skin Wolves in here who have some decent damage output. But, you know, what Shidoku should do is he should probably focus down the Shadowcaster. Uh, Morker is definitely one of the toughest things in the entire game to kill. He's just very tough. He has regeneration, of course, uh, you know, pretty durable against all sorts of attacks. So, yeah, you can see here he's going to be going after the Bray Shaman with the Lore of Shadows. And this, uh, this beast man, pretty heavily surrounded. You know, he's got his guy in the front trying to drop some whips. He's got his piggy here, but uh, not going to be great against all the Skin Wolves coming in. And also another thing about Norska that gives more longevity with all the Skin Wolves, those bad boys are going to be regenerating over the course of the whole battle. So if you don't finish them off and they come back, they're going to be kind of uh, netting you a lot of value. So we're very close to the end of the battle here. You can see the last Beast Lord is going to be fighting here, but he's getting knocked over by the Chariot. And that's probably going to be army losses. And it looks like that's going to be game one, guys. That's going to be game one for uh, First Blood is Drawn for Clan ODM and this Clan War. But it was a very close game. I think that the uh, Norskan army had a lot of advantages in regards to mobility. Uh, the Skin Wolves are a pretty natural counter against Minotaurs. I mean, Minotaurs can trade back, but for the cost, Skin Wolves do very good. They also had all the Marauder Horsemen, plus four groups of Norskan Warhounds, which were able to just dominate the mobile games. So from there, the Beastmen had a decent pocket in the center with Morker summoning the Chaos Spawn. But from there, the Norskins kind of came in a big envelope and came around and surrounded them and just kind of buttered their bread. So it uh, wasn't a whole lot they could do from there. So that's going to be First Blood, like I said, for uh, for Clan ODM here, guys. And uh, we're going to be moving on to game two. So these players are going to be stepping out of the lobby here in a moment. And uh, we're going to get the next two competitors in here. So yeah, it was definitely a good game. And also a couple donations I missed. So my apologies for that. So um, let me look here. All right, one second, guys. So Jason Denny, thank you for the $5 donation. He says, being of English and German descent, I shall root for XMT. Uh, Sinker, another $5 donation, says, first time watching the full stream. Love your content and keep it up. Yeah, thank you, Sinker. Appreciate it, man. And uh, Clint Bet with the 50, uh, I believe that's Swedish. Hope to see the Greenskin Vindictive Glare spam army. Well, we might see that. It's definitely a pretty powerful ability. And then uh, Holy Pilgrim. Thank you so much for the $20 donation, man. Um, XMT for the win. So we got a lot of XMT fans in here, it would seem. They are down one game, but again, there's going to be seven in total. So we have a lot more uh, lot more shows going on today. But thank you guys so much for the very generous donations. Appreciate it quite a bit. And we're going to be setting up the next game here in just a moment. So guys, we're going to take a quick intermission as we get the next players uh, into the lobbies. And uh, we'll put on some Beethoven or something fun for you guys. And uh, Eric Cartman, thank you for the uh, $5.65 donation. Really appreciate it, man. And uh, yeah, hopefully you enjoyed the autogen that we had a couple weeks back. I know that you were the one asking for a lot of autogens and whatnot. So we're trying. We're trying to mix it up a little bit. But uh, so we're going to have Falcon, the winner of the Eternal Challenger League. He actually won that last week. Uh, definitely quite the terror in the night. Looks like he's going to be playing the Lizard Men. So we're going to be seeing some big dinosaurs, all kinds of crazy shit coming in. Should be fun.
But we're going to take a quick intermission here, and we will be back in about, yeah, four or five minutes, give or take. We're just going to kind of get both players set up and make sure everyone can see the game. And from there, we will uh, do it to it. So thanks again, guys, and we will see you in just a minute.
All right, guys, and we're back. My apologies for the delay. Uh, we do have some different zones, of course. So oftentimes you guys have probably experienced this bug yourself in that if you are in a different zone, for example, you're in Germany or in France and coming, you know, playing in an American lobby, sometimes for some reason you can't see the games unless you've added the people on Steam. So we just took a quick moment there to add everyone on Steam. And from there, uh, we should be good to go for the rest of the stream. So it should be moving along quite a bit quicker. So big thanks to all of you guys for joining. I see we do have another donation. So big thanks to Desoct for the 10 euros. Thank you so much, man. Blood for the blood god, skulls for this for his throne. Not for the skull throne, but skulls for his throne. Got to read your message correctly. So thank you so much. And I saw we did have a donation on the uh, on the PayPal as well. So let me go ahead and double check that. Welcome, guys. Welcome. So in this one, we got a, a battle of the heavyweights. It's going to be Felcon facing off against ODM Reim. So Felcon, of course, the winner of the Eternal Challenger League Season 1 Grand Finals last weekend. Uh, definitely coming in with the steel chair here against ODM Reim. So as far as the map, I got to go ahead and switch that because we don't want to be playing on the same map yet again. We're going to be on the Essence of Chaos. Essence of Chaos. And it looks like we're going to have a showdown with the Empire and the Lizardmen. So, interesting matchup. Uh, we're probably going to see be seeing a lot of a cheap Empire Cav. The old pike and shot, halberd spears and guns and steel faith and gunpowder. You guys know the expression. Uh, Cedric Roth, thank you for the donation on PayPal as well for the, uh, for the big old five euros, man. Thank you. All right. So guys, let me make sure the screen is correct. Yeah, we're streaming a little bit earlier today. Hopefully that's better for you guys in Europe. I know usually I stream around noon, one o'clock. That can be a little bit tough. Uh, obviously, some of you guys have to go to bed in the morning, but yeah, we're trying to do it. We're trying to start a little bit earlier and get that rolling. So, so yeah, we're here with the Clan War. We've had one game so far. So currently ODM is up 1-0 and we're going to be playing seven games in total. So even though you can see uh, XMT does have more players, they just have substitutes. So they're only going to be putting forward seven players for today. And if it's a popular format and you guys enjoy it, we can always uh, do this more often. So we'll let the players know uh, they can start whenever they're ready. So uh, start anytime. But yeah, it sounds like they're probably still picking their armies. I'm going to go ahead and take a look. So yeah, Falcon, of course, a, a lizard men specialist. But uh, yeah, he's done very well with the, the light magic, the lore of light with his uh, slum. It's definitely one of his signature plays. But against Empire, I think using like a Soros Old Blood or Krakar is probably going to be a little bit more sustainable. You're going to have to deal with Demogriff Knights and Karl Franz and these big, you know, powerful flying beasts, essentially. So... Yeah, it's going to be good. Yeah, 7.45 for you guys in Central Europe. Okay, that's good. Yeah. Yes. And it looks like Felcon is ready to go. ODM Reim is going to be making his last picks, and we will be switching over to the battle here shortly. And uh, yes, as far as the song in the beginning, for anyone who's wondering, I know a lot of you guys were asking, it's uh, BFG Division by uh, Mick Gordon is the name, but it's just from the Doom 2016 soundtrack. So uh, that's probably why a lot of you guys recognize it, but... What's cool about using like game soundtracks in terms of like YouTube and, and putting it on streams and things like that is typically you don't have issues with copyright stuff because, you know, it's a game soundtrack. So you can get away with such things, which is nice. Um, yeah. I don't think we're going to see Hellblaster Volley Guns, unfortunately, Mr. Shami. Uh, I have a feeling it's not going to be a popular pick here. You might see Hammer the Witches, which is pretty good. It does do magic damage, so it can circumvent some physical resists. Um, even just a standard Great Cannon is often pretty good. I mean, there's so many big juicy targets on the Dinosaur roster. I mean, they're literally a roster filled with dinosaurs, like lizard people and, and giant reptiles and stuff. So pretty good for a big old cannon to shoot at. Uh, who fought in the first match? So we had Dimmy G facing off against Shudoku in the first match, which was good. It was a close game, very fast and explosive, but it came down to the wire and uh, Norska was able to pull that one out. Yes, absolutely. So let me go ahead and start the battle here. Ram is going to be making some last minute changes, but I have a feeling we're probably going to see like a Galmaraz, Karl Franz, or maybe a Boris Toddbringer. Toddy's pretty good. He's, you don't have to babysit him as much, which is really nice. Karl Franz is more of a glass cannon type character. He comes with a hammer. He's got that steel chair, you know, but at the end of the day, he doesn't have the means of healing himself. So you have to invest a lot of wins of magic. Whereas Toddy isn't going to hit quite as hard, but he does heal himself with the uh, Midland Rune Fang. So anyways, guys, we're going to be playing on the Essence of Chaos. Essence of Chaos, a very small map. Granted, there's enough opportunity for the Empire to sit back and shoot if they want to, but I have a feeling we're probably going to be seeing a bit more of an aggressive Empire build using like Demogriff Knights and maybe like handgunners and things like that. You're not going to see like a very cannon heavy build on this map. I don't think. It's a very, very close quarters map. Um, Professor Pone says, Turn, how many Warfire throws will we see today? Probably none because it's a piece. Those are just absolute pieces of shit. Um, Hayden says, Turn, you're the king of thumbnails. Thanks, man. Glad you enjoy it. Cheers, man. All right, so we are here on the map. It's going to be, player I mean, there could be some sneaky Empire deployment up here on the high ground, maybe if they want to like, yeah, but hopefully we don't see any corner camping today. I don't think we're going to see that. Granted, if I were playing the Dawi, I mean, I would just have a full on chub if I were able to deploy up here. I mean, you could literally just choke these points and have guns, which would be pretty strong. But I have a feeling these guys are going to be a little bit more friendly uh, with this match here today. 
So we're going to see if XMT can come back from their 1-0 deficit right here. ODM Reim is going to be leading of the forces who are going to be helped by Karl Franz, the Emperor of, uh, of Man here. So he's going to be quite powerful. Anti-large. Uh, well, he doesn't have anti-large, but if he does pop Galmaraz, he does. But he does not actually have it. So he's going to be going with the Reichlin Runefang. He has anti-large. He has armor piercing. He still has his big old hammer. I mean, he's pretty good against dinos. But again, if he gets surrounded by a bunch of, uh, you know, let's say cold ones or, you know, even ends up fighting a source old blood, he's going to, you know, it's going to be a fisticuffs fight for sure. On top of that, he does have a Jade Wizard. So the Jade Wizard is going to be bringing Earth Blood and Regrowth, which is very important, pretty much mandatory if you are playing Karl Franz. And for the front line of the Empire, it's going to be a combination of Spearmen and Greatsword. So Spearmen, high melee defense, dirt cheap, they just hold. And the Greatswords, you want to engage as a secondary unit. These guys, of course, have the bonus for infantry. And with their 90 armor, they're going to be pretty damn beastly against Saurus. I mean, a lot of the Lizardmen infantry, and that's one of their weaknesses, don't really have the best, you know, anti-armor options. You can go with Temple Guard, but Temple Guard are quite expensive and actually trade rather inefficiently with the uh, Greatswords. In the back from Rain, we got a couple hand gunners, which are very good against big dinos. Uh, we have the Silver Bullets right here, and it looks like we got Reichsguard here on the far side, Royal Altdorf Griffites, and uh, Reichsguard. So two Reichsguard, the standard shot cap, going to be pretty good at riding down skinks, and just, you know, they have an okay mass. But uh, the anti-big dino is really going to be lifted, uh, put on the back of Karl Franz and the hand gunners here, and uh, looks like he does have Silver Bullets. And the Royal Altdorf Griffites, one of the best anti-large units in the game. These guys with their halberds, very, very good against big targets. So, so for the forces of the... Uh, of the dinosaurs here. It looks like it's going to be a classic Felkarn army using the little skinks in the front line. So these guys are just the skink cohorts. And guys, we do have aquatics coming into play here. There's actually some water, so they're not going to be suffering the penalty for fighting in water. Of course, these guys are very, very slippery, sli slippery little lads, but they do, of course, have pretty good missile damage here at 18, which isn't bad for their cost. And they have poison as well, so they're going to be able to kind of saturate the front line. But the Empire, of course, very savvy to this, has brought shields in the front line. On top of that, Croxagors, they got their spanking paddles. They're definitely going to be really good against some of the great swords, but they're going to be a juicy target for the handgunners, the Griffites, as well as Karl Franz. But I mean, I think what Felcon is kind of doing here as far as the overall build is just going for a threat overload. I mean, there's so many big targets to shoot at. And look at this. He has a horn one. So he has a couple of clever girls, I think. No, no, not clever girls. These are all horn ones and cold one riders. So a massive cav force. I mean, the horn ones plus these guys are going to be able to overwhelm the Empire cav force. So he's going to have to use those spears very defensively and just hold the line, basically. I mean, this this is a very heavy metal dinosaur army. So he does have some clever girls here on the far side. Those Velociraptors. And the initial gun volley is going to be going in, shooting against the Croxagors, uh, doing some pretty good damage here. But the Croxagors, they're going to close the distance really quick. So the Silver Bullets, they need to fall back. They're going to be taking a ton of these Javelins right to the face. And that's not going to be good for those guys here. They need to fall back right now. And you can see right there, he's going to be uh, falling back there. But Felcon pushing in very aggressively. Oh, and he got a huge, huge AoE spell right there. It looks like it was a Wind Blast, so my apologies for missing that. But the uh, Horn ones are going to be charging in. And oh, we got a King Kong vs. Godzilla fight. This Feral Cold on Earth, the uh, Feral the Carnosaur going to be charging in on the Sora Scarvet, and it's going to be very tough for the Reichgard. They're not the best anti-large specialists. And also on top of that, the Dinosaur Cabbage is pushing in here. The Horn One's coming in. The Demogriff Knights are charging in as well, but Karl Franz charges right into the Snake's Pit. He pops the Reichlin Rune Peg, but this is a problem. you got to be careful with Karl Franz. You can't overextend like this. There are literally Lizardmen Cap everywhere, and they're going to be able to pin him down with their mass, and he's going to be taking a ton of damage. And I think that I mean, Falcon is doing a bit of a retreat here, but honestly, I think if he just stayed and fought, maybe he would be able to kill Karl Franz. Hard to say. But anyways, in the front line, it's going pretty well for the dinos. Of course, the Croxagors are just going to be annihilating these greatswords. Uh, pretty much a hard counter. Greatsword infantry, it's kind of like rock, paper, scissors. The greatswords are, or great weapon infantry, are typically countered by a monstrous armor person infantry. So the Croxagors are going to be paddling these guys pretty bad. And from there, the back line of the Empire is going to be open up. So the handgunners are getting some really good downtown fire, but now they're going to be disrupted by these guys. They're able to break through the front line. And unfortunately for the Empire and ODM Rain, he didn't have too many reinforcing elements to kind of support here. But if we look at the cav fight over here, yeah, it's, it's looking pretty rough for the Empire. I mean, the swordsmen here, the spearmen, pretty much buckled under the sheer might of this aggression. Reichsguard are broken off. We have the great swords who came over to help. I mean, all the Empire forces, including the Royal Altsworth Griffites, just got absolutely put in a trash can. And Karl Franz is trying to escape, but again, the Lizardmen calf have really good mass. They have massive armor piercing. He's trying to get away, but man, the Lizardmen are just hot in pursuit right here. And it looks like uh, Karl Franz is going to be getting an Earthblood, but I don't know. It's looking very grim for the Empire. The back line is super heavily compromised. The Silver Bullets are running. He does have some Reichsguard. It looks like he might have left these guys idle for a little bit too long. But the Empire Heavy Cav is going to be charging in. They definitely need to polish off these Skinks or at least intercept the Croxagors to buy some time for the guns to actually put some hurt onto all this heavy armor. But I have a feeling that the Empire is not going to be able to handle the Fury of the uh, old ones here. As you can see, the Skink Cohorts have kind of swarmed here. And the Spanking Paddles are going to be coming in pretty hard for these uh, guys right here. And yeah, it's going to probably spell their doom. 
So the problem is, is now that the Empire flank has collapsed, the Demogriff Knights, the Reichsguard, Karl Franz is on the run. I mean, he's pretty much just getting taken to Pound Town right here. You can see that the uh, Soros Old Bloods have been doing a ton of damage to him, of course. I mean, it's basically a giant T-Rex, right? It's going to be pretty scary. But the Bounce Power is now shifting in the favor of the Lizardmen as they're just reaving through the back line. Now that the Empire flank did collapse, like I was saying, the Horned Ones and all these different troops. And with the Empire, you really have to get a lot of value out of your back line. Your guns and your cannons and your reinforcing elements have to do very well for you. So, I mean, if you can't hold your back line, you're just going to let it get zerged like this. I mean, the Cold One Riders, all these other guys are going to be charging in, and you can see the Royal Turf Fights are going to be making a last stand right here, but they're just outnumbered so heavily. I mean, in the Croc scores, even though they are meant versus infantry, they still hit pretty hard. They're still giant crocodiles, and uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, the Bounce Power is kind of normalizing a little bit. The Empire might have some pockets, but I really just don't think Karl Franz is going to have the stopping power. He's going to be charging in here to attack the Source Old Blood. The Horn of Kygor has been popped, giving a melee attack leadership to all these nearby dinosaurs. But that is what's good about Karl Franz. He's pretty good at the uh, hit and run tactic. There are some Empire Spearmen who are holding over here, so quite a uh, substantial little pocket. And Spearmen, obviously, quite a bit better than Skinks. Skinks are kind of a. Uh, I mean, they don't have the worst sustained combat stats. Let's actually go ahead and take a look. So if you look at the Skinks here, they do have a 24, 25, and uh, well, 20, 24, 25 for their respective combat stats. But yeah, I don't know. I just don't think that the Empire has enough troops to come back. You can see the Reichsguard here do have 16 models. We're going to be doing a bit of a Rohirrim charge here into these uh, Lizardmen. Uh, yeah, but they're just, their numbers are so small. I really just don't think it's going to be enough. The Colden Riders are going to be turning around on their Velociraptors, and they're just going to be feasting like the heathen kings of old. I mean, these Reichsguard are going to be going down pretty quick. You can see their leadership shake, and they only have 13 of their uh, of their starting 45 models, which is pretty bad. And, uh, you know, a little tail whip action going on there, but I think that's going to be it. I mean, I hate to call it this early, but I really just don't think the Empire can come back. Karl Franz is very, very beat up. He has popped the Reichel and Rune Fang. You can see over here some of these uh, Cold One Riders, or Horn Ones, actually, which even stronger, have surrounded the Jade Wizard. So the Wizard of the Empire is literally being torn to shreds by a bunch of Lost Raptor dudes, and they're just going to Pound Town there. And that's going to be it. So that's going to be game two. Um, so it looks like we've normalized the series. Falcon is able to take the win over ODM Reign. And it was, yeah, just that that flank blitz. I mean, and that is a tactic that we've seen from Falcon quite a bit. He really likes to just have a very light front line of skinks. He doesn't commit a lot of resources, which is good because he did not play into the strengths of the Empire investing in great swords. So what he then did is he just overloaded the flank. I mean, three horn ones and croc scores. I mean, this Empire Cav Force was woefully unpre you know, unprepared. And on top of that, I think the spears of uh, the Empire kind of got caught off guard there and just run over and they weren't braced for the charge. And, uh, you know, a Soros Scar veteran, uh, not Soros Scar veteran, but a Soros Old Blood on top of the Carnosaur is going to be able to duel Karl Franz pretty efficiently, especially with the support of, uh, you know, Heaven's Magic. And also there was some very good Wind Blasts. You saw one Wind Blast coming in from the Skink Priest with Heaven's was able to absolutely destroy that handgunner there. So that was... That was a monstrous game. I mean, that that flank overload, very, very powerful. I just don't think the Empire had the resources to deal with three Horn Ones. I mean, Demogriff Knights one-to-one -one will beat Horn Ones, but it's going to be a bloody, attritious affair. And now, just think, there's going to be three of them. And honestly, state troops, you don't really need much to beat state troops or hold them in place. So the Croxors did a good job. Very solid build from Felcon. It was a good build from Rame, too. It was very well-rounded. It had answers to deal with a lot of different dino builds. But at the end of the day, I don't think I had the resources to uh, deal with, you know, the heavy duty, uh, you know, horn ones and those big boys on the flanks. So well played to those guys. Let's go ahead and update the scoreboard here. So um, we probably should change the uh, the tags there. I know it's a little bit lopsided. So let's go ahead and do that because it seems like all the uh, all the XMT guys are joining the lobbies first. So we're just going to go ahead and change it anyways real quick. So this is going to be clan XMT. And we're going to go ahead and change the other one to uh, clan X. The meme team is facing itself now. And uh, we're going to change this to clan ODM. So one to one here in the series, we got a we got a, a battle on our hands. Yeah, those horn ones are beastly. I mean, he does does have two cold blood effects to get rid of the rampage. So I mean, they just overwhelm that flank, and that's something about Felcon. He definitely brings those very unorthodox builds. So let's go ahead and say GG to the players there. GG guys. Yeah, Felcon is actually articulating that there was a group of flank I think that he missed on the far side, which would have helped in that battle, but I don't think it would have because Reichsguard are not going to perform well versus horn ones at all. So um, so that's it for those guys. We're going to go ahead and get the next players set up here in just a minute. You want victory for the ODM clan? Well, we'll find out. Yeah, they did really good. So I don't know if they're playing again. So uh, I don't think so. So let's go ahead and move these guys and these guys. And uh, all right. So guys, we're going to go ahead and take a quick break here as we get the next players ready. And uh, we will see you guys in uh, just a moment. Cheers, guys.
All right, guys, so now we're back. Next match is going to be a showdown again, XMT, of course, and ODM. It's going to be Mr. 626, and uh, we're still waiting for his uh, champ, the champion of uh, ODM here to join. Let's go ahead and pick the map here. So we're going to go ahead and uh, you guys can see the, the main. I won't click on the army, so you guys will be able to see everything, just not the uh, just not the army picks. Of course, we don't want any of that screen sniping. And let's go ahead and put him on a little bit of a bigger map, I think. Well, actually, Troll Country is such a fun map. It's definitely one of my favorite ones. We could do the... Uh, you know, for future like clan war events, we could also have you guys in chat vote on the different uh, maps. So we'll do the Sword of Torgal. That's definitely a really, really good map. It's fun, quite a bit. And also for anyone who is on clan XMT or uh, ODM, if you guys could actually add me on uh, on Steam, of course, uh, name is going to be Turin, and I do have a little Nurgling as my picture right now. Uh, please go ahead and do that so we can make the transition a little bit smoother with the games. So, um, oh, spare, spare me the mirrors, please. Spare me mirrors. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So you guys wanted to see Wookie. Um, oh, let me go ahead and show you guys. He's he's doing well. He just got a little haircut, so we'll get him from over here. Thank you, my friend. And uh, yeah, here he is. You guys can see. <laughs> he's just like struggling to breathe. There you go. There's the little creature. So he just got a haircut. He's like looking all prim and proper. See, that's kind of he's got he's got a little something going on. Yeah. So he'll just hang with us for a minute. Um. Yeah. So Shetland. Uh, they're just going back and forth. So. They're not rotating players like as in King of the Hill format. They're basically just each player plays one game, seven players on each team. And even if a team does win five in a row, we're still going to play all seven to give you guys a showcase of what the clan is truly capable of. Yes, yeah, so that's him. Yeah. And uh, this is Wookie. Yeah, the Wookie does come. He's here. He's, he's decrepit, but he's on his medicine. He's doing better. You know, a couple weeks ago, he almost died. But, you know, he's, he's good. We got him all taken care of. Yeah. He's mocking us with the dog. <laughs> He's a, he is an ergling, yeah. Well, I, I'm actually, I was sitting here and, and there was like a scratching at the door while during the stream. I was like, what the fuck is that? And I thought it was like some you know, rodent or something. And it was actually just Wookiee at the door. So he wanted to hang out. Normally he just sits in his bed in the living room, but um, yeah. Yeah, he's majestic for sure. No, he's not fake. It's real. And you know, it's an interesting story about Wookiee is he actually shat on me once on stream. Um, okay, so he wants Bretts as well. I can go High Elves, even though it, it's a bad matchup. Okay. Yeah, they're deciding on the picks right now. Looks like it's probably going to be... Uh, it was, I think, going to be a Bretonian Mirror, which I really don't want to cast because Mirror matches are just horrible. Like, it's so hard to tell what's what. So I think they're probably going to be switching to uh, Empire versus... Or, or Bretonia versus the Hiles, which is going to be interesting. Um, and Cincinnati of VA, thank you for the uh, $20 donation. Tribute to the Wookiee, long live. Yeah, thank you, man. I'll go towards his, his medicine, many of them. He takes 10 different ones now, so... Thank you so much for the uh, Fat 20, man. Appreciate it. Yeah, he'll, he's here. He'll be here. Probably going to go put him in the bed back there. He, hang out with that. he does look like a gremlin, yeah. Yeah, he does. Yeah, he's a bit of a meme. He's old now. He's, he's 14 or 15, so he's, he's, he's a happy boy. All right, so we're going to have a showdown between the uh, High Elves and Bretonians. Now, traditionally, this is a very tough matchup. Uh, I actually think it's really hard for the High Elves, but... I think that in the hands of a very high-level player, they do have some pretty good options. You have Sisters of Averlorn. You can, of course, use the Frostheart Phoenixes who do have the AoE debuff. And there's a lot of good options. And I think that Xyphos, obviously one of the more well-known competitive players, is going to have a, you know some pretty good options here. Granted, I don't know if I've played against or with 626, who's also El, El Halcone, I believe is his name. I know he's very uh, plays on quite a few tournaments as well. So it should be quite a cockfight. Yes. If you hate mirror matches, oh, no, a mirror match free-for-all, dude, that would be horrible, Zach. No, dude, I'm not doing it. Wookie doesn't suffer aquatics penalties? No, he doesn't. Just force one of them to be borderless? That's actually a really good point, Jetland. That could work. Yeah. Uh, nothing better than a lazy Sunday with a turn stream. Ah, thanks for joining, guys. Yeah, we're just getting started here. We're, uh, you know, on game three here. Things are getting a rolling. Yeah, he did. Yeah, it was actually pretty funny. Wookie uh, did shit on me once on stream, yeah. That was unfortunate. I, like, brought him to hang out, and he just dropped a fat deuce on me. <laughs> I'm just going to put him down or something. All right. And you have a company coming. There you go. All right. All right, guys. It's almost show time. We're going to let the players know they can start when they're ready. I'm not going to click on the army, so I don't want anyone to get streamed tonight. Start when ready. And we're going to do it to it. Um, so for anyone just joining, I know there's quite a few people trickling in now. It usually happens around the hour mark. 
Uh, this is a clan war between XMT and ODM. So it's not best of seven. They're each going to put forward seven champions, each of which is going to play a single game. And the determining score at the end is, or the score at the end is going to determine who wins. So uh, it's just kind of a very casual thing for the clans to showcase their players and their tactics. But again, there is uh, some, you know, ante on the line here. I might put up a little bit of a prize pool, depending on the donations today. So, uh, so we'll see. Yeah, it's going to be fun. So both players are ready. We're going to be jumping into the Sword of Torgald, which is a Bretonian map. It's actually a quest battle for Norska attacking Bretonia, but it does have a nice Bretonian castle in the background. And it has a very interesting kind of terrain structure. You have in the middle this ravine, and the ravine makes for some interesting line of sight issues, but not so much with bows. So I don't think it's really going to affect the Norskins or the... Uh, or not Norskins, but the Bretonians or the Hiles, both of which are bow-centric factions. They don't have powder weaponry, so I think it should be fine. But yeah, it's cool. There's some Vanguard options, but usually there's a really cool pit fight in the ravine. So we're going to see if the peasants of Bretonia are going to be able to take on the fury of the High Elves, the, uh, the the people of Italian Spartacus. Yes, it's going to be good. You root for him when he doesn't play a filthy knife here? Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> well then. Let me make sure the uh, scoreboard is looking good. Everything's looking fresh. There, and we're going to be loading into the game. So, I mean, there could be some Vanguard options, but I have a feeling we're just going to see a good old-fashioned slobber knocker. Probably going to be seeing some heavy Bretonian Cav, maybe. I mean, probably Knights of the Realm. I mean, you could use Grail Knights. I mean, there's no true death magic for the High Elves, so you don't have to worry about Buna effects. I mean, there are Dragon Breath attacks, as well as the Sisters of Averlorn Focus Fire. So there are some good tools against a Bretonian Heavy Cav, but... Or you could just go Super Peasant Heavy. I mean, there's a bunch of different ways to play it. Uh, but in my experience, it's definitely a little bit trickier for the High Elves. Yeah. You guys think there's going to be some shady tactics? Yeah, you have to root for Bretonia. They're, they're like the people's faction. Just these filthy peasants just fighting with rakes and shovels and pitchforks and shit against, like, dragons. It's great. High Elves versus Brett wouldn't be uh, dishonorable if High Elves were elves. <laughs> oh, my God. All right. Yeah, you can see there's a Bretonian castle up here in the background. Looks like both players have loaded in relatively quickly, so we got a, got a cockfight on our hands. Should be fun. Game three of the day. It's going to be a bit of a metaphorical tiebreaker. Granted, there's still more games to happen, but... Let's take a look at the armies of, uh, of Bretonia, the noble knights and ladies and lasses and all that kind of good chivalrous stuff. So for the leader of Bretonia, we do have the Fae Enchantress. She's going to be coming in with the Fat Heal. She does have Earthblood, so I have a feeling there might be another caster somewhere, somewhere, because Earthblood is only one spell, and typically you see like two or three, but I guess if you just want to use Earthblood and he's just going as cheap and narrow as possible, it's not going to be bad. We do also have a Paladin on foot, so the Paladin, of course, stripped to the bare core. I mean, he doesn't have any abilities. He's just going to be on foot. He has his anti-large. And he's probably going to be having to fight that dragon, which is not going to be fun. It's actually a star dragon, which is the most powerful variant of dragons. And aside from that, I mean, the Bretonians going with the true Bretonian army. It's just going to be a mostly peasants and men at arms. So just very you know crappy low tier infantry. But these guys, they have numbers and they fight hard for their land. And uh, yeah, we're going to see how that goes. Foot squires in the back, a good choice. Going to give him a bonus for his infantry and some stopping power against the white lions and some of the more elite infantry. So for anyone who doesn't know, foot squires are probably the most elite Bretonian infantry, which are far weaker than pretty much every other faction's variant. But uh, yeah, good bonus for Sam Country, armor piercing. These guys can do the trick and uh, definitely going to struggle against the Star Dragon. You know? In the back, we do have a couple archers as well. So Peasant Bowman with the Pox Arrow. So they're going to be shooting poisoned arrows. Um, pretty good against a dragon who still does have 80 armor, but poisoning it and slowing it down is always good. And he does have the Defenders of Flare de Lis, so I probably mangled that horribly. Pretty much any French, uh, French pronunciation is going to be uh, miserable for me. But they're pretty good. These guys have a really good charge bonus for the cost. And if they're able to charge in and do some heavy damage against unbraced spears or white lines, it'll definitely pay some dues. Uh, peasant mobs in the back. So these guys got their rakes and their pitchforks. They're ready to be eaten by dragons for, their, for the lady. We're going to see how it goes for them. And uh, I think there's some heavy cap. Yeah, he's got the companions. So the questing knights over here in lance formation. And also the knights of the Lionheart. So going super elite with the cap. I mean, these guys are definitely beast mode. What's really cool about the knights is they also have magic damage. So if there's dragon princes or heavy cap that have really good physical resist, the magic damage of the knights of the Lionhearted is going to surpass them, which is going to be very, very useful. So... That's pretty much it for Bretonia, a bunch of heavy calf. Uh, looks like he does have, so, oh, he has Grail Knights too. Grail Knights and Knights of the Realm. So going super heavy. And you can kind of see that reflected in its infantry core. Then that the quality is very, very low. It's just a matter of arms, right? So Grail Knights in the back, yeah. I mean, this is typical. Bretonia definitely can dominate the calf game. But of course, the uh, High Elves have some high of, yeah. Ooh, dragons. Yeah, look at that, dragons. Okay, front line. For the uh, ODM Xyphos, who's going to be playing the High Elves, he's got a front line of Spearmen just going to be holding. Pretty standard stuff for competitive play. Most High Elf players just use Spears and they just kind of hold. And up in the skies, he has a big Star Dragon. So the Star Dragon is going to be quite powerful. Its breath attack is very impactful. But if it does get, you know, surrounded by the Grail Knights and the Noble Knights of Bretonia on the ground, it could get taken out very quickly. But if played in a bit of a tactical sense and used in conjunction with the Spears and some of the White Lines here, this thing can be an absolute monster. Top of that, he's got some Silver Helms, Silver Helms. I mean, these are the High Elf Cab, but they can in no way stand up to the Fury of Grail Knights, Knights of the Lionhearted and the Companions. I mean, they will lose head to head in pretty much every engagement there. 
On top of that, they do have a couple white lines. White lines, decent armor piercing, and they can put up a good fight against Cap, considering they have okay AP, but definitely not made for taking charges. Uh, they have low melee defense. Well, a martial prowess will kick in, but it's still not that great. Um, yeah, it's going to be scary. On top of that, we do have Alariel the Radiant, so it's going to be a bit of a cat fight here between Alariel and the Fae Enchantress. And more healing, just banishment. Oh, looks like he brought a natural banishment, as well as Earthblood and the Star of Averlorn. That's going to be pretty good. I think they're waiting for my signal. Start when ready. We'll let them know. It's go time. And yeah, good luck to both of these players. I definitely think... Uh... I don't know. I, no predictions. Zyphos is an extremely good player. And I mean, it's really going to come down to a Star Dragon play. He will eventually... I don't know. I just kicked something over. He will eventually win. You know, if he can keep the dragon alive and kind of grind it out, I think he'll be in pretty good shape. But yeah, I don't know. It's going to be interesting to see the applications of this Paladin. Because as an anti-large specialist, it might have been a mistake to bring him on foot. Maybe he meant to bring him on a mount and you just forgot to pay the gold for it. But anyways, Paladin's going to be leading the charge of the Knights of Bretonia. Men-at-Arms are going to be moving in there. Foot Squires following up, which is good. You want the Men-at-Arms to take the initial beating and then have the Foot Squires follow up and actually do the heavy lifting. So the uh, Knights here, not the Knights, the, uh, the High Elves are going to be rotating over to this flank. Looks like they might form a bit of a box. Knowing that the Bretonian army is like vastly wider than them, they don't want to get enveloped, right? Because the Knights of Bretonia will collapse those flanks just like butter. They're just going to go through there, just, just get in there, just go balls deep, have a good time. And it's not going to be fun for the High Elves. So you can see here that Xyphos looks like he's going to be rotating his formation a little bit, trying to deny the flank. So from there, the Bretonian Knights have to go super far around the spears, and it's not going to be as easy for them to just uh, crush the flank. So definitely some good repositioning here. But the Bretonians do have the advantage of missiles, so they do have the Peasant Bowmen, whereas the High Elves do not have any archers, so if the Bretonians want to just sit on this hill and just shoot arrows, it's then going to force the High Elves to engage. So, uh, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how the Silverhelms hold up. I think what he's probably going to do is use the Silverhelms on top of Spears, so he'll have the Spears brace for the Knights, and then from there the Silverhelms can kind of countercharge them. But yeah, I'm quite eager to see if, uh, you know, the... I mean, it's a very tough matchup for the High Elves. I really think that the High Elves in general, I think, are a bit of a stronger faction than Bretonia overall, but I think that as far as matchups go, I think that Bretonia has a pretty good matchup against the High Elves. So the Dragon could be using Breath Attacks, but I think we're probably going to be seeing it save those specifically to kill the Heavy Cav. Just waiting for the Grail Knights or the Companions or these Quest Knights, the very elite, expensive units of Bretonia to blob up. And from there, I think the Dragon is probably going to use its Breath Attacks. Looks like it's going to be rotating in. The first Volley of Archers coming in, but the High Elves, of course, have Shields. They're going to be able to take that pretty easily. Of course, the Silver Shields on High Elf Archers do mitigate 55%, if memory serves, of uh, all Missile Attacks, I believe. Yeah, it's 55% of Small Arms, so it's not going to be like artillery pieces, cannons, things like that. But the High Elves are going to be advancing. The Bretonians are going to meet them in kind, so they don't want to give up this uh, this position here. I would definitely kind of keep the High Elves in this valley, just kind of this killing floor right here. And some of the Peasant Mobs or Spearmen at Arms are actually going to be rotating out here, but the High Elves are going to win this fight. White Lines will easily beat down most of the Men at Arms, but it's going to be a massive charge coming in. You can see the Bretonian Cav on the far side coming in, but the High Elves look like they're going right up the pipe with the Silver Helms. They might try and get back into the Archers, but there's going to be a huge Cav charge coming in, but the Dragon's actually going to be charging in to intercept these guys, so the Dragon lands and breaks the charge, but some of the Quest Knights still get in there, but the Silver Helms are going to be countercharging. So we have a messy pit fight right here. That was a really, really good move by Xyphos using the Dragon to break their charge. On the far side, we have another charge. The Knights of the Lionheart are going to be Lance Formation into the Silver Helms. And it's definitely going to favor the Knights of the Lionheart initially. However, the problem being is that the High Elf player has supporting elements. We have Spearmen and White Lions, and the Knights of the Lionheart are just getting pounded by the infantry. Just a 3v1 environment right here. So the Dragon, in the meantime, did a really good job. And Xyphos actually heavily won this engagement and this one. So, so far in a beautiful position. But the Bretoni Knights are coming for vengeance. They're going to be getting a rear charge into the back of the High Elf Spears. So both players kind of conceding a flank. I mean, not intentionally or willfully, but it just ended up happening. So the Bretonian Knights come in there and just sandwich those High Elf Infantry, and those White Lines are just shaken. They're going to be shaken and breaking here in just a moment. It's not going to be good for those guys. So those guys are broken off. The High Elves here in the middle, same thing's happening. Foot Squires are overwhelming them. Bretonian Knights collapsing the White Lines on this far side. So the Bretonians dominated everything on this side of the battlefield, whereas the High Elves are pretty dominant on this side. So they still have the Fat Dragon, Star of Averlorn going down as well. But the Defenders of Flare de Lee do get in there, and they do a Fat Charge coming in. And I think the Bretonian Heavy Cav is starting to just reap through this entire formation here. So if we look at just things objectively, the White Lions still fighting over here, but High Elf don't really have much else. I mean, they have a couple Spearmen here. White Lions are broken here. The entire High Elf formation completely destroyed by the Noble Knights of Bretonia. They kind of just came in, rode those guys down. And as far as kills, they have 52 whopping kills on Knights of the Realm, which is pretty insane. So as far as the High Elves, they do have the big dragon up in the skies. And it looks like the dragon's going to be going in, trying to get its claws in there and do some damage. But uh, the Bretonian Knights are pretty much specialists at killing large units. So it's going to be a little bit tricky. Plus, Fae Enchantress, I think, must be nearby with her Miss of the Lady. You can see the High Elf Queen is going to be leading the charge of the Silver Helms here using some of her magic. And the Dragon, of course, hits like a truck against armor, but he is being taking a lot of Lance hits here. But I think the healing from the, uh, from the Ever Queen, the Pigeon Queen, is doing a pretty good job kind of keeping him up. So Bretonian Knights of the Realm are going to be circling up and around the back. And I think what Bretonian is probably going to try and do is get these Knights of the Realm to sit them back here, do a fat Lancing rear charge, which will pretty much buckle the entire you know, formation of the High Elves here. Bounce of Power is uh, 
actually a little bit in favor of the high elves somehow, so I don't know how, but I guess it looks like they're able to stabilize over here, so this is it. The companions here took a huge beating, the Bretonians of course lost his flank like we articulated earlier, but they're doing pretty well in this fight, but yeah, it's a close fight. I mean, this could go either way. I don't think that anyone is in a super clear advantage right here. It's really going to come down to these last couple plays here. Knights of the Realm are going to be charging into the High Elf Infantry, getting a pretty good charge, relieving these beleaguered Bretonian troops. And the White Lions are going to be coming in, though. So these Bretonians, even though they have some reinforcements coming in, are going to be getting cleaved by the axes of the White Lions here. They're definitely not up to the task of fighting these elite High Elf Infantry. Well, quote unquote elite. They're kind of like mids here, but they're actually elite compared to Bretonian standards. And the Star Dragon actually goes in to attack the Fae Enchantress and almost kills her. So the Star Dragon does a ton of damage. And if the Bretonians did lose their Lord and the Fae Enchantress went down, I'm pretty sure that would just spell the, the doom for them. But the big issue for the High Elves is going to be when they run out of supporting elements on the ground, if they do, if the Silver Helms and the White Lines and the other troops do break, and the Dragon is then isolated, I think that could really kind of end the battle. But he's done a pretty good job keeping the White Lines and some of these other troops fighting. Silver Helms here in pretty good shape. I mean, but the Bretonians just have so much meat. I mean, they just have all these foot squires, these just men at arms, just stuff just kind of mulching through all these troops. They have all their peasants just charging in there with rakes and pitchforks and just mucking things up. But the Bretonian Knights are going to be taking a fight with the Dragon. So um, the Dragon, as long as he doesn't stay, should be okay. But it looks like he's going to start taking a little bit of damage. But that healing is so cost-effective on big, powerful monsters. The, uh, the Everqueen definitely one of the more powerful healers in the entire game. So Foot Spires are mush uh, pushing in. But remember, the Star Dragon does cause terror. So the Bretonians don't have immunity to Psyche. There's no Grail rel uh, Reliquary around here or anything like that. So the Foot Spires could be terror routed off. But the Bretonian Tide is just moving forward and grinding down the Silver Helms. And the Knights of Bretonia, very veteran play here from a 626. He's actually just chasing down the retreating units. So anytime you're in a battle like this, it's very close. It's down to the wire. And let's say you have a bunch of beat up cab units. So look at this. He has a couple cab units that are near dead. They have like seven models. Oh, a big dragon breath attack coming down and eviscerating those peasants, just melting them. That was a beautiful breath attack. It hit foot squires, it hit peasant mobs, which isn't the best value, but it looked really cool. But he did hit the foot squires there and got some pretty good damage on those guys, which is quite valuable. But it's a, it's a very, very close fight. Dragon's going to be coming in over here trying to take out the defenders. And Star of Avalorn is going to be popped from the high elves, applying a ton of healing effects to some of these troops here. But the dragon definitely going to annihilate Knights Errant. Knights Errant are anti infantry cab. They do not have any capabilities to fight a big monster like this. So the Star Dragon is just rampaging, just feasting on these knights, just rolling about. And uh, I mean, the High Elf Knights are, of course, going to lose against Grail Knights and things like that. Oh my god, that guy got tons of that shit. Anyways, the, uh, the big old Star Dragon here going to be getting charged down by some of the uh, Noble Knights. You can see the uh, Knights of the Lionhearted and Grail Knights are going to be charging in there. A big old Alpha Strike coming in. But I think Bretonia is slowly starting to win the grind fight. And, uh, you know, if the dragon does get isolated by all these chaff, especially considering there is this foot paladin. So the foot paladin does have a bonus for his large, which means that whenever he hits a big target, anything past infantry sized, he's going to be able to do some really, really substantial damage. So just a very, very close fight here down to the bitter end. But it looks like Bretonia is slightly starting to pull back ahead in the balance of power. But this is actually a little bit scary. So if the dragon does get a big old breath attack right here, oh no, this is going to be Gotham Dragoning. So here comes a huge breath attack, just roasting knights and peasants some very brutal stuff coming down right there and it might be able to buckle some of those guys off but it seems like there's just so many bretonians just a very you know a vermin type essentially uh grail knights are a little bit beat up companions have seven models knights of lionhearted have three i do not know how they're still fighting but there's not a lot of i mean heavy units left for bretonia but they still have the fey enchantress who managed to heal herself up from that dragon attack earlier and uh the paladin paladin is definitely going to be a big saving grace here as he is providing that encouragement and helping to uh you know anchor all these troops here so Lariel, the High Elf Queen, is going to be fighting here in the pits of Bretonian. So, you know, they got their shovels, their pitchforks, they're going to be prison shanking her a little bit. Paladin, of course, has that really good bonus for his large. And you can see right there, he does some pretty good damage against Lariel. She actually uh, takes quite a bit of HP damage. And the Knights of Bretonia just chasing off the scraps of the High Elves. Like I said, anytime you're in a close battle, you just want to grab the remnants of your cab and just chase off, you know, beat up units from your opponent. From there, kind of, you can then collapse on what they have left, which is a little bit more efficient. So right here, it looks like Ilariel's going to be having a little bit of trouble. Star Dragon's going to be cycle charging, trying to snipe out the Bretonian Lord, which is probably a pretty good choice. So yeah, he, she definitely wants to run. So the Fane Chantress and her Unicorn are going to be riding out of here. The Star Dragon, of course, is a little bit slower. It does have a how much speed, 80 speed compared to the 95 of the Fane Chantress. So she can definitely outjuke it. And I think if Ilariel goes down here, I don't know, but the Dragon is so good against Foot Squires. It's going to be really, really, you know, come down to the wire here. But yeah, really good play here from 626, actually chasing off all the uh, different, you know, Silver Helms and White Lines. And like I said earlier, if you can get rid of all the supporting elements and isolate the dragon, you should be able to eventually grind it down. But man, this thing is just an absolute beast. And typically, Bretonians do struggle with like big armored beasts. And the Star Dragon does have 80 armor, which isn't you know, the worst. So some of the Peasant Bowmen arrows have actually come back. And looks like there's a fairly healthy group. I don't know where they've been this entire time. Looks like they might have been getting chased by Spearmen or something. But now they're going to start poisoning the dragon, which is really going to help. And it looks like Ilario the Everqueen actually did fall. So she was pretty much beaten down by shovels and pitchforks and the Bretonian peasants. Doing a very good job there, but the Star Dragon is going to be the last foe to be slain here. And uh, he's getting poisoned, he's being dragged down, the Paladin is going to be chasing it. And uh, yeah, that's going to be interesting. It doesn't look like he has much left. He's got some Silver Helms, he's got some White Lions, and 
according to the rules of our tournament, of course, he has to engage with this thing here in a moment. I don't know if he has anything else fighting, but I'll go ahead and double check. And if he doesn't engage here in a moment, I'll uh, make sure to let him know that he has to engage with the Star Dragon. And of course, you can't cycle charge with single, single target entities if it's the last thing you have left. So he's getting poisoned. He's getting dragged down. Looks like he's going to be going after the Peasant Bowman, which is a good choice. Definitely need to shut those guys down. And the Bretonians here are going to be kind of hanging tight. And uh, yeah, Paladin just leading the charge. Dragon's going to be going after the Peasants here. Not a bad choice. Just feasting on some of these guys. So it's going to be a pretty unfair matchup as the Dragon is just going to go uh, go feast in the garden. And some of these Peasants are getting decapitated by the Dragon. Bowman. Yeah, pretty much done for here, but uh, I still don't think the dragon can engage, and uh, I'll go ahead and let him know that he does have to engage the dragon. I don't think he has any other troops left. Yeah, these guys are broken. He's got some silver helms here, and uh, I'll let him know here in a second. Gotta engage the dragon with main force. Uh, cool. So we'll let him know he's got to engage the dragon, because he, he has no other elements, and if all you have left is a single entity, you have to engage, and from there you can't cycle charge. So the dragon is going to have to be engaging with the main force here. And if he doesn't, I mean, follow the rules, we can always, uh, you know, correct it afterwards. But yeah, there's not going to be enough. The dragon is just so beat up. Balance of power is so heavy. I mean, it looks like he's going to be going after the Fane Chantress here, but he's never going to be able to catch it. The Fane Chantress is too quick. And the High Elves, yeah, they have Silver Helms, they have Spears, and just... Uh... And also, another way for anyone who's new to the game, if all you have left is a flying unit, you're going to be suffering a perpetual penalty the uh, entire game. So uh, yeah, the dragon's going to be landing here. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. No, there's no cycling now. He just has to pretty much engage whatever he can find. So, yeah, looks like he's going to be engaging these men-at-arms. From there, he's going to have to go fight this main Bretonian force. And the Paladin, honestly, is going to be able to do a number on that Star Dragon. On top of that, we do have the Fae Enchantress over here. The Dragon might go over there, but there's no way that he can catch the uh, Fae Enchantress. She's just far too quick. Uh, and on top of that, some of the White Lions are going to be riding off the battlefield. And that's a very veteran play here from uh, 626. Just chasing these guys off and making sure that the uh, Dragon is going to be suffering the penalty. So... Fane Chantress is going to be running now back to the main army, and, you know, she can blob all these guys up if she wants to. The Bretonians still have a decent little fighting force. You know, they got some great weapons, which aren't going to be great against Dragon, but, I mean, it does have some armor piercing at least, and I think he has some archers left. I don't know if they have too many arrows, but the archers definitely, uh... Nope, they're out of ammunition, so it's really just going to be a, a straight-up fisticuffs fight. And the High Elves getting chased off here. Oh, no, that is a huge mistake. I don't know what he was doing. So 626... Uh, actually engaged the Fae Enchantress with the dragon, or maybe he let himself get caught, took a really bad angle. And if the dragon is able to kill the Fae Enchantress, you know, the dragon might be able to kill the rest of the army. I mean, Bretonian armies, as far as infantry it goes, like, they're pretty pitiful. So the Fae Enchantress literally is going to have to Tokyo Drift out of here. She's going to have to run from this fat dragon who's on the hunt. Oh, that is so bad! He can actually throw the game right now! Oh, no! Oh, no, this is not good. Oh, this is so bad. So the Fae Enchantress is now dead, or she's shattered. So she's going to be running off the battlefield, which means she is not coming back. She's so terrified by the dragon that it's pretty much, uh, you know, game blouses in that respect. Uh, over here, uh, the last of the white lines are going to be getting pushed off the battlefield. And, uh, and yeah. I mean, the dragon could go after these knights. Definitely want to make sure they get finished off because then the dragon is going to be suffering a leadership penalty. So, um, both players must attack. Yeah, both players have to engage, for sure. I mean, the Bretonians were engaging. Um, but at this point, I mean, I guess he's just finishing off the white lines. But, yeah. I'm going to let him know both players must attack, but... I mean, I guess he's just going to be hiding over here and just waiting for the leadership of the dragon to tank because since it's going to be the only flying unit left, where's the edge of the map here? Ooh, it still actually has a way to go. He's really trying to finish off the last of the white lines. Looks like there's a one model left. There's literally one white lion, I think. No, there's five. And the dragon's actually going to be finishing off the knights. Yeah, they're skirting the rules. They're playing it a little bit dangerously. <laughs> we'll, we'll tell the clan leaders to, to make sure to check in with them. So the knights are going to be shattered there. Um, the white lions, I think, are also broken. So they could potentially come back. So, oh my god, the bounce power actually normalized. So the dragon's going to be flying across the map to engage the bretonians. And the bretonians are actually going to be holding in the forest, I think. So, yeah, you can see the bretonians are going to be moving out. So they did see my message there that both players have to attack. And this is a good way to end it. <laughs> this is going to be a good way to end the battle. The fat dragon just flying across the fields to fight the remnants of the peasant hordes. And you can see here that the Grail Knights and a lot of the Bretonian infantry with the loss of their lord, that huge mistake letting the Fae Enchantress get caught. And there's no way. She's way faster than the dragon. That should not have happened. They're actually wavering now simply because they see a giant dragon coming and they're going to be suffering that penalty for just a huge monster coming their way. And the White Lions are still on the battlefield, which means it's not suffering the leadership penalty yet, which is just brutal. So it's really going to be up to the Paladin of Bretonia, guys. And if you are enjoying the stream, make sure to drop a like. It does, of course, help me from a business perspective, so I certainly do appreciate that. And uh, the Big Dragon's going to be coming in, guys. Can the Noble Knights of Bretonia, who are going to be led by uh, the Extreme Meme Team, take on the ODM Dragons? We do have the Star Dragon coming in, which now has three Chevrons, which means this bad boy's 222 kills on this dragon. I don't know if the Bretonians are going to be able to do this. I really think they're going to get mass terror routed by this dragon. But man, what a game. I cannot believe that Xyphos is going to come back here. <laughs> Hashtag not my dragon, what? 
All right, so the dragon's gonna be charging in right here, maybe? No, he's just gonna fly overhead and get a terror out, I would imagine. White lines are gonna charge off the battlefield, which means the dragon is gonna have to uh, suffer a penalty now. So let me see what chat's saying. Um, okay, so he's gonna charge the dragon. And this is it, he can't cycle charge after this. He has to fight. Um, no more cycle charging. Must fight. All right. So it looks like the, the paladin, the paladin, the anchor of Bretonia, the paragon, Instantly turn around to the dragon. He's like, fuck this shit, I'm out. So the fat dragon just coming in. Oh my god. He was like the backbone and he just gets his- Oh my god, he got his head bit off! By the dragon. Oh my god. And then the foot squires are just gonna just buckle under the weight of this dragon. Oh my god, I cannot believe that. What a meme. So the foot squires are gonna fight, but I don't know, they can't. They, I don't think they can, guys. It's over. Uh, Zyphos 66 is like lol. That paladin just got trash canned so hard. Oh my god. But the bounce power is actually creeping back in Bretonian's favor as the noble men, the true backbone of Bretonia, cleaving at the dragon's tails, getting tail whipped here. The dragon definitely going to be feasting on some of these guys, but... Because uh, he's not allowed to cycle charge here, so the dragon just has to keep fighting, but... God, what a horrible, horrible paladin. That guy's a disgrace. And I guess, I guess he got the proper ending here, for sure, if you guys want to see. There, there he is, laying in all his glory. But the dragon's going to be fighting. He's, uh, he's doing it. Yeah, I don't know. It's really just going to come down to the terror here, guys. We're going to see. This has definitely been probably the best game of the stream so far, as far as just ridiculous shit happening. Now, remember, there are some men-at-arms with spears who are going to be quite efficient against the dragon, but the dragon's getting low. He's kind of in the danger zone a little bit, but you can see the spearmen are wavering, which means if, if anything start, bad starts to happen, they take a huge burst of damage, they're going to tear out, and there could be, like, a chain route. But the foot scars, I'm really surprised at all these, like, these peasants and just chaff units are holding here, but I guess foot squares have okay leadership. Now, the dragon's at about 3,500 HP. And let's look around the battlefield. Is there anything else left? I don't think so. You can just see the knights, the, the corpses of the knights, and just these massive pit fights we've had this entire game. And the bounce power is still pretty much dead. Even dragon has lost about 300 HP. But here's where it could potentially get ugly. The Bretonians are now having a mass tear out, so the peasants are just going to be returning to their, their plows and their fields, and they've had enough of this shit. They're going to be running. Spearmen are also going to be following in too. The dragon's still feasting, and if the foot squires start to break, that's where things are going to get disastrous. Just terror routes going down across the board, and uh, I don't know. I think the dragon's going to win, guys. It's just such a messy pit fight. These guys are all shaken. Foot squires are shaken. These ones are shaken. The dragon is actually steady in regards to its leadership, so it was shaken there for a moment, but oh my god. I think it's over. I think the dragon's gonna just roast them. Oh, those breath attacks just eviscerating. I mean, the massive splash attacks coming in. Oh, God. Oh, the humanity. <laughs> and now the star dragon actually has silver chevrons. That means it's done so much damage over the course of the battle that it's actually leveled up in regards to its combat stats. I mean, the Bretonians are coming back from the terror route, a couple of them, but I really just don't think it's gonna be able to do enough. I think the dragon is gonna probably win this, but 2,500 HP, 346 kills. Have a, <laughs> oh, the dragon snapping that guy's head off. Lovely stuff here, but, but yeah. You guys want the peasants to win? I don't know. I don't know. That paladin was that paladin was pretty pitiful. But yeah, the stats now are, are melee attack was 70 and 72. So I believe Star Dragon start in the 60s. So that's a substantial buff. But look at this. The Bretonians are creeping back somehow. They're just kind of surging back and forth. I mean, I guess they are fighting for their homeland here. You can see there's the, the giant Bretonian castle up there on the hill. So they are in sight of the Fane Chantress, who still lives, but she did shatter off the battlefield. But honestly, had he kept his lord alive, this battle would be over. The Star Dragon would just be dead right now. The Fane Chantress would be able to, you know, be nearby, cycle charging back and finish it off. Oh, well, the men at arms are trying to run. They're wavering. Foot Squires are getting so damn low. They're still steady somehow, some way. 1,700 HP on the Dragon. But I just think, yeah, Foot Squires are starting to break. That's going to be a mass terror out. The Bretonian peasants and Foot Squires are just going to be like, screw the shit, I'm out of here. There's a couple of these guys fighting, but they're going to they're gonna get feasted on by the dragon. Star dragons, for anyone who's new to the game, are actually the strongest dragon in the entire game. You do have chaos dragons, which, which are pretty close. Moon dragons, um, force dragons. I mean, they each have different niches, but just in terms of raw firepower, this is actually the strongest dragon in the game. So it's going to be tough. He's stealing the crops. He's stealing the crops from the peasants. I don't know about that, guys. Yeah, yeah, that's going to be pretty grim. Foot squires are done for. Wave ring. I can't believe they're still fighting, though. The spears are going to be coming in the back. I mean, maybe there's a chance they could break the dragon. The star dragon actually went to negative four leadership from that rear charge there for a moment. It's at, it's at 21 leadership, 30. It's just stabilizing at 1,500. Yeah, but look at that. Bounce of power is now going to be probably triggering army losses, and that's going to be it. The, the foot squires there are going to be running to the hills. The dragon has won. I cannot believe that. Look at it. Just just out of the club those guys as they flee. Oh, my God. Never give up, Bretonia. Jesus, what a game. What a game. Never give up. That was nuts. Abandon your post. Flee the city. That's basically what happened. I cannot believe Zyphos pulled that one out. Because the Bretonians had such a dominant position. But when he let the Fane Chantress get caught and killed, that was just... 
game blouses. His couch got stomped. Yeah. The dragon deserves to retire in the Misty Mountain. <laughs> the, the peasants were brave as hell. Oh my god. What a game. I cannot believe that. So guys, that's going to be ODM pulling ahead. I really I really thought that, uh, you know, I really thought that XMT was going to take that one. But alas, the dragon coming in with its fat talons and just ripping the paladin's head off. GG, crazy. Faster than Faye, what the fuck you say? <laughs> All right, GG, guys. All right, so we're going to get the next two players in here. And uh, yeah, the princess remains stuck in the castle. Yeah, she does. That paladin got destroyed. He, he got flattened. Got 407 kills on that dragon. Pretty nuts. So we're going to be getting the next players in here. So uh, we're going to take a quick break here. Just so you guys don't have to see me kind of uh, chatting with the guys and getting them ready for the next game. And we'll be back in just a moment. So thank you guys so much for joining. And let me make sure I didn't miss any uh, donations as well. So I don't think we did. So I think I got the last one. And uh, we'll double check on here. And yeah, we're all good. So thank you guys so much. And we'll see you in uh, just a moment. Cheers.
All right, guys, so now we're back. It's going to be uh, it's going to be the next installment of our episode here. We do, of course, have uh, ODM being up 2-1. And remember, it's not going to end if ODM wins. It's not a best of seven. Each player is going to be playing the whole series through, so you get to see every player in their full combat capacity. So for the next match, we're just getting the players ready. I think they're deciding on which champions they'd like to send forward. And hopefully you guys enjoyed that last game, seeing the Noble Knights of Bretonia and the Peasant Horde try and take down the Dragon. They almost did. And honestly, if that Paladin hadn't taken such a beating on the initial charge, they would have won very easily. So maybe the Paladin should have tried to juke the Dragon, but it's pretty hard. I mean, the Dragon is much uh, is quite you know accurate and aggressive there. So, so yes, we're going to be going on to the next game here. So let's go ahead and see who's going to be up next. I'm chatting with the current clan leaders. And uh, yeah, welcome to anyone who's just joining the stream. It's going to be a clan war, first of our kind. I don't know how many clans we have in our community. I think there's at least three or four. Uh, ODM, XMT, uh, I think I've seen the uh, AIMA. I think that King of the Dead is in that clan, but I'm not sure if there's other Warhammer players in that. But yeah, it's kind of a new thing. So pretty cool to see that in action here. Going to make sure uh, these guys got me on Steam. So we got the next ODM guy coming up here in a moment. And we got a friend request. Why does it say 626? No friend. Yes, there's some issues with Steam right now as well. Good old Steam, classic craft client. Uh, get a search for all across Steam, and we will do this, and this, and this. All right, where is he? His Slayer's name. And yeah, if you guys have any suggestions for like matchups you'd like to see, a lot of the, the respective clan folks are here in chat, so make sure to drop those if you guys want to see. And maybe they will see and uh, heed your calls. Yeah, I feel like we do need a Skaven game today. Skaven are pretty interesting. They, they're the original clans. I mean, they, their society structure is that of a clan, right? They have different, you know, it's just four clans or five clans or whatever. Um, first live, live stream you managed to catch. How long do you think the stream will go? Well, probably another 45 minutes to an hour, give or take, I would imagine. VM, uh, B, BIA, BBB are all pretty old Warhammer clans. Okay. Yeah, King, I've never actually seen anyone else from your clan, though. That's what, that's what I was asking, so... Um, so Pipes, make sure to send your next player forward if you haven't already, unless he's a little bit late. And if he is, you can always send someone else in. Uh, not a problem with that. Okay, so the lobby's up. We're going to be playing on Pillar of Bone, which is a pretty small map with some Vanguard options. And I see that we have a donation there as well. So Anti-Mage says uh, $5. I'm not sure what currency that is. It was a very nice battle. Epic stream as always for the lady. Yeah, well, they tried. You know, the, the lady, unfortunately, fell to the wayside there got rode down by the dragon. I, I was surprised the dragon was able to catch it, but the reason the dragon caught the Fane Chantress is because if you get close enough, units get an acceleration bonus, which means they get a temporary like speed buff as they're charging. So he was able to close the gap of the 15 distance with that, which was uh, a little bit punishing there. So that was the reason there. So I need him on Steam. And let me go ahead and talk with Pipes. And... Uh... getting the steam name of uh, the ODM gentleman it says it says he's a uh... Slayer Tsar oh, okay pretty sure I got him um, let me go ahead and double check here and yeah guys we're just getting set up pipes thank you for the uh, for the five dollar donation as well great games and great casting well, yeah, thanks for getting all the lads together today for, uh, today for these games. Uh, yeah, I'm glad you like that, Zach. It's definitely cool. Yeah, Anna made that. The Nurgle Diary in the living room. If you guys ever want one of your own, I mean, she can she can commission those if anyone's interested. If you want one for your respective Chaos Gods, you just let us know. Yeah, Bertrandian matches are really fun. I mean, they, they have a very uh, interesting style of play, and watching the heavy calf fights is just those fat and just erect lance formations coming in is pretty great. Yeah, it's always a good time. All right, so we're just gonna gonna get Mr. Czar in here. Let me go ahead and double check. And here we go. All right, so we got that, which is good. And we should be good to go here in a moment. My apologies for the delay. You know, we're coordinating with 14 people, so sometimes, depending on where they are in the world here, it can uh, be a little bit a little bit slow to slow to roll. All right, so let's go ahead and do this, and we'll get Mr. Czar in there. Okay, so it doesn't look like he's in Warhammer quite yet, or maybe he is. We'll invite him to the lobby. Okay, Zara's in here, and Halo. All right, so we got it. The battle is on. So we're going to go ahead and jump over to the main desk now, and you guys will be able to see the uh, matchup here. So it looks like we're going to have Dark Elves versus Chaos, which is going to be interesting. Two top-tier factions. 
Um, I think Dark Elves have a pretty well-rounded roster with plenty of armor piercing. Of course, Chaos is one of the most heavily armored factions in the game with almost no ranged capabilities. Just going to be heavy metal infantry and, you know, a couple of big dragon monsters and beasts and ogres and all sorts of things like that. But um, Dark Elves, Repeater Crossbows, you have elite infantry if you want, but I really think just going with Repeater Crossbows and, you know, uh, Cold and Spear Riders is usually pretty effective. Um, Garland Green says, Turin, does your lovely lady do commission painting work? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, she's actually sold a, paint, a Lovecraft painting a couple weeks back. Uh, it was, it's pretty goddamn awesome. So if you guys are ever interested, just shoot me a message on Discord or something. Uh, how much does the dragon cost? About, well, a little over 2,000 gold if you're going to be getting the star dragon. Yeah, I think. Uh, Garrett Rashford, thank you for the uh, donation. He says, how do you make use of gyrocopters? So as much as I hate to tell you this, gyrocopters generally just suck. Um, you can bring one. If, if you're playing in a competitive environment in a tournament, you know, versus high-level people, gyrocopters, maybe slipping in one, just getting the tip in there is going to be okay, but... Typically, like more than that isn't going to be terribly effective. Uh, it's just going to be. But they do give dwarfs some scouting capabilities. If you're facing off against chaos, it's not bad because you can sit a brimstone gun on top of Kolek or big monsters or chariots, and they can't do anything about it, really. And on top of that, it can go snipe out hell cannons. So there are niches. Maybe the chaos matchup, you could bring one. Um, yeah, it, they're still just not that great, which is unfortunate. Battle of the Edge Lords. I mean, yeah, Dark Elves are certainly pretty edgy. They got some mascara on for sure. Start when ready. So it's going to be XMT Halo uh, facing off against ODM Czar. Dark Elves versus Chaos. Um, Chaos, as far as this matchup goes, they can certainly win the infantry fight uh, if they want to play that game. But really, it's just the Dark Elves have the maneuverability, a really good missile play. And, and the repeater crossbows are so good on horseback because they can outmaneuver most Chaos Harass units with the exception of Poison Hounds, which you can simply fend off using Dark Riders. And from there, the crossbows can just pretty much go to Pound Town on the big Chaos monsters, which is, which is, which is tricky. Yeah, I mean, gyrocopters are just a bummer. It, it really sucks. They're just not good. Um, dwarves, unfortunately, are a bit pigeonholed in the way they have to play in competitive play. You can't use any of the big hard-hitting melee lords because they just waddle and get knocked over. You have to use the rune lord or the dwarf lord and go super cheap. And from there, you just spam thunders. You go super wide and just gun things down, which is really cool, but it also gets a little bit stale and as it pertains to the metagame. If you look at Dark Elves or uh, Chaos, for example, you can have dynamic playstyle. I mean, Chaos, even for a very linear faction, can bring many different builds. But uh, yeah, even still, dwarves are a little bit, you know, limp in my opinion. In regards to their diversity, they're my favorite faction. I mean, dwarves are very strong, but only with one style of play. Uh, how would I make gyros more viable? Perhaps more damage output? Like, they, they need to be more punishing, um, in my opinion. So, going to be on the Pillar of Bone. Zar is going to be finishing up his build here. We are ready to go. Yeah, heavy archer build could do good. But again, chaos can be a swarming faction. So, you don't want to go too heavily in, like, dark shards. Uh, your backline can have a salad toss pretty bad if you're not careful. Yeah. Yeah, Shelton Apache is a quite a good dwarf player, and he does have a he does have a good point there. Um, he says they can provide mass versus chariots, pick off cab models, pick off elite infantry models. Yeah, I suppose that's true, Shetland. Certainly micro intensive, but I I would honestly just rather have a group of thunders usually. Yeah, it's just I don't know, they're just not that good in my in my opinion. Shetland Apache may have had some really good success with them, the gentleman here, the fine gentleman here in chat, but myself, uh, I personally have never had a. A lot, a lot of success with those guys. Your money's on the Dark Elves. We should start... You know, I almost wonder if I... Yeah, I probably shouldn't. I probably shouldn't say that. YouTube will just, like, hear those words and, like, demonetize my video. <laughs> Chaos Spawn are one of the most god-awful piece-of-shit units in this game. They are so bad. They are so bad. Maybe we'll grab Wookie again. You guys want to see him? I think he's still around. Probably tormenting Anna. Okay, my phone's off. We're good. I always forget to do that. And here we are. It's showtime. ODM Czar versus XMT Halo. And uh, we're going to see if XMT can claw its way back after a very tough defeat. But again, if Halo is able to bring this game back, it's going to bring the series to a 2-2, which is going to make this clan war very, very even. And yes, please, Shetland, do send me replays of uh, any Dowie games. And uh, I would certainly love to cast those, my friend. Yeah, anytime unorthodox units are used effectively, I am more than down to cast that. So let me go ahead and make sure we're on the proper screen here. Everything's looking good and tasty, and uh, it's showtime. Small question, Wookie's not your... Oh, no, we have two dogs there. Yes. <laughs> uh, thank you, Misha. I appreciate the support, for sure. All right, guys, so we're going to be on the Pillar of Bone, which is uh, has some Vanguard options. I mean, there's a couple little, like, thin tree lines in which you can hide things, but for the most part, it's not going uh, to be the best 
for like kind of sneaky tactics and things like that. But based on the, you know, the armies that we're seeing here, I mean, the Dark Elves might want a Vanguard, but Chaos, Chaos is Chaos. There's not going to be too many tactics. I mean, they can go with Hell Cannon play. And honestly, I actually like Hell Cannons against Dark Elves. But the problem is, if Dark Elves bring one Reaper Bolt Thrower, you're going to be trading almost, you know, a thousand, a lot of gold for just like the six, seven hundred that a Reaper Bolt Thrower costs because it can snipe out your Hell Cannon. So there's some give and take there, but I do love Hell Cannons myself. Definitely one of the more fun units on the Chaos roster. So without further ado, let's jump right into this match, guys, and uh, have some fun. We're going to see what's going on here. Looks like the players are going to be loading in. And uh, yeah, Chaos was one of my first loves as it pertains to factions, but man, I suck at them now. I've been playing quite a bit of Chaos lately, and I just like cannot win battles to save my life with them. You know, against other, uh, you know, high-level players, of course, but... Yeah, Zimmy G says, I lost the battle, but the war is not over. Well, you put up a great fight, man. That was a close-ass game. Your paladin failed you. It wasn't you. <laughs> if he stood if he stood and fought like he was supposed to, you would have won. Yeah. Don't worry, Wookie will be back. I'll get him after this game. We gotta focus. We gotta focus, guys. It's showtime. Although there's a little bit of lag delay here, but it seems like it should be normalizing here in a moment. So, uh, Shades with Great Swords actually aren't that good, because they're just so squishy. The problem is, even if they fight like a group of Chaos Marauders, they're going to take like le almost lethal damage, and that's just not cost-effective. All right, guys. So, we are here. Let's go ahead and take a look at the Forces of Chaos, who are going to be led by Halo of the Extreme Meme Team. So, he is going to be having the big old Zinch Demon, Sartorial the Everwatcher. So, pretty good choice here. Um, he's very, pretty much almost impervious against missile attacks, because, of course, he does have that juicy missile resist of 60%. So he's going to be getting in there, dropping his KFC drumsticks. This guy's ready to party. And he does have the final transmutation. So he's going to be going for this straight fist of cuffs, trying to snipe the enemy lord using the metal magic. Yeah, it looks pretty cool. Does cause terror as well. So against like Bleak Swords, Dread Spears, Chaff units, he's going to be very strong. On top of that, looks like Halo does have a Hell Cannon, which is going to be manned by the uh, Chaos Dwarfs. It's a very phallic looking artillery piece. Definitely very strong if left unimpeded. Now let's see if the Dark Elves do have the... Uh... Oh, wow. Oh my goodness. This build is just anarchy. Okay. So he's literally going for like a mass cav build. There are no... There are no uh, no infantry in this build. Okay, this is going to be interesting. He does have a couple of Black Art Corsairs with handbows. So I'm, I don't know. Chaos is going to have to endure this one. They're going to really just have to Helm's Deep and just hold that. I mean, this Hell Cannon is going to shine here if it can kind of keep a bit of a screen between it and the enemy missile units. So basically, if you have, for example, these uh, Dark Riders here, if they were able to sit right here, they can shoot the Hell Cannon. But if you use these shielded infantry to kind of push them back, because obviously they don't want to be a melee, the Hell Cannon can then blow them to pieces. But... God damn, that is a mean Dark Elf build. I'm very, very nervous here for Chaos. On top of that, we do have Sartorial, the Chicken King. Uh, we got Chaos Warriors in the back with great weapons. Expecting some Dark Elf infantry, but these guys are going to be okay. I mean, they'll be okay against the Velociraptor we have. I mean, I think he has some Cold One Spear Riders. Let's go ahead and check. A little bit of lag here. Hopefully the players don't uh, crash or disconnect, but it does happen from time to time. If it does, we'll simply restart the game and uh, go from there. Looks like they stabilized. Great. So the Cold One Knights here, it's going to be for ODM's R. They do have anti-large armor piercing. They also have 90 armor. So having some extra great, great weapon kind of punch against those guys is going to be good, but not great because they're slow and they're not going to be able to catch them. And the calf can obviously cycle charge them. He does have some Dragon Ogres in the back, the Summoners of Rage. So these Chaos Monsters definitely ready to party with their clubs. And they're going to be very good against the Cold One Knights, but they're also going to be very squishy against the mass amounts of Dark Riders and Repeater Crossbows coming off these uh, Dark Elf Cav units. Uh, so that's it. It's really going to be a Chaos Helm's Deep. He does have some Horse Masters to counter Skirmish, and they're very good against Dark Riders, but just through sheer numbers, I don't think he's going to have enough to kind of deal with the Dark Riders with the Peter Crossbow. So for the Dark Elves, it's going to be an all-mobile force. You can see here in the front line, it's going to be Dark Riders with the Peter Crossbow. So for anyone who's new to the game, these guys are basically fast skirmishing Cav. They're Missile Cav. They can shoot uh, while they're moving uh, forward, I think. No, these ones actually can't. Um, that's the High Elf uh, variant, but yeah, these guys... Pretty much going to sit, take pot shots, relocate, sit. I mean, nothing on this roster can really catch them with the exception of the Marauder Horse Masters, but there's such dominance in the Cav game. Uh, I mean, the Cold One Knights, I mean, he has the Velociraptor Cavs, and these guys are anti-Cav specialists with really good armor piercing, so, I mean, he can protect his Missile Cav, and uh, it's really going to come down to the Chaos Hell Cannon, I think. On top of that, he does have a couple Black Art Corsairs with handbows, so these are his only quote-unquote infantry units. These guys are actually a bit of a hybrid unit. They have handbows, so they skirmish, they get up close, they shoot, they run. Very kitey, so it's going to be uh, tough to catch them. And up in this guy's, he's got a big mama's house. <clears throat> he's got Marathi. So Marathi here, of course, uh, always good against Chaos. She's actually a very good counter against Warp Chicken because she has good you know, good bonus for Slard. She's faster than him, and uh, she has pretty good magic with Soul Stealer, Power of Darkness, and uh, Doom Bolt, looks like, or the Wand of Coridon, or whatever it's called. It's not the actual Doom Bolt. Up in the high ground, we have the Slanesh's Harvesters. Uh, these guys are going to be quite good as well. Just one of the more powerful units, these guys. Uh, bring some good utility. You know, backline pressure, they have Vanguard deployment. They're easily going to be able to merc some Marauders, and uh, uh, Marauder Horse Masters are a pretty good answer to them, but we're going to see if he can get the jump, so I think it's time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Start. And for anyone who's going to be playing next, no need to wait for me once the game started. Feel free to start anytime. Even if I'm doing analysis, we'll just jump into the game. 
Yes, we're good. So the players have started. Dark Elves are going to be moving forward with their repeater crossbows and starting to tickle the pickle of chaos. We're going to see if the um, Marauder Horse Masters can counter skirmish them, but they're going to be able to run and they have their, their javelins. But yeah, these guys are just so quick and a couple of them do get taken out there on the retreat. Definitely has an unfortunate end for them, but for the most part, I mean, he does have three Marauder Horse Masters. Pretty good counter skirmishing coming in from Halo. So I like this right out of the gates because the Dark Riders with repeater crossbows cannot 360 shoot. So if you're chasing them, they can't do a whole lot. But he does come in with the, the hand bows, and these guys are able to get in position behind these infantry. But the Hell Cannon Blast coming in and nuking those Dark Riders. Not doing lethal damage, per se, but just the sheer numbers. Slanesh's Harvester is coming in. I mean, I think that the Chaos Skirmishing Core, though it is doing some pretty decent damage, is simply going to be outgunned by the Dark Elves. And what I would probably do if I were Halo is I would fall back at this point and just sit back here and just just use your infantry as a meat shield. Keep these guys as a counter skirmishing tool for the late game. But the Velociraptor Cavalry are going to be coming in. These guys are charging in. They're not as fast as the horses, but if they catch them, a couple of these guys getting picked off by the, uh, the Dark Elf Crossbow Fire in the back. And Wrath Wrathy's coming in on her Pegasus as well. Now, the Summoners of Rage have been called forward here by the... Uh, Second here, I have the game sign on. It startled me for a second. But the Summoners of Rage are going to be charging in here, and they're a very good anti-large tool. They're going to be beating down these Cold Moon Knights, but the problem being is that the Dark Riders with the Peter Crossbows are now going to sit, and the Summoners of Rage have no anti-missile capabilities. I don't think they have maybe 15%, give or take. And the Cold Moon Knights have also come in, and of course, they have a bonus for large with their spears. So the Summoners of Rage with a Word of Pain, lowering their melee attack to zero using that Dark Elf magic. But man, they are taking these Cold Moon Knights to town, just beating them down, doing very, very good work. And the entire time, the Hell Cannon is, you know, online. Let's go ahead and see what it's going to be shooting at here. Looks like it's going after the repeater crossbows in the back. But look at this Dark Elf firepower. And Summoners of Rage cost a ton of money. But it looks like a final transmutation may be coming down from the Warp Chicken. So he's going to be dropping it right on top of these guys. It does hit the Cold Moon Knights. And it doesn't hit Marathi. So a little bit unfortunate there. He did miss that. Summoners of Rage is going to be turning around to fight, even though they took a ton of damage. And the Warp Chicken is going to be coming in with his drumstick. He's flying in. He's going to be slam dunking some of these guys, space jamming them. And uh, yeah, looking like a pretty pitched fight. Bounce of power is relatively even. And the Hell Cannon is still just generating perpetual value. Now it is missing there. What he should be doing is using the Hell Cannon to shoot the Corsairs. They're a little bit more bunched up, but look at that. I mean, all of the Chaos skirmishing forces have just been picked apart by the mass amount of Dark Elf bows. He has a couple here, but they're pretty damn beat up. He does have a 31 right here. And over here on the far side, he has 38, but yeah, Summoner's Rage are beat up. I mean, Chaos is gonna be forced into their Helm's Deep. And from their Dark Elves, it's really gonna be on them to impose their will. Uh, now, as far as cracking the infantry core for the Dark Elves, they do have some chariots that are kind of just sitting here and waiting. And what's cool about Dark Elf chariots is they actually have crossbows on the back, so these guys can do some good work against Chaos Infantry. But uh, Slanesh's Harvester is going to be doing some charging, looking to get in there, maybe uh, butter the bread of these Marauder Horsemen. And we're going to see they might be able to get in, but there are Marauders nearby, so the Shielded Infantry can help absorb that charge. But really good play here from the Dark Elves. He's very efficient at cycle charging. He goes in, he pulls out, that's what she said, just having a good old time, and uh, is able to get out unscathed, it looks like. So, over here, uh, the Corsair Handbows, still just kind of shooting in there, but... Yeah, Chaos Marauders are a dirt cheap unit. They have shields. These are what you want to be using as a missile sponge. You don't want to be using your expensive Dragon Ogres who just took a massive beating. Marathi coming back here. looks like she's trying to fly overhead and maybe snipe out the Hell Cannon somehow. But the Warriors of Chaos still do have some Marauder Horse Masters with their Javelins. So they're going to be able to at least pressure her so she can't sit there for free and just... Uh, you know, I was wondering what that sound was. I think it's Wookiee snoring behind me. I knew it. Okay, so he's, he's going to have to be banished. So anyways, the Hell Cannon shot coming down here. It actually gets a square hit on the Slanesh's Harvesters. We're going to be charging into the Marauders once again. We're going to see if ODM Zar is going to be able to pull out relatively quickly. And he does pull out quick. Chaos Marauders are actually shaken from that charge. So beautiful play so far. The Dark Elves are kind of just picking apart the Chaos Forces right now. Slanesh's Harvesters uh, taking a little bit of damage as well. But I don't know. I mean... Something else to articulate, guys, is that the Dark Elf army is very contingent upon its ammunition. So if Chaos can endure and just have a couple infantry left at the end of the game, it's going to be really tough for them to actually finish things off. Over here, Marathi is going to be dropping a Soul Stealer on this big blob of troops. And for anyone who doesn't know, Soul Stealer uh, is a big AoE spell that does quite a bit of damage and also heals the caster. But it looks like these Cold Knights have actually rampaged. So the problem with the Velociraptor Cab in general is that they do have that rampage trait. So if they get beat up enough, they're just going to rampage. The mounts are a wild beast, right? So the Summoners of Rage are coming in with their big, meaty-ass hammers. They're going to be dropping some serious thunder on these uh, Cold Knights. And these Cold Knights are pretty much done for. So these ones are dead. These ones are going to die as well. Marathi's actually in a little bit of trouble here. She does come in and drop uh, the Wand of Coridon on top of those guys. But she's going to be pulling back here. And a very nice final transmutation coming in from the Warp Chicken. It actually hits Marathi and is doing some huge damage right after her Soul Stealer. So she's probably not going to be able to heal for quite some time. So good play from Chaos there. Getting a lot of value. Killing two Cold Moon Knights off. But over here, it's a little bit disastrous. Looks like the Chariots are just going to be running shop. The, uh, the Lizard Limos, as the Great Job plays, calls them just running through these Chaos Infantry, doing quite a bit of work. 
And it looks like they might be able to roadblock it at the end, but yeah, chariots are such a hard counter against like infantry in general. It's very, very tough for them. You need like cab or high mass units. And look at this, Hell Cannon has actually been partially compromised. Now, it looks like ODM Zark did commit Slanesh's Harvesters and his Cold Knights to try and finish off the artillery piece in the back, and he actually failed. So this might be a bit of a way for Chaos to get back in the game. The Chaos Warriors with Grey Opens able to just beat the brakes off these Cold Knights and the Slanesh's Harvesters. And from here, the Summoners of Rage can probably chase them off the battlefield or just kill them. It looks like there's actually literally one model left on those Cold Knights. So, Balance of Power is actually uh, teetering in the favor of Chaos now. You can see the Dark Elves in a little bit of trouble as their ammo's running low, and the Chaos Infantry are just enduring the storm, the ammunition across the board, let's see. So these guys are about, yeah, 20% here. I mean, Blackheart Corsair ammunition is not going to be terribly effective against Chaos because the armor piercing on the handbows is very low. It's not enough to really punch through the heavy armor of the Warriors of Chaos. Now, the Repeater Crossbows, that's a different story, but these guys are running a little bit low on ammo as they're just shooting in and just working through this very meaty HP pool. Marathi's also very beat up in the sky, so it looks like she's going to be dropping a Soul Stealer right here. Going to be trying to finish off the Dragon Ogre, so the Soul Stealer has gone down. Massive magic damage is now going to be hitting the Summoners of Rage. It might actually be able to kill a couple models. It's hard to say. Yeah, one of the dragons does go down to the Death Magic right there. The Dragon Ogre is not a dragon, but yeah, it's a, it's a close fight, but I think Chaos is in a decent position. They were able to stabilize the Hell Cannon, which has been able to blow its full load. So this thing is going to be... It's going to be able to continue to shoot here. And you can see the Hell Cannon Shot going to be coming in, blasting those Corsairs, eviscerating a couple of them in the Warp Chicken. The Greater Demon is going to be ch charging in, flying in on his uh, drumstick wings there. You know, big old slam dunk with his cane there. And yeah, he has such good missile. Oh my god, I've never seen this animation. Look at that. Oh, that's pretty brutal. Okay, well, let's see what he does with it. <laughs> Alright, that was pretty cool. I've actually never seen that animation before. In the two years I've been doing this, I've never seen that. But anyways, uh, Sartorial going to be chasing those guys down, and I just don't think he's going to have the stopping power, because 60%, all the damage from all these units is going to be dropped by 60% against this big KFC King. I mean, he is just so durable against missile play. He's just charging these guys down, having a good old time, and uh, Chaos here is pretty stable. Chaos Marauders, Great Warp, I mean... Yeah, all right, how are the chariots doing? That's the one thing that could get Chaos back in the game, but the Cold Wind chariots are actually rampaging. That is so unfortunate. So it looks like they're rampaging, and if they do rampage into Great Weapons, that's gonna be pretty bad. Uh, and the Hell Cannon's offline now. It's out of ammunition. Chaos is still ahead in regards to the balance of power, but that's not to say Dark Elves can't come back with some very effective Marathi play. If she's able to kind of, uh, you know, take out this Drumstick Lord and maybe chase him down, well, it looks like the Cav are coming in to pin him. Cold Wind Knights as well. I mean, if, if he does get pinned, he has a really big HP pool, but yeah, he's he has such high mass. And for anyone who's new, uh, mass is essentially what dictates how a unit can push through other units. So, like, he can wade through infantry and push through cav units and, you know, bully them over. It looks like another, another final transmutation is going to be coming down from Halo. It's going to be getting dropped on Rathi here, which is going to do some good damage. She has healed up with her Soul Stealer quite a bit. But now at this point, Chaos just needs to kind of hang out. They just need to sit and relax and try and uh, just, you know, weather the storm of the Dark Elf missiles. Because they certainly cannot catch any of these guys. So... We got 56 uh, great weapons right there. Chaos Marauders right here. It looks like we have 43 of these guys left and 34 of them up here on the high ground. Oh, but this is so bad for the Dark Elves. It looks like the Cold One Chariots. So the Velociraptors, or Cold Ones as they're actually called in the Warhammer universe. I just say that Velociraptors is a joke, but they uh, they do have the Rampage, which means they're a feral beast. They're very strong, but when they do get to a point of being damaged, they just go wild and they start fo stop following orders. So they're going to be just fighting in melee, which is what Chariots are not good at. It's going to allow these Marauders to just kind of slowly cleave them down and yeah, these Chariots are going to be dying here probably momentarily. Now, in the main fight, the Warp Chicken is going to be fighting pretty hard. He's actually fighting up against some of these uh, Dark Riders with Repeater Crossbows who are out of ammunition, so they have to be used in melee. Soul Stealer has been dropped on Sartoriel, but he also does have very good magic resist. Kind of the Demons of Zinch. Uh, very impervious, not impervious, but very good against the missile attacks so far in this game. And uh, also have very good magic resistance because they're kind of the lords of magic. Anyways, uh, Chaos Warriors with Grey Elf is going to be waiting over here uh, trying to help this fight out. But it looks like the Dark Elves have found a bit of an isolation here. So some of these Chaos Infantry a little bit alone here, but it looks like a little bit of lag. Hopefully... Hopefully one of the players didn't drop. I know they're connecting from across the sea, so sometimes that can happen in these games. But the bounce power is actually slightly in the favor of... Uh, okay, looks like they stabilized. Give me a little bit of anxiety. Bit. Anyways, the uh, Marathi is able to come in and kind of clean up. And you can see the bounce of power is actually going in the favor of the Dark Elves. It seems like Chaos is slowly being picked apart a little bit. And it's really going to just come down to the wire. Can the KFC King, you know, really just, you know, polish things off here? I mean, he has 4,000 HP. And what's cool about Sartorial is that he's unbreakable. So therefore, even if your whole army's destroyed, he's going to keep fighting to the bitter end because demons, obviously, when they die in the lore, I guess also what justifies the actions in this game, they just go back to the warp and they come back. So they're not actually, they don't have the same like fear of the uh, mortal characters in this game. So the uh, chariots here are pretty much polished off by the Chaos Warriors. Marathi is uh, full health from the Soul Stealer. So, and if it does come down to Marathi versus the KFC King, she's going to be able to beat him probably because she does have that bonus versus large. Granted, she has a much smaller HP pool. So Arthurial's coming in to make sure the chariots are finished off. He might be able to finish this one. We're going to see here. He's going to be dropping the, uh, the fat dunk right there. It's wavering. It has one leadership, 778 HP. He comes in. The chariot is now going to be broken as uh, negative seven. Yeah, it's going to break off the battlefield. 
And yeah, so Dark Elves have Black Heart Corsairs with handbows, which just through sheer volume of fire might be able to polish off these Chaos Infantry. So you can see a couple of these armored brutes are just going to be getting pounded by these arrows, but their armor is going to really help them quite a bit. And the Chaos Dwarfs, the Cannon Crew. So these are actually the crew members who manage the artillery pieces. So they're pretty, you know, useless in melee combat. I mean, these Chaos Dwarfs are going to be having some problems, but they're just going to be getting annihilated by these Dark Elves. And yeah, Bounce Power is creeping back in the favor of Dark Elves. My apologies, a little bit of lag here, but man, this is just such a close game. Let's take a look at some predictions. The potato wasn't cooked, but one of these guys has a potato connection of some sort. Yeah, that's for sure. I don't know who it is, but we'll get to the bottom of it uh, after the stream, I'm sure. So the Chaos Warriors with the Grey Opens are now fighting a bit of a you know, bitter fight here to the bitter end. Sartharo's going to be jumping in, of course, providing that terror. I mean, he might be able to anchor this fight. He's able to cleave a couple of those guys off their mounts. And the Chaos Infantry on foot, much more powerful than Dark Riders. These guys are just meaty. Some of the most powerful warriors in the old world. But... Here's what can be trouble for Chaos. Marathi's going to come in. She gets a huge Soul Stealer. That AoE damage has just been so impactful this game. It's going to be hitting the Chaos Warriors. It hits the KFC Lord. It also hits these Chaos Warriors who shatter. And now, guys, suddenly there is nothing left for Chaos. Chaos has its big greater demon as uh, this one Chaos Warrior, this true hero of his people. Oh, not so much. He's pretty much in. He's dead. Um, so he tried. But anyways, it's just going to be the uh, the, Ever the Ever Chicken, Ever Watcher. He's just here. That's it. Uh, there's nothing else for, else for Chaos. And I'm pretty sure Marathi, of course, uh, has her halberd. So she's going to be very good as an anti-large specialist. And uh, yeah, Dark Elves are going to be shanking him in the back. He's going to be taking crossbow fire. It's only a matter of time before this uh, greater demon does falter. So it looks like Chaos might have been ahead in that game. And we've had that for a lot of these games today. You know, someone has really come from behind and just rallied. So it looks like Halo is going to be bowing out of the game. And the Dark Elves are somehow going to beat the Warriors of Chaos there. What a game. That is a brutal build, too. I mean, very well played to both players. Halo had to deal with a lot. I mean, just all those cab units managing the skirmishers, managing the dragon ogres, the hell cannon, those infantry, making sure they're not isolated. It was just an insane amount of micro by both players. So GG indeed. That was a, that was a close one. So it looks like XMT is on the ropes, guys. The extreme meme team is, uh, is, is you know, down two games now. So, of course, we're going to have seven games in total. So we're going to see what happens. We're going to see if XMT can bring it back. But those were that was those were some tough games. Obviously, ODM is uh, coming ready to fight today. Yeah, well played indeed. Let's go ahead and update the scoreboard. Clan ODM is going to go up three to one here in the series, and uh, let's go ahead and say GG to the players. Next, <laughs> yeah, that was crazy. Dark Elf won an army select. He did, but honestly, Chaos could have won that game. It was really close. It was really close. So well played to both of those guys, and we'll see you back in uh, just a moment. We're going to take a quick intermission, get some water, stretch out my hands a little bit, and we'll be back uh, to, you know, party and have some more fun here in uh, just a moment. So thanks again for joining, guys. Make sure to stay tuned. We have another couple games, so I think we have another uh, three games in total, and uh, we'll be closing out the stream from there. So guys, we will uh, see you in just a moment. Cheers.
And we are back with the Clan War XMT versus ODM. Currently, ODM is up 3-1, to one, guys. And we're going to see if the Extreme Meme team can claw its way back. Perhaps they're going to have to bring in uh, some of their aces in the hole here. But man, all these games, win or lose, have been very close. So, uh, I mean, it certainly could have gone either way. But again, that is the uh, the tail of the tape for the day. So let's go ahead, take a look at the next match, which is going to be ODM Vyash versus XMT Old Ones Vengeance, I believe is what his name is. But uh, it's A-Move Hacker is his actual name. But it looks like they're taking on new personas for the day to represent their clans. And uh, let's go ahead and take a look at the battle. So it's going to be a classic match, Skaven versus Dwarves. Now, as far as the metagame goes, if you're playing in a tournament vacuum, two high-level players, obviously both are trying their hardest to win. Dwarves are probably going to win more often against Skaven. They're just very resilient against just the hordes of rats. They can wash upon the Dawi armor. But um, yeah, it's a classic grudge match for sure. I mean, the Dwarves kind of have some ancestral enemies. Of course, Greenskins and Skaven and, uh, you know, Goblins, all that kind of stuff. But... Yeah, the Skaven, I mean, they have some good options. You can use Death Runners. Doom Wheels are pretty effective. But again, Dwarf Thunder can really just pound those Skaven uh, Constructs and Rat Ogres and things like that. So it can be a little bit wild. So yes, we're going to be on a classic multiplayer map here. And we're going to be jumping right into it. And thank you so much for joining today. Yes, we get to see Skaven and Dwarves, which I'm glad. Because we didn't see any uh, Dwarf action actually in the uh, Eternal Challenger League last week, uh, last week, which made me a little bit sad. So, all right. So, um... Yeah, I already answered your question regarding the gyrocopters earlier. Just want to make sure I didn't miss this. And we have another donation on PayPal coming in from uh, Gregor. For uh, Thanks for the four bucks, man. Cheers. Hopefully, uh, I didn't see if you had any requests or any questions you had. So if you do, make sure to ask it in chat and just say, you're Gregor. And, uh, and I will answer your question. Yeah, XMT, don't shame your ancestors. Well, this is a matchup that traditionally favors dwarves. I would be actually interested to see the back-end metrics. I know Creative Assembly has access to those, but it only pertains to ladder. And on ladder, the skill variance is all over the place. You're not going to be having like high-level players, so it's kind of like tricky to get true statistics on that. But uh, Dwarves do not win against everyone. Dwarves have some horrible matchups. Dwarves struggle really bad against Chaos and Beastmen. Any faction that has really effective Great Weapon Infantry and Chariots, Dwarves are going to struggle really, really bad against. Because Dwarves don't have any mobile tools aside from Gyrocopters. They're all Foot Infantry, so they, they get and get swarmed and, and rode over. And uh, I mean, yeah, they have pretty good mass themselves. But quite eager to see these builds here. And oh, it looks like they heard me making fun of gyrocopters. And they're going to be bringing a couple of these old helicopters to the battlefield. So should be interesting. Controversial stuff going on here. Let's go ahead and check to uh, make sure everything is good on the uh, camera. And I always have a little bit of a fear that like I just left it on the desk and I'm going to commentate the whole battle. And all you guys will see my face. But anyway, All right, guys. So let's go ahead and take a look at the Dawi army. So up in this, guys, two gyrocopters. So gyrocopters, they shoot steam cannons. They have little dwarf pilots here. Oh, look at this guy. He has like an eye patch on. Okay, it's pretty badass. And on top of that, view of the bombs. It's very micro-intensive. But again, if you can get the bombs on top of some high-value infantry, it can pay its dues, but it's so micro-intensive. And I've often found that it's a bit of a micro-trap. On top of that, we have the Iron Drakes with the Trollhammer Torpedo. So these, as the name would infer, they basically shoot torpedoes. And they're anti-large, they're armor-piercing, very good against Doom Wheels, Skaven Constructs, Rat Ogres. But they're also, uh, you know, a pretty small little unit group. So they can be compromised if you're not careful by a group of, like, Death Runners or something like that. He does have a Lord, so a Dwarf Lord, just going, going cheap, going classic. Got his sword, or his axe, and his shield. He's definitely ready to party. And for the rest of the dwarf army, it looks like they're going to be deploying in the corner, which is the dwarf way to be uh, corner camping and using the gyrocopters here. I mean, he's not truly corner camping. I mean, that would be like right, right here. But like, if he moved his army to the corner when the battle started, that is true corner camping. But I don't think he's going to do that. So iron breakers and going very elite. So this is a very untraditional dwarf army. Iron breakers are probably some of the tankiest infantry in the entire game, as far as just defensive stats. 68 melee defense, 125 armor. They have shields. So pretty much they can take anything this game and throw at them. Those guys are going to be meaty and tough to kill. So Iron Breakers, Iron Breakers, Warriors of Dragonfire Pass with their flaming axes here in the middle. These uh, elite dwarves should definitely be very good at cutting down the filthy Skaven. And on top of that, we have the Altars Raiders. Great weapons. They uh, pretty decent melee, but more importantly, use them for marked with Altar. So he's probably going to be going for an Alpha Strike using the Iron Drakes and the marked by Altar to kill the big Skaven Construct. So pretty cool build. Got some Slayers in the back, some of these angry shirtless uh, Berserker dwarves. Gonna be good. Anti-large armor piercing. Dragonback Slayer is pretty much a staple in every single matchup. So you, you pretty much always want to bring those guys. So, but yeah, it's good that he's deploying back here because he wants to get the value out of the gyrocopter. So let me let them know they can start whenever. All right, good. And for the Skaven. So for the rat people, let's go ahead and take a look. So a massive horde of storm vermin. So the storm vermin are not going to do a whole lot against dwarves. They don't really have the best armor piercing, but the reason Skaven, player brings, uh, Skaven players bring storm vermin is simply because they're tanky. They have 90 armor by Skaven standards. So tanky. Pretty much all the rat guys have terrible leadership and just run, but you know, they're gonna hold. On top of that, he has a Plague Priest, 
with uh, the furnace, gonna give him some really good AOE, but this is just the most buttery, juicy target for the tor torpedoes. But if it's able to get in there and somehow the Skaven can shut down that torpedo play, this thing is just gonna be a terror. And you can see, yeah, it's, got his, it's got his Plague Bell swinging up there. And for the Lord, they have Queek Headtaker. So he's very good against dwarves. He's basically an armor-piercing assassin. He has the Dwarf Gouger. He literally has an item called the Dwarf Gouger, which gives him a ton of anti-armor capabilities. He's got a bunch of Skaven slaves. So much like the Bretonians, the rats do, of course, have their own slave culture who they're gonna be throwing into the gods. Night Runners here in the front. So these are ninja rats with skirmishing capabilities. Actually can throw their ninja stars up here at the gyrocopters, which uh, won't do the most damage because the AP is very low, but quite eager to see that. Now the gyrocopters do work decent as a scouting tool as well. That's something that I didn't articulate very well earlier that they're pretty good at finding things. But the rats here, they have some ninja rats as well. So these are death runners. These guys are pretty much completely invisible until they get right on top of you. So if these guys get around the back and are able to kind of slip into the dwarven ranks and just kind of, uh, you know, get it in there, ooh, that's gonna be tough. So Gyrocopters dropping their steam cannons right here on the Night Runners, actually doing some pretty good damage, but the Night Runners are going to be retaliating. But Gyrocopters do have 100 armor, so they're not going to be pushovers. Now there needs to be a bombing run. I wonder if he's going to be dropping bombs. He's probably going to be going for the Stormbird move. But oh man, the steam cannons are just eviscerating those Night Runners. So you know, trying to make me eat my words for earlier, but I'm still not going to say that Gyrocopters are good. On the other side of the battlefield, we do have a Doom Wheel. All oh, the Doom Wheels coming in. This thing's going to be running over a lot of dwarf infantry if it's not taken down quickly. And again, it's pretty much like the Skaven Chariot, but uh, it shoots lasers and it's pretty solid for sure. So we're going to see if that thing can get into the back line, but it's going to be tough for the dwarves. There's a lot of high value threats for sure, but the dwarf infantry has a massive advantage. So right here, it looks like the uh, Night Runners. Oh, and the bombs are coming down. No, it looks like those are literally just ninja stars bouncing off the, uh, the gyrocopters here, which is pretty funny. But he is able to break off some of the Night Runners with those Steam Cannons. And yeah, getting some decent value against these guys. And I actually haven't seen them used in this way. So maybe I'm going to be uh, taking a lesson from today. Anyways, Gyrocopter is going to be circling about. They could dive in melee if they want to and just go in with their like rudder blades and try and take those guys out. But I think they're going to keep shooting. He might end up losing one of the Gyrocopters. But at the very least, I think he's certainly netted his value. And honestly, maybe just chase those Night Runners off. Get rid of them. I mean, you could with the Gyrocopters. So the Death Runners for the Skaven, the Assassins. Oh, did he, he, scoot, did he scoot closer to the edge? Oh my god. That is so scummy. It's just like against the edge of the map. I love it. Oh, just the memes. The memes are real. So anyways, I mean, uh, I, you can't blame him. It's, it's, it's so hard not to want to do that when you're playing the dwarves. But, uh, but yeah, anyways. Dwarf Lord here is going to be standing valiantly, just kind of waiting for the Skaven Horde. You can see the gyrocopters in the distance are going to be coming. But the, the bell of the Skaven is ringing and potentially spelling doom for the Dawi. We're going to find out here. And you can see over here on the flank, the, uh, the Death Runner is going to be coming up. Their concealment bombs are probably off cooldown. But there are no openings. But... Miners with blasting charges are like pitiful combatants. They are just so weak. So if these death runners come up, they could maybe cleave through the miners pretty quickly. It's hard to say, but they have blasting charges. So you know, I think it's time. It's time. The first wave of the rats are going to be coming in. Warriors of Dragonfire Pass are going to be waiting for them. And this is going to be a massacre. Those dwarf infantry will beat the brakes off those Skaven. It's going to be incredibly tough. And over here, you can see the main Skaven army is going to be coming in. So Skaven Slaves, Storm Vermin, all these guys. But it looks like the Steam Cannons are actually shooting the uh, Storm Vermin in the back and doing some pretty decent damage. The Doom Wheels coming in from the other side. The Skaven are just being very, very prepared in their timing here. The Death Runner's waiting in the shadows for an opportunity. He's waiting for the Dwarfs to pull. Blasting Charges and Torpedoes are going to be going down. These rats are just going to get blown up by the uh, Dwarf Blasting Charges. And look at the Blasting Charges coming in, just roasting the rats. The Dwarfs have these Satchel Charges they throw. Now the Iron Breakers are just going to be in just an immovable just wall here. They're just going to be waiting, taking no damage. But it looks like Queen Headtaker, the Lord himself, is coming in. And that provides some pretty good armor piercing. But the Trollhammer Torpedoes in the back are just going to be so strong. And they're just teeing off on these guys. But the walls of Skaven are washing upon the Dwarf front line. And it looks like some rats did come from the Underworld. They're going to be coming into the back line. And the Rangers have been forced into melee combat, which is not good. And some of these uh, Iron Breakers, Iron Breakers look like they're going to be pulling back. But that does open up the front line. And the Plague Priest has gotten back here. So it looks like the Dwarves are kind of faltering a little bit in their defensive tactics. This big bell is just going to be ramming these guys and spreading plague all around in that green aura. But the dwarves are going to be able to kind of purge this threat, but you know, not at a cost, uh, not without a cost here. The iron drakes are being chased down by some of the clan rats. A lot of the back lines just kind of faltering, and the death runners have now collapsed. Death runners are so much stronger than miners. Dwarf miners are kind of like, you know, probably not meant for pure combat. They're more of like a battlefield spatial control unit. So they're going to be taking a ton of damage from these Skaven assassins. And you can see the Skaven just raising their shields and pushing through this dwarven formation. So let's take a look at the battle overall. So the Dwarf front line is holding. It's quite firm. The Dwarf Lord is doing very well. The Storm Vermin here are uh, being beaten down. Clan Rats are holding. Uh, dwarf Warriors are holding. Pretty much every front, with the exception of this flank, is doing pretty well for itself. But the Skaven have pushed back the Torpedoes. But if the Torpedoes are able to get back online, that is going to be pretty scary. Now, the Dwarf player has responded pretty effectively. He's pulled in the Dragonback Slayers. And these guys are an anti-large specialist. You do not want them on top of any of your big targets. They're going to be chasing away the Plague Furnace. And if the Plague Furnace does not run here, it's going to get killed very, very quickly by those guys. 
In the meantime, gyrocopters in the skies are just sitting and providing a bit of overwatch fire. But the problem with the dwarves is, if you fight this close to the edge of the map, if these guys break or any of these infantry break or run for a moment, they're going to run off the map and you're going to lose them for the entire battle. So there is a bit of a downside to corner camping as well. And another huge issue is that the Doom Wheel is still around. Look at this thing. It's just straight up Limp Biscuit rolling all over this army here. It's going to be charging in and probably getting right to these guys. Oh, this is going to be so bad for these dwarves. They're just going to get straight up run over. So yeah, those guys getting cleaved pretty bad. And the Doom Wheel can easily just shut down those torpedoes if it wants to. Oh, but look at it. It's actually pretty low. So it looks like some of the torpedoes have been hitting this guy. And some of the Iron Drakes are going to be turning to shoot. And we're going to see if they can get the volley off. So they're turning. They're going to line up their torpedoes. And the volleys are off. They're going to be shooting into that, that wheel. And it might actually break it. It's so low. It's shaking. And that's also bad for the Skaven that it's very close to the edge of the map. And it's going, it's going. It's got 598 HP, 5 leadership. It's going to be charging back in, last samurai style. But it looks like it's going to be turning and breaking in the torpedoes finish off the Doom Wheel. So the huge Skaven construct in a lot of trouble. And it looks like the dwarves might be able to anchor and rally this battle. In the meantime, the play grease here is getting very low. Uh, the Slayers have just been chopping at it. And it has some armor, but the Dragback Slayers are just going to be dropping their karate kicks, just chasing after this thing. 800 HP. The Torpedoes have now turned their sights onto this, and it looks like the Dwarves, even though their backline was penetrated, were able to stabilize and use their reinforcing units and some of the uh, Iron Breakers they had in reserves to polish off the Skaven backline summon. So the Bounce Power is going to be going in the favor of the Extreme Meme Team. The classic Dawi corner camp coming into effect here. It looks like the Warlock Engineer for the Skaven, who is essentially the equivalent of one of their Wizards, is just being just beaten down by the Dwarves. He's going to be fleeing. Definitely don't blame that Rapoy. But it looks like in the leadership fight, the Skaven Lord is actually just destroying the Dwarf Lord. He has popped the Trophy Heads debuff which is going to put him pretty damn low in his combat stats. He's now at 19 and 15, and Queek is a, a very, very powerful duelist. Uh, Queek, uh, I love this game. So, 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 so. Anyways, Queek is probably going to win this, but I don't think the rest of his army is going to keep fighting. And that's very much kind of the Skaven way. The Skaven will often fight until, you know, things aren't looking favorable, and then they simply retreat. That's pretty much their tactics and lore in general, right? So Queek does pop the Verminous Valor, the Dwarf Goucher, all these different tools, and he has a couple of slaves coming in to kind of muck down the Dwarf Lord. He might be able to kill the Dwarf Lord. Uh, Dwarf Lord is very, very low. He has 800 HP. Dwarfs have great leadership, though. He's trying to run away, but Queek is coming in and, and clubbing him in the back. 300 HP, and uh, you can literally see on Queek's... Oh, but the torpedoes come and knock over Queek, and this Dwarf Ironbreaker rushes in to kind of rescue his king. And it looks like the Dwarf Lord might be able to get away as the torpedoes were knocking over Queek. The rat is going to be running in. I don't know where he's going to go. I mean, the rest of his army's faltering. The blasting charges eviscerating the Skaven in the front line. Dwarves have trained for a millennia to take on this uh, foe here, and you can see the Skaven are just going to be running through the flames as the Dwarf infantry just push through and route these Skaven infantry. So it's such a cool cinematic. I love that. Anyways, Queek had taker. Uh, the Dwarf Lord was able to get away, which is pretty bad for him. The big Skaven tool is pretty much offline. Warlock Engineer is 100% dead. Doom Wheel's dead. Plague Furnace is dead. And Queek stands alone. And Skaven do not like standing alone. He's probably going to be breaking due to army losses in a moment. There's literally no Skaven troops left. Just some Storm Vermin, just some Ramshackle. I mean, they're the best that Skaven have to offer as it pertains to infantry. But they're no match for Iron Breakers and Elite Dwarf infantry. who are just like some of the tankiest, most resolute infantry in the entire game. So... It's only a matter of seconds. Skaven are going to be breaking. They're going to be turning and running. Dwarf infantry will be routing them. And it's going to be Queek Head Taker. I mean, he's getting some pretty good kills, killing a couple of dwarves on his way out. But for the most part, he's going to be just getting swarmed and, uh, yeah, just running away. So that's going to be victory for the dwarves. I really thought they were in a lot of trouble with all the summons. I mean, you know, the, the ODM champion had a pretty good rush there into the back line with all the summons and the Death Runner flank collapsing on the miners. It was a beautiful engagement. But, uh, yeah, that was that was crazy. I mean, the, the torpedo save on the Dwarf Lord was definitely very clutch. Regardless, the Dwarfs had so many elite infantry. I mean, those three Iron Breakers were not going anywhere. Those guys were just, just taking no damage. But Dwarf Backline did take some work. But for the most part, the big Skaven tools just got nuked by those torpedoes, which was pretty heavy metal for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, as far as like the rules go, it's it's a little bit tricky. If for anyone who's wondering, it's a little bit tricky for me to catch all the stuff while I'm casting. I usually don't like to focus on that. So typically, when I'm running my tournaments, I have like a referee. But for today, I'm just kind of being a little bit more laxed on it because whatever, you know, it's a, it's a more casual thing. Um, all right. So, yeah, well played. So that's going to be uh, XMT getting back on the board here. Let's go ahead and update the scoreboard. <laughs> One wrong put, right? Yeah, the dwarves certainly settled that book of uh, that grudge right there. I don't think it would have mattered. I mean, even if he fought forward, I don't know it would have made a big difference. I don't think the corner camp helped him that much. The Skaven still fully surrounded him. Um, but even still. Yeah. 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 Yeah, everything the Skaven had ran straight off. Yeah, but the Doom Wheel fought to the bitter end for sure. Yeah. It was a bit of a it was a bit of a uh a, a little bit of corner camping action, for sure. I'll have to look into that. But yeah, the Gyrocopter got quite a few kills. I mean he really made me eat my words with those things. Ninety seven and eighty eight on those bad boys. And uh eighty seven and forty four. Ironbreaker's got a ton of kills, 78, 83, 137. 
for this game, and I mean, the Death Runners did really good. Plague Furnace, they just got nuked, though. I mean, they got dragged down by the Slayers. The Doom Wheel actually didn't break. It fully, full on got destroyed, which is uh, pretty interesting. So, but anyways, guys, we're going to be taking a quick intermission, and uh, we're on game six now. So, only two games left, which are really going to kind of determine the outcome of this clan war. And uh, that's going to be it for now. So, guys, we will be back in just a moment. So, hang tight, and we'll see you in a couple minutes. Cheers.
All right, guys, and we're back. So we uh, just had a little bit of a review of the last game, and it is tough when I'm casting to see, you know, all, how truly close he was to the edge of the map. But we looked back, and it was it was pretty much like a hard line camp. So we're gonna reverse the call on that, and it's gonna be a, a game loss there because it was just it was uh, it was pretty egregious for sure. But again, today's a pretty casual casual structure, so so no no stress there. So yeah, but yeah, that is in the rules, and we try and maintain like a standard, you know. Get in kind of a, a queue of rules with the King's Cup because if you don't, it's just going to kind of devolve into just just anarchy. So of course we do have the, the army limits, but there are rules of engagement regarding single entities and different things like that. So um, so yeah, yeah, no worries. Yeah, no, the game was still really fun to watch. So regardless, but just in for the sake of like the clan war, I think it would be like unfair if like you know they were able to win just by one game at the end because you know I mean it, it is a variable for Skaven who are a low leadership faction because if they have to fight at the edge of the map they're going to break off much easier than the dwarf so it definitely does kind of come into effect in that regard so so we're going to be jumping into the next match here let's go ahead and uh, update the scoreboard real quick and uh let's do this and uh I think I think we just did I change that was it two was that two before I can't remember was it two? was it three two guys <laughs> I can't remember. What was the score? Did I update it before? I don't think so. I don't think I did. Maybe it was. I think it was I think it was 3-1, right? My game is my brain is just not not functioning today. But yeah, no, it's part of the thing is like learning about tournament rules. If you're gonna play in like a tournament environment, you gotta like, you know, get used to those type of things anyways. Yeah, because like if we had no rules, you could just bring like five Vargulfs and things like that. Yeah, absolutely. It would be 4-1. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Thank you. And I know there's a little bit of lag right now. For some reason, my internet is just uh, giving me some trouble. So, thank you. Thank you. You guys want a 4v4 at the end? Yeah, it should be 4-1. It should be 4-1. Thank you, guys. Okay. So, the scoreboards are updated, and uh, that's pretty much going to guarantee victory for ODM. However... XMT can certainly claw its way back for a couple games, and in this matchup, we're going to have the Vampire Counts facing off against the Greenskins, which is a matchup that certainly favors the Vampire Counts in my anecdotal experience. Uh, how is the connection, guys? Does it seem a little bit laggy? Uh, yeah, so it's it's a DQ last match because of uh, corner camping. So if you're if you're on the edge of the map like that, I just had to go back and, and look again and talk to some of the guys, but it was like you can't be right on the white line because it's going to be severely punishing for certain factions. And it also creates um, like unnatural separation between your front line and the gyrocopters. Hence, they're allowed to shoot longer. There's there's a bunch of different reasons why it's it's kind of like, yeah, yes. But we are using tournament rules now, so it's yeah. It wasn't as bad, honestly. It, yeah, it wasn't like a bad rule break. It was still a very entertaining game. But we got you know we got to follow our structured rules. So yeah, we could do a four v four at the end for sure, or even a two v two might be better. It's been cutting out. Yeah, maybe I should adjust my bit rate. Just give me one second, guys. Um, let's go ahead and put this down to... We're going to adjust the bit rate down to 5,000, see if that kind of uh, stabilizes the lag a little bit. It should help. It looks like it's stabilizing around 5,000 now, so my apologies for that. Someone next door must be doing some naughty stuff. All right. Go time. <laughs> Don't say F. No. No saying F. <laughs> you guys don't say that. Um, no, it looks good on my end. I don't know what you guys are talking about. Are you guys just trolling me? Come on. <laughs> Come on, spare me. Um, Shetland, if you're still in chat, could you actually link the uh, the rules in chat, like the ones for the tournament? I know there's a lot of new players here who would be very interested in seeing that. So, Stream looks good to me. Yeah, you guys are just... You guys are just trolling me. Yes. <laughs> God damn it. All right, so we're going to be starting the battle here between Reginald Puckington, who's going to be uh, representing XMT. He's going to be playing Vampire Counts. And the Greenskins are going to be led by uh, ODM Goliath. So the Orcs, uh, you know, Tol not Tolkien's Orcs, but they're the Wa. It's a little bit different, but yeah. Hey, Professor Pipes, thank you for the $5 donation. The leader of, uh, of XMT himself. Uh, proud of them. Yeah, the, all these fights have been pretty close, to be honest. In the last fight, honestly, I really think the Dwarf player probably could have won even without the corner camp. But, you know, that's just, it's really, really punching against Skaven. I think his Death Runners just, like, ran off the map when they were, like, you know, because the Skaven troops always run and come back. They even have an ingrained trait where when they run, they come back faster. It's called scurry away. They're rats. They're, you know, it's kind of how they work. So if you fight on the edge of the map and they just run off the map instead of r rallying away and then coming back, you're really punishing the Skaven, too. So, you know, you got to, yeah, it's, it's, 
It could have been different, but who knows? Yeah, we just changed the bitrate, so maybe it temporarily kind of like jolted the stream or something. Uh, Death Glow Bombardiers aren't bad against dwarves. They're, it's not bad at all. But they, it does have a 25% mitigation on the damage, but even still, even still, I think, uh, I don't know. It's it's a really hard matchup for this game in general. I think it, it heavily favors the dwarves, for sure. So yeah, we're going to block that so you guys can't see their armies, or they can't see each other's armies as I double check to make sure everything's in accordance with the rules. And that army looks good and tasty, and so does the green skin one. All right, we're good. We could even do a rematch. Um, I would actually be down for that if those players wanted to, but for now I think we're going to keep moving forward. Yeah. At the end of the stream, if those two want to do a rematch and they both agree on it, because again, it's a very friendly competition today, I'm more than willing to do that. I believe Felcon is the only gentleman from XMT who has one today. Yes. I'll double check the replays and make sure though. <laughs> I'll go back. Bring a ruler. I really think the dwarves would have won that, even without the corner camp. Like, had they just scooted up? I know it's tempting to do that, because it cuts off an entire avenue of attack for your opponent, but it's still, uh, you know, in my opinion, not the not the way to do it. Oh, uh, yeah, we can Wookiee cast the final match? I don't think so. Death Runners are quite good against dwarves, for sure. Um, yeah? Uh, Pipes, you guys want to do a rematch? I'm down for that, if you guys want to. Because, again, today's a much more casual structure. It's not like an actual, you know, there's not like anti- so, Pipes, if you could actually talk to the uh, Shidoku, the clan leader of uh, ODM, and see if they want to do that, please. I would love to see a rematch between those two guys. I think that would be a much more kind of gratifying end for sure. Yeah, I, I agree. I think the Dwarves would have won no matter what. Talk to him. Go talk to him about it. And if he's willing to, we can definitely do a rematch. Yeah, the Dragon thing, too, was a little bit questionable, but even still, yeah. So, go for it. Talk to him about it. I'm, I'm more than willing to. Let's make it a DQ and call it 3-1. Yeah, we could. Rematch with new armies? Yeah. Sounds good. So we're going to cast this game and we'll take a look at what you guys decide on. Yes. All right. So um, let's go ahead and make sure everything looks good in regards to the game. The bitrate is holding up. Everything is good and tasty. So up here in the skies, we do indeed have the Red Duke. So the Red Duke, a pretty powerful choice. He does have El Seif, a very good duelist against squishy greenskin lords. He can slow them down by 48% with his unique ability, uh, can mitigate their physical melee defense. It is pretty insane for sure. So on top of that, we do have the Glorious Black Coach, which is the vampire count equivalent of a chariot. Causes terror, which is good. Has anti-infantry, does magic damage, which circumvents the physical resist of many of the different greenskin troops. So I like that quite a bit. On top of that, we got Blood Knights up here. Uh, Blood Knights, one of the most elite cab in the game. These are the Vampire Knights of Red Keep. Uh, Anti-large, massive charge bonus of 72%. More importantly, though, they're also susceptible to healing. And I do not know what's going on with this Vampire Count army. If they're doing, like, a, a meme train or something, we'll, we'll find out in a moment. But anyways, uh, he does also have the Chill Geist, which is a very unorthodox pick. FG of the Get is quite good against these guys. But in the past, Greenskin struggled at dealing with ghostly units because they don't have the best magic damage across the board. Fist of Gork does imbue magic damage now. And, of course, uh, the Night Goblin Shaman has some magic damage abilities. But, yeah, we're going to find out. So the Chill Guys here, ready to party. And, uh, and yeah. We got the Varex Reavers in the back. Varex Reavers are basically just a standard shock cab unit. More than likely, the Vampire Counts will use these guys in the front line just to kind of hammer the uh, initial troops up here. On top of that, uh, for infantry, we have the Sternsmen, which are the Grave Guard Regiment for now. And these guys are quite strong. Uh, bonus versus infantry, good defensive stats. They heal themselves. These guys are very, very tough to kill. So I like this Vampire Counts army quite a bit. He's got the uh, swords, chaff, skeletons, just mostly chaff on the wings. And uh, he's got some doggies somewhere on the flank. I think he had some uh, dire wolves, who he probably Vanguard deployed in the corner, I would imagine. So yeah, the Dire Pack's going to be ambushing from the corner. And uh, for ODM here, uh, for Goliath, he does have a... Oh, he has a giant. So it looks like we're going to have the Crimson Killers, who are recently buffed. So these guys are dual-wielding Black Orcs. These guys will absolutely annihilate, just annihilate most infantry. These guys are definitely very, very solid. On top of that, he does have a big old giant. So the giant's going to be pretty scary for sure. If the giant stands on top of these guys, that's going to be a pretty just mean force. On top of that, we do have Warzog. Warzog, of course, one of the more competitive picks. Fist of Gork, there we go. And uh, it looks like he does have the Foot of Gork as well. Got a Night Goblin, uh, or a, a Goblin Big Boss. So just on foot, which is really interesting. You almost never see these guys on foot. I mean, they, they really shine on horseback. So I, I don't know if I agree with the pick on foot, but we're going to see how he goes. Uh, Savage Orc Biggins, of course, anti-large, a bit of a dual purpose. Good against Cav, good against Infantry. You know, they have decent physical resist. So yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be quite a fight. Aside from that, he's got some more savage orcs on the flanks. He's got the broken tusk mob in the back. So these guys riding their the wild hogs back here. 
Yeah, they definitely got some wild hogs for sure. Look, oh, that's kind of cool. They have like, face masks on. But, um, but yeah. And they have anti-large, armor piercing, pretty good combat stats, 27 and 29 by greenskin standards, because typically their cav are very poor. Forest Goblin Spider Riders to apply the poison, give some battlefield utility, pin down the uh, cav of the vampire counts. And that's pretty much it. Looks like he does have a Night Goblin Shaman with the Vindictive Glare as well. And uh, we're going to we're gonna get it rolling. Oh yeah, it's time. So I'll let the players know they can start and start. Here we go. So yeah, we will find out after the game if the players want to rematch that one before for anyone who's asking in chat. So we will get uh, we will get back to that. But yeah, certainly some crazy games today. So the battle's underway. The Vampire Counts, of course, have a very heavy cav force. So there's going to be a ton of micromanagement. It's going to be a lot of work to push them in, push them out, make sure they're not in sustained combat against like Savage Orc Biggins and the Giant and different things like that. And as far as killing the Giant goes, I mean, the Blood Knights are probably the best candidate. But aside from the Blood Knights, there's not really much to deal with this fat, angry Giant back here. You can see this guy's just going to be moving in with a full chub. He's like, oh, yes, there's no terror, guys. He's probably so happy about that. But he's going to be pushing in, definitely do a ton of damage to the Sternsmen, and yeah, it's really going to come down to the Blood Knights. Red Duke is going to be very good at sniping out Warzog, so Warzog needs to hide among his nasty Skulkers, because these guys can actually drop a Smoke Bomb, which slow, uh, slows everything by 76 or 76%, yeah, is actually the uh, the metric there. So it's going to be able to slow those guys down and uh, generate some pretty good value. So initially, coming off the flanks here, you can see that the Chill Guys are going to be charging in, running down some of these uh, Savage Orcs, which is going to be good. The Magic Damage is going to actually circumvent their uh, Physical Resist, so the Physical Resist of these Savage Orcs is not going to be helpful here. And they're probably going to take some casualties as the Black Coach rides through them as well. They don't lose any models, but they do take some HP damage. And in the front, we have the Varric Reavers going to be riding into some of these goblins. So some heavy charges coming in from the Vampire Counts. But the Black Orcs are coming in, and the Giant is going to be just clubbing these guys, doing a ton of damage. And I don't know if there's going to be a lot to kill the Giant. The Wah has been popped, so the Greenskin Battle Cry has been set loose. And the entire army is going to be getting a massive buff. And uh, Vampire Counts definitely need to pull back. They do not want to be grinding this fight out here. So in the meantime, Vampire Counts doing a bit of a tactical retreat with the Chill Geist and the uh, Black Coach here. And on top of that, we do have Savage Orcs. So the Savage Orcs are going to be re-engaging here against the Sternsmen. Sternsmen will make very quick work for them with the Black Coach. And this entire Greenskin flank here, probably going to get mulched very quickly. But in the center, it's going to favor the Greenskins. But the one thing about the Greenskin fight is all of their troops are fighting skeletons. The Vampire Counts are doing a very good job kind of, a, you know, not fighting with their high-value units, in, you know, in, in the pit fight. But over here in the flank, ooh, this spells disaster. That could actually be game right now. The uh, Blood Knights actually got completely trash canned. You can see they're just being just taken apart by the hordes of Greenskins. I mean, there are some summon zombies from the Red Duke to kind of help out a little bit and tarp at these guys, but the Blood Knights pretty much shattered. I mean, there's 20 of them. They're crumbling. They're going to be going uh, down pretty quick here. Invocation of the Heck, the Vampiric Healing spell is going to be uh, healing up those Blood Knights, but of course, I don't think it's going to be enough to save them. Now, in the main fight, the Black Coach has entered here. Reginald Puckington getting in there with the Coach, but the Giant is pretty much a hard counter. It has enough mass to stop this thing, and it's just going to be dropping the thunder here, crushing skeletons, zombies, all that kind of stuff, and Crimson Killers. Uh, Savage Orc Biggins here all have bonus for Slarge, and there are some Vampire Cav kind of riding about, but the Black Coach probably in a little bit of trouble, and it looks like Vampire Counts, uh, I mean, they're going to have to go Lord Sniping. I really think that the Red Duke should probably go in and just try and kill the uh, the Baconator, kill Warzog right now, and maybe that could get them back in the game, because it seems like the Greenskins, the, the Orc Boys, are just kind of dumpstering them on pretty much every front. I mean, you can see here that the Blood Knights, 18 models, and uh, the Bounce Fire is still even. I mean, the Sternsmen and some of the Vampire Count infantry is still alive, but the Giants are healthy, Crimson Killers are healthy. But you can see here the Vampire Count's doing the one thing that could potentially get them back in the game. So very good play here by Puggington. He's going to actually be going after Warzog. So he's going to be trying to chase Warzog down. And, uh, and yeah, Warzog's going to be able to squeal away. And if Warzog can actually run amongst his boys here, you can see these Savage Orcs are just rock hard waiting for this fight. And yes, they do have those Ghostly Cab, which are going to be very, you know, tough to kill for these uh, Greenskin forces. But he does have Fist of Gork and Foot of Gork, so he has ample resources to provide magic damage. Here we go, has also been popped. And the Vampire Counts are going to be trying to restructure their army. So if we look here, they do have the Sternsmen, they have the Tithe, they do have the Chill Guys here, which could potentially cause a terror route. And the Red Duke could do some sniping. The Black Coach here is going to be crumbling, of course, undead units for anyone who's new to the game. They don't run away the same way that uh, mortal units do. They just uh, crumble into dust, essentially. So it's kind of their leadership mechanic. The Goblin here is going to be fighting, but it looks like the Red Duke has come down on his Hellsteed. He's going to be summoning some zombies right here, it looks like, or uh, maybe dropping a healing spell. But the Night Goblin Shaman actually getting picked off, so that does give the Vampire Counts a way to maybe get back in the game, just shutting down the casters. If he can methodically kill the Night Goblin Shaman, then go over and snipe out Warzog using a really good uh, LC and a timing push. But don't let the Goblin live. Oh, and he lets the Goblin live. Maybe these uh, chill guys can come in and finish off the Goblin. He needs to be put down because that Vindictive Glare can actually do a ton of damage against the Red Dukes. Yeah, he's going to be charging in there, polishing off, polishing off that lad there. And up on the high ground, the Dire Pack and the Varix Reavers and Blood Knights have been able to stabilize. And they're just kind of riding around, securing the open field. So knowing they've lost the infantry fight. And the Greenskin's one of the most powerful brute force factions up close. They're just riding around and killing all the scraps on the periphery and trying to regroup their forces elsewhere. 
sniping out the caster. So this might be an opportunity for Mr. Puggington to get back to the game. That giant's going to be so tough to kill, though. Giants are just so meaty. And if, unless you have a true anti-large unit, well, he's just going to be giving the business to these guys in a moment. The ghosts do get 75% uh, resistance against all non-magic attacks. So they're going to be very tough to kill. But yeah, even still, they're crumbling. Just the Savage or Figgins. I mean, just the damage output of the Greenskins is insane. But a very beautiful catch over here. He's able to get the Varix Reavers plus the Black Coach. Oh, and if Elsief comes in here, if the Red Duke is able to kind of sweep around off the uh, from the skies here and finish off the Greenskin Lord, Greenskins have really, really tough leadership. So Wurzog, very, very low here. Very controversial stuff. He might be going down 842 HP. He's going to be tanking pretty quick. And uh, yeah, the Red Duke, is he going to get him? 700, 700 HP is getting so low. The Black Coach is going to be circling back in to provide Terran. He does actually knock away the support. So the Goblin Big Boss actually gets pushed back by the Black Coach. And you can see here that the uh, the Warzog Baconator Man is in a little bit of trouble. He's terrified. And suddenly, we have a game. I mean, the Vampire Counts could get back in this. And now, do they have any Blood Knights? Like, the Blood Knights are such a good tool against a Giant. Maybe if he can get Evocations and resurrect a couple of them, but... Yeah, he's got 11 Blood Knights. That is not going to be enough. And that giant is just going to be so tough. So the Greenskin Lord is going to be squealing and running back to the hills on his pig. He is 100% done. He's like, screw this shit, I'm out of here. And uh, let's go ahead and take a look at the Greenskin. So Greenskins have a giant. They have some goblins still fighting here. The Crimson Killers are just like a murder machine. They probably have so many kills. And just fighting and just cleaving through these zombies and chaff units. They're doing a pretty good job. I mean, the giant is going to come in here and support them as well, I would imagine. But it looks like he does get... Oh, that is not good. So Reginald Puggington does a very good job getting the giant... Uh, or getting the spears on top of the giant. Oh, no, he needs to turn that around. Attack the giant with your spears. You know, kind of pin him and keep him from getting back to the main fight. But it looks like... This black coach is also alive somehow. This thing's been sitting at like negative HP or negative leadership for the past like two or three minutes and still alive somehow. 500 leadership is going to be charging into the uh, the Savage Orcs over here and still netting some pretty good value. Might actually be able to terror out those guys because the black coach actually does cause terror. Now the Savage Orcs uh, or the Crimson Killers actually have 154 kills, definitely paying their dues here. They're just pretty pretty much just clubbing these little ghouls. I mean, the ghouls definitely not up to the task of fighting these, these giant hulking black orcs who I think... Pound for pound, Black Orcs, the Crimson Killers, are actually one of the strongest units in the game. They just got a huge buff in the last uh, patch. They now have 60 units instead of 45, and the Giant here is, of course, he's going to be lending his aid and crumbling these uh, Skeletons. But the Skeleton Spear is getting their little Prison Shanks, doing some work, but the Giant, is he going to eat a Skeleton? Why did Blood? Anyways, I'm not going to ask questions. So the Giant just ate a Skeleton, which is cool, and uh, you can see here that the Vampire Counts are uh, creeping back into the game. They're actually ahead on the bounce of power, and I think that was because the Baconator got taken out, which is one of the things that so often happens in this matchup, is that the Greenskin Lords really go down. Now, with Missile Pressure, you can protect it a little bit better and fend off the Red Duke, but he went just pretty balls deep in with the aggressive infantry. But is the Red Duke and the Vampire Count forces, are they going to be able to finish off the Giant? I think that the Greenskin here, ODM Goliath, should definitely just finish off the Skeleton Spears, because from there, there's no other true anti-large specialists. Yeah, this Black Coach, man, the fact that this thing didn't get finished is just generating so much value. So you can see the Black Coach is just going to be riding circles right now. Just doing some Tokyo drifting around the formation. The little Goblin Big Boss on foot, like, if he was on a, any sort of a mount, if he was on a wolf or a spider, both of which he can ride, he would be able to just catch this thing and kill it, which is so painful. A very good smoke bomb going down. So the Skulkers, before they just get lanced by these Black Knights, are able to drop a smoke bomb and pin down the Black Coach. Or, or slow it temporarily down to a 19 speed, but the Giant still isn't going to be able to catch it. He only has 36 speed and he's quite far away. In the meantime, the Black Coach does have, or the, not the Black Coach, but the uh, Red Duke does have his Fell Bats up in the sky. And they're going to be circling around looking for opportunities to strike here. The last of the Skeleton Spearmen are going to be crumbling. And can the Greenskins hold out? 236 kills here on the Crimson Killers. The Giant does have a rock in 61. But again, the Giant's been focusing more high value targets and more uh, you know, priority things that have a lot of HP. So his kill count isn't going to be quite so high. So the Red Duke does charge in here. A bit of a bold strategy caught. And we're not sure if it's going to work out. Uh, the Red Duke, of course, can hurt the Giant pretty bad if he gets those good rear charges. But it looks like he's trying to snipe the Goblin Big Boss with El Seif. Uh, he lowered his stats, his speed, his melee defense, all that. Giant, of course, is helping to finish off the uh, infantry here. But the Vampire Counts still have the Sternsmen. The Sternsmen are still alive, which is going to be pretty tough. I mean, Black Orcs will beat down, beat them down. But just in sheer numbers game, Black Orcs are starting to get a little bit worn down, especially from these cycle charges with the Black Coach. So the Red Duke has engaged now. He's going to be attacking. And it looks like the Black Coach coming in. Oh, no, the Giant could just do so much damage if it turns its attention. They have really slow attack animations, though. And it looks like he had the wrong targeting. So the Giant might not have gotten that swing there. So he stomps angrily and turns around. Now the Red Duke's going to be going after the Goblin Big Boss. Now, all Goblin units have pretty pitiful leadership in general. So he's probably going to be buckling here in a moment anyways. And uh, it looks like somehow the Extreme Meme team with the Vampire Counts might be coming back in this game, even though they didn't have the best answers for the Giant. They're just winning through sheer attrition and a really good tactical, uh, you know, snipe there on Warzog, I think, was able to get them back in the game. So the Goblin Big Boss 
is able to anchor next to the giant, which is going to be quite helpful. And some of these uh, Sternsman and Skeletons and other troops are being clubbed down by the giant. But he has 6,500 HP and giants have pretty much, you know, impervious leadership. I think what could get the Greenskins back in the game, if the giant is able to intercept the Black Coach, and look at this, uh, some of the Knights coming in the back, and they actually might break the Crimson Killers. And if the Crimson Killers break, oh no, and the Orcs are broken. So they've taken too many charges in the back, the grinding, the fighting, just... It's worn them out and they're going to be running. I mean, they certainly paid for themselves, but now the giant is 100% isolated. Some of the orcs are being sent flying by the lancing charges of these black knights back here. And the giant's probably just going to be surrounded, maybe. Oh my god, the tithe is so low, the strengthmen are so low, the black coach is low. Everything is so beat up. And the red duke, of course, he needs to come in and just... Yeah, what he should probably do is maybe just get some like very beat up cap units and chase this goblin big boss off the battlefield or send some skeletons or something else. But, uh, I mean, the giant's going to be a really tough proposition. This thing has 6,000 HP. It's still pretty meaty. Its leadership is getting low. Maybe he could just rear charge it and break its leadership. So the red dude coming in, he's going to be attacking the back of this giant. The uh, the black coach does come in the front and takes a huge club to the face, actually sending its uh, leadership to negative, which means it's going to start crumbling, crumbling again. And also the Black Coach is very close to its healing cap, so that could be a bit of an issue as well. And uh, and yeah, Red Duke's going to be dropping a zombie summon, which is going to tarpet the uh, the big old giant here. But the giant still has the support of the Goblin Big Boss. Bounce of power very, very heavily in the favor of the Vampire Counts at this point, largely due to the fact that the uh, Lord is still alive. So right here you can see that the Red Duke's going to be charging in, trying to intercept the Orcs before they can re-engage. So they did come back from their retreat, but uh, at this point they're just going to be charged into Oblivion again, and they're probably going to be breaking and uh, running off the battlefield as they're wavering. Three leadership, negative 12, negative 9, negative 40, and now they're done. So the giant is the last of the tools here. I mean, if they kill the goblin big boss, which is probably the smarter decision, it'll probably trigger army losses. And from there, the giant is simply going to retreat off the battlefield. So I think that would probably be the uh, the prudent decision. So anyways, the giant's going to be slam dunking here. The red duke's coming in. And the goblin big boss, of course, has pretty pitiful leadership, like I said. And uh, he's going to be kind of scurrying away here from the red duke, who, of course, is one of the more powerful duelists in the old world atop his steed here. He's not riding his most powerful mount, but definitely quite uh, quite the present. So the giant comes down, drops some clubbing. Sternsmen are actually getting very low, 21 kills. Man, if the Greenskins pulled this one out, that would be a pretty miraculous victory. But I really think that Reginald Puggington of the Extreme Meme Team probably has this one in the back here. So we're going to find out. We're going to find out, guys. It's, uh, it's, it's a close one, for sure. Yeah, you were hoping for Heinrich Kellner. Well, he'd be pretty good here. Krell would give him an extra bonus for his large to kind of work on the giant. But the Goblin Big Boss fighting in the pits here. Giant down to 4,000 HP, 56 leadership. He's definitely getting a little bit danger low. And the Red Duke's going to be pulling back. Knights are just going to be pulling back in. And uh, yeah, the Sternsmen and some of these other troops just doing their thing. The Black Coach actually crumbling here on the far side. So 355. And it looks like that's going to be a withdrawal from the Greenskins. So that's a victory for the Vampire Counts. The Giant does have great leadership, but alas... The Vampire Counts pulled that game back. Now, that normally is a very tough matchup for the Greenskins, so I just want to say very well played to Goliath. He played a very solid game, but so did Puckington. I mean, he, he had a really rough start. He lost his Blood Knights, he lost most of his infantry, but he was able to rally back and, uh, you know, go for those, uh, those good targets there. All right, so we're going to update the uh, scoreboard here, so XMT does get the win there. And we're going to go see what the gentleman decided on for the rematch. Um, so give me one second here. All right. So, well played to those gentlemen. Um, we're going to go ahead and jump back into the lobby. And I think... Yeah, GG to both of those guys. GG, it was a great game. All right. So now, um, as you guys saw, the Skaven vs. Dwarf game earlier, there was a disqualification or, uh, or a game loss, essentially, because the Dwarves were corner camping. So, um, like, they were, like, right on the white line. And apparently the player didn't know that particular rule very well. So we're actually going to go talk to the clan leaders real quick, and we're going to see if we can agree on a rematch. Now, technically, it should be just be, you know, a loss. But um, I'm going to see if they want to do the rematch after this one, because technically this is the seventh game. And if they agree to the rematch, I can actually adjust the score. So we're going to be back after a quick intermission here, and we're going to see what they want to do. So stay tuned, guys, and we'll see you in just a moment.
All right, guys, so in a show of good faith, both clans have agreed to nullify the result of the earlier game, which was the Skaven vs. Dwarf game, in which the dwarves won the game, but actually ended up uh, being disqualified and losing the game due to a corner camp rule break. However, in the spirit of good fun and uh, sportsmanship in class, both clans have agreed to uh, nullify that game, and they're going to do a rematch. So we actually still have a contested series on our hands now. So if we take a look here at the uh, the main desk, uh, XMT just won the last game. ODM was up. Uh, so essentially that win was taken away, and the loss was taken away from XMT. And uh, well, uh, you guys get it. My brain is just fried right now. But essentially... It's back to how it was before. So it's going to be 3-2. ODM is up 3-2. And it's going to be uh, Black Phillip taking on uh, the next champion for ODM isn't here yet. But he'll be here in a moment. And let's go ahead and pick a map. But yeah, so we're going to get our series back. So that was definitely cool. Uh, you know, it's not a fun way to... You, we do have to maintain the rules, but I, I'm flexible because it's, it's a casual event. There's not money at stake. It's just a fun thing for the viewers. So we're going to uh, replay that. We're going we're gonna to do it, roll it back, which is going to be fun. So... Yes. We're going to replay it, boys. But we do have to follow the rules to an extent, you know, because uh, they're still following the structure of the King's, you know, King's Cup rules. So we have to follow those. And instead of a game loss, I think I, I definitely agree that just going with a rematch is going to be a little much more fun for what we're doing today. But if there was prize money or something like that on the line, it's a bit of a different structure. But um, what map do we want to do? Let's do Let's see the old, the old troll, troll country. Yeah, so there's actually going to be uh, two more games. Yes. Um, Adam, I'd have to go back and watch the rules for the dragon, the dragon game, and like see it, because like I said, it, it's pretty tricky to cast the games and like look at the details and and also have all the rules in the back of your head at the same time. Like typically, I like to just cast, and that's why uh, for the Eternal Challenger League last week we had Shelton Apache as a ref, dude. That made my life so much easier, and uh, he did such a goddamn good job. So. Uh, are you happy enough to dab and joy? Not, not quite that happy. <laughs> not quite that happy. Yeah. So let me go ahead and check and make sure he's not having any issues joining the game. Uh, of course, there are some. Uh, let's go ahead and check here. Okay. I give. So he sent me a friend invite on Steam. And invitation sent. Um. So okay. One second, guys. Just getting this all squared away. All right. Welcome, guys. Yeah. The, I mean, I honestly think the Dragon game was like, you know, there's... Ultimately, the, if Bretonia had just not... The Fane Chantress had taken a wider route, they would have won easily. Yeah, I'm sick. Yeah. And the Dragon was engaging, but... Yeah. ODM, MG84. So now I'm learning that... Uh, that the regional stuff is definitely pretty tricky with this game. Like seeing lobbies. I don't know why that is. It's so weird. All right. So we're going to be adding him on Steam here, and he should be up in just a minute. Great. We got him in. And he's added as a friend. My friends list was actually full. Yeah. Yeah, the first game was quite good, <laughs> Shidoku. <laughs> it was quite good. I sense a little bit of bias there, but that's okay. Guys, if so here we go. Here's here's the deal. If we get if we get a victory here for the uh let's go ahead and take a look. So if ODM if Black Phillip is able to win this game, it would be a three three, and then the final game would come down to a rematch between the two gentlemen from earlier, which will be uh which will be pretty wild. Yeah. <laughs> Did you just link baguettes, Timmy? <laughs> oh, Misha, no, no. No purging. There, I, I went and looked at my friends list for people who had been like offline for like forever and aren't even active anymore, and I was able to fix it up today. Yeah, I think the dragon game was fine, honestly. That was like that ending was fucking amazing too, with the dragon. I can't believe he was able to pull that out. <laughs> that paladin just got like de dethroned. 
Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna clean it up a little bit. Um, yeah, we're just waiting for uh, MG. I added him on Steam, and I gotta I gotta see if I have him on here now. Yeah, he's right here. Maybe he doesn't know the password or something. I, I gave it to the clan leader, so. Um, typed it to him again just to be safe. All right, here we go. So it looks like we have Chaos vs. Tomb Kings in this heavyweight showdown. Uh, I'm going to let Aerocrastic, I'm going to let the gentleman pick a new uh, new factions if they want to. This isn't the rematch from earlier. The rematch is after this game. Yeah. <laughs> That's very true, Ninja Hun. You have, a, you have a great point there. That's the reason why I removed the face cam from the lobbies as well as the games. You don't need to see my face during the battles. Yeah. Turn is XMT. I'm not currently in any clans. Yeah, and again, guys, my apologies for the uh, some confusions on the rules. I mean, had to look at the go back and look when I was casting. Obviously, I, I mean, I saw that he was close, but yeah, it's just it's e it's easier to go back and review things and then make a call and then talk to the players involved because it's it's I prefer the sportsmanship angle. It just doesn't like yeah. I'm I'm glad they were able to come to an agreement in in accordance with the rules. So that was good. Uh, so Felcon says MG84 is a draw kiter. Just saying. Ooh, I hope not. We'll, we'll find out. We'll find out. Happy. All right, start when ready. So we're gonna go back to the uh, to the desk for a moment, so I can look at the armies, make sure they're not like spamming like ten of the same unit. Okay, so Black Phillip has his army. Looks pretty good, and it looks like MG84 is still deciding on his list. <laughs> Yeah, Zyphos is a beast. He's really, really good. Zyphos did, did played really well. High Elf versus Bretonia is a hard matchup, and he was able to claw that game out just friggin' tooth and nail. Oh. Milk for the milk god. Oh my god. Alright, so MG84 is pulling in the uh, the picks here. It's got a pretty meaty army so far. I'm liking it quite a bit. I, I really want to show you guys, but of course I don't want to, his his enemies to see his build before the battle starts. Jason Denny, the face is the face is back. We're here, brother. We're here for the clan war. It's gonna be fun. You guys want to see something funny? So Wookie is sitting behind me. In my bed. So I have my green screen. It blocks my bed. Wookie's sitting in the bed. If I stand up for a second and walk to the bathroom, he'll start barking at me because he can't like see what I am on. Check this out. Watch this. You guys ready for this? Hey Wookie. What's going on, buddy? Hey. Are you barking at me? You got something to say? Wookie. Come on, Wookie. Oh, let's let's get you to hang out with the game. All right, guys, Wookie's coming to say hi. Oh. You guys ready? Here he is. The prince is back. Hail to the prince. I'm not torturing him. Don't worry. I just brought him to say hi. I just wanted to go grab water, and he just barks at me. You got something to say, Wookie? You going to grunt at them? Oh no, I'm not poking him. If I simply walk past Wookie to get water, he'll bark at me. If he's laying down, because he gets like very defensive of the bed. It's kind of a weird thing. Yeah. He's he was pretty calm actually. Yeah. Well, I had Wookie out earlier. He shouldn't have any problems with that stuff. All right, so it looks like Chaos is almost ready. Pretty interesting army. There's a couple units in this list that you don't see terribly often, so I'm quite eager to see how they're going to do against the forces of Black Phillip and the Tomb Kings. Wookie, Wookie's a Skaven Beastman hybrid. All right. Uh, Wookie, let's put you in the chair here. Is that comfy for you? Here, let me. I need to make him a little rat's nest here. Hang on a second. Here you go, little buddy. I'm just making him a bed off camera so he can sit in the chair next to me and watch. So just bear with me, guys. 
There you go, little buddy. If you want to sit there, should be comfy for you. Oh. All right. And uh, <laughs> thank you for another donation, uh, Cincinnati of uh, Cincinnati us of VA. I believe is your name. Thank you for the twenty dollars donation, and he returns, dude. You guys want a Wookie cam? Hold on, dude. I I might actually be able to arrange that. You guys want me to mess with that? I um I will I will do that after this. All right, the players are ready. We're gonna be jumping into the battle here in just a moment, and uh, we're gonna jump over to the main camera. I will set up a Wookie cam. Okay. <clears throat> All right, it's time. So I actually have two webcams here because Italian Spartacus left his camera. So maybe between this game, I'll set up a wiki cam like on the chair. Oh my God, that's such a good idea. How come we've never done that before? Oh my God. He's just, he's just saying hi. All right, <clears throat> so ODM, three, uh, three wins, clan XMT has two so in order for xmt to stay in this game black philip is gonna have to win this one he's gonna have to come in with the steel chair and just deliver the fury of the tomb kings now as far as his build you can see here jason denny thank you for the 999 i will work on the wookie cam after this game I, I don't know if the webcam can reach that far but i'm gonna try and figure it out yes all right so you have something to say dude i just made you a comfortable like rat's nest here just let me cast this game and we'll figure out your camera all right Okay. <laughs> Jeez. All right, for the front line of the Tomb Kings, he has an entire core of the Tomb Guards with halberds. Can you just get comfortable there? You got, okay. Um, so we have an entire front line of the Tomb Guards with halberds, uh, anti-large armor piercing, a very good option against a multitude of threats on the Chaos roster, Dragon Ogres, any sort of cab units, and they also have good enough armor piercing to actually hurt the infantry. So I like that quite a bit. On top of that, we do have uh, the big old Setra, the Imperishable on his Sphinx. Uh, a pretty good duelist, honestly, even against like enemy anti-large units. He's, he's just powerful and he has really good supporting magic, plus the Blessed Blade of Petra, which does give him the uh, melee attack debuff the uh, and melee defense. So it's a really, really good item for sure. It's kind of like a trophy heads type thing. Anyways, Necrotect as well to provide those juicy heals to the fat constructs. And on top of that, he does indeed have Ushapti Grapo, two groups of Ushapti Grapos, which I love against Chaos. They do a ton of work against the big targets. They can kill the lords, um, just pound down those armored infantry. Because obviously the shields of Chaos Warriors and things like that aren't really going to help them against the, uh, the, the the fat, thick bolts of the Ushapti Grapos. On top of that, we do have Necropolis Knights with Halberds here on the far side. These guys are going to be, uh, yep, yeah, anti-large, armor piercing, solid stuff. I mean, not like as good as like Demogriff Knights or things like that, but they still have poison, which makes them relatively unique in that asset. So if you use them defensively and keep them amongst your spears, they can actually do pretty good. So for the forces of uh, ODM MG84, he does have uh, Marauder Horsemen with throwing axes. He has two of them. On top of that, he has the Summoners of Rage, a pretty good anti-construct choice. A very big uh, sponge for arrows, though. So the Ushapti Grapos, if they have their sense about them, will be just focusing on the Summoners of Rage and putting these guys down. On top of that, he does have a Deathcaster, so he has Spirit Leech there. Uh, he does have Chaos Marauders on the flanks and a Forsaken, something you don't see terribly often. Mirror Guard as well. So Mirror Guard are a very, very beastly infantry. They'll win most fights. They're immune to psychology against, like, Cetra. But a bunch of Forsaken, which are very, very much you know, like a glass cannon. You don't see these guys terribly often, so that's a pretty cool pick for sure. I'm really excited to see them work, hopefully, for them. I mean, I just like them. So they're a fun unit. Aspiring Champions as well, another very unorthodox pick. Um, yeah, they're going to be okay in the fight. But again, Tomb Guards with Halberds will actually poke them down. They have a fairly small HP pool. But they're also very cheap. Um, Marauder Horseman and Throwing Axes, Anti-Construct. He's probably going to be chasing the Great Bows, etc. And Archeon, the Ever-Chosen with Fireball and Burning Head. Burning Head, very good against Tomb Guard lines. Uh, the Tomb Guard, obviously, very lightly armored. Burning Head does a ton of damage against those guys. And Slayer of Kings as well. So a very cool build here from Chaos. So start when ready. Yes. It is time. <laughs> it is time. Here we go. All right. So, the battle's underway here. Uh, looks like it's going to be. Oh, I actually thought it started for a second, but the lines didn't disappear. But anyways, Chaos is going to just be blitzing in with those Forsaken. I mean, the thing is, Cetra is going to make mincemeat of those Forsaken. But really, can the Throwing Axes and Archeon... I mean, Archeon's pretty damn powerful. I mean, with his Slayer of Kings, he's going to be able to put up a huge fight against Cetra. Granted, the Blade of Petra could counteract his absurdly high melee attack, but it's going to be uh, it's going to be an interesting one. Yeah, he's got Archeon Never Chosen, which you really don't see a lot in competitive play. 
So Archeon probably going to be dropping some Fireballs right out of the gates, I would imagine. Uh, but yeah, Chaos is just going to be surging forward. A very straightforward build. Just a bunch of Forsaken. Very old school. I feel like there was like a time when Forsaken were very competitive, but maybe there was just changes to them where they... Uh, I don't know. I don't know what happened to them. Poor guys. They're, they're such a cool unit. I mean, their damage output is insane. 63 weapon damage with a charge bonus of 37. I mean, these guys just hit so goddamn hard, but... Something about them just being so squishy. I mean, it just, I don't know what it is. But anyways, Chaos is going to be advancing. It looks like the Marauders are going to be scooting forward. And on the flanks, he does have an Archeon hiding in the trees and the Marauder Horseman hiding. So the these guys are all hidden right now. So the Tomb Kings have no idea what's going on in that respect. Uh, two groups of Marauder Horsemen are throwing axes on the other side are going to be circling about, but taking Ushapti Grapeo Fire. But good micro so far from uh, Mr. Uh, ODM MG84 over there. So we'll call him 84. He's able to pull back and uh, dodge those shots and waste some of the ammunition. But now the Forsaken Bum Rush is going to be happening. Uh, he's also keeping the Summoners of Rage back. Going to be very conservative with them until the Great Bows can maybe be compromised by throwing axes or a couple other variables like that. Who knows? So the first Fireball is coming out from Archeon. So the uh, the die is cast. Archeon is now known to his opponents. Fireball is going to be going after the Necrotech. And a beautiful shot. It uh, does some good damage. Also is able to kill a Tomb Guard or two. Maybe it looks like it tore into that formation. Disc kill three Tomb Guard. But the Fireball, very good choice to just snipe out the Necrotech, get rid of that healing, and kind of mitigate some of the strength of these uh, big constructs. In the meantime, Throwing Axes are going to be bum rushing, just waiting for the Forsaken timing push. But the Forsaken are really going to do quite good against the Tomb Guard Talbots. They should on paper. However, they're one of those units that have been nerfed in the past, so I'm not sure like how it's actually going to go. But over here, Throwing Axes are going to be throwing into the uh, Tomb Guard Talbots. Not the most efficient use. Tomb Guard Talbots do have Silver Shields, and these guys do not have Shield Breaker like the Norskin variant, uh, the Norskin Foot variant. But the Forsaken charging in, the Demon Sue has taken quite a bit of damage. Other Forsaken pushing in as well. I mean, the Chaos Infantry are definitely going to be pretty cost effective here. The Halberds, though they do have decent armor piercing, definitely don't want to be fighting the Demon Sue. So Demon Sue getting the full charge bonus. Oh my god, there's like a bunch of fire trucks out there. But yes, it's going to be charging in here. Forsaken going to be chewing into these infantry. So let's take a look at the initial damage. It was like literally a fire truck right outside my house. Uh, Forsaken getting in there, doing some huge damage. Same thing going on over here. Tomb Guard with Halberds getting melted pretty quick. But Cetra's coming in, going to be riding down the Demon's Pew, and that's going to be a lot of damage coming in. So the Throwing Axes can't really find a home. If anything, they should be parked right here and should just be wasting Cetra and wasting these cap. Because if is able to just wade through the ranks here, it's going to be really bad for the Chaos Infantry. Now, Archeon is here as well. He doesn't have as good mass as Cetra, so he's not going to be able to do as he pleases. And I'm really not sure what that Burning Skull was aiming to do. It might have been a misclick, because Burning Skull does not do any damage against these type of units. That was actually a huge mistake by Chaos. If they had done the Burning Skull down here or down any of the Tomb Guard formations, that would have been extremely high value. So I honestly think that was a misclick, so a little bit of unfortunate stuff. In the meantime, Mirror Guard are fighting the Tomb Guard with Halberds. The Chaos Marauders are fighting the Spearmen on the flanks. And over here we do have Marauder Horsemen with Throwing Axes who are going to be finally coming in here. A little bit delayed. Summoners of Rage may have been forgotten in the back. Ugh, that's so unfortunate. I mean, he needs these guys. They're just such a powerhouse unit. So a couple uh, crucial, you know, misplays coming in here from uh, MG84 that may cost him the game. Now, the Bounce Power is still even. It's still contentious. It's certainly not over. Archeon does get a nice little charge here into Cetra. The Demon's View falter to the Halberd and the Necrotech, which is not cost-effective at all. Marauder Horsemen are getting really beat up. These ones are circling around, and it seems like this is like Chaos's last Bastion here. Archeon's coming in. Some Throwing Axe Fire is going to be hitting the Necropolis Knights. Archeon, of course, a pretty powerful armor-piercing unit himself. He's going to be karate chopping the Necropolis Knights, and it looks like the Dejoff's Incantation of First Blade is going to be going down, plus the Restore from the Necrotech. So beautiful play so far. I'm really liking the play here from uh, from the Tomb Kings. Black Phillip's doing a very good job, and he still hasn't remembered those uh, the Summoners of Rage. I mean, let's or we could just articulate that. Hey, you know what? He's just keeping those guys back tactically to keep them out of range of the Ushapti Great Bows, but I do not think that's the case. Now, Arcan has a free kill here. Arcan goes in and attacks a Necrotech. He could kill him in a matter of seconds which I think would be a pretty good choice. Summoners of Rage are coming from downtown finally, but they just have a long journey to make. It's straight up like the Fellowship over there. They're having to cross the, the Great Realm. Balance of Power has shifted slightly into the favor of the Tomb Kings, but man, what a, what a big old mistake here, just uh, leaving those uh, the Summoners of Rage in the back. They're going to be collapsing. I mean, if they can kill these Necropolis Knights to the man, I mean, maybe they've been out of the battle so long that Black Phillip just isn't going to be aware of their presence. And I mean, they are going to get a super optimal charge, so I don't think Black Phillip saw these guys coming. They're going to make quick work of these snake people. The snake knights are going to get pounded by the summoners. And Archeon, honestly, should just turn around and fight. Throwing axes now coming in, doing some work. Archeon has re-engaged. And that ended up not, ended up not being terrible. Um, but the Ushapti Grapos are still just reigning free. And there's, like, no infantry left for Chaos. There's the Mirror Guard down here, who, of course, are very solid. But even still, they're debuffed. They're fully surrounded. They still manage to get pretty good kills. Yeah, it's going to be pretty grim. Marauders are re-engaging. Archeon and the boys in the back were able to clean up the snake people. You can see that the Necropolis Knights of the Halberd is very, very low here. And uh, yeah, negative 12 leadership, negative 14. They're going to be retreating. And that's going to be uh, 
it's going to be all she wrote for those guys. But anyways, the rest of the battle is still relatively pitched. The Tomb Kings obviously do have an advantage, but eh, Archeon might be able to work some magic. He does have a Deathcaster as well for Spirit Leeches. And now you can see Narcopolis Knights are coming. They have, yeah, like 300 HP, negative 46. They should be going down relatively quickly. Summoners of Rage are still online. Maybe if Archeon can just move around in a big old goon squad and isolate the Ushapti Grapo somehow. The Aspiring Champions have like waded across the map and they actually finally caught the Ushapti Grapos. Their armor piercing isn't the best. They do have a pretty good weapon strength at 44, but their AP is pretty low and Cetra is just going to straight up doggy stop them. In the meantime, Mirror Guard's still fighting. Some Marauders over here on the flank fighting Skeleton Spear is a very grindy fight right there. And the Summoners of Rage actually get through and it looks like suddenly, you know, uh, 84 is coming into his own. He's starting to make the correct tactical decisions. Summoners of Rage getting on Cetra. And the Burning Skull. Ooh, that's a good Burning Skull. This could make up for earlier. So Burning Skull coming down the pipe here. Going to be roasting a ton of these Tomb King's infantry, getting a lot of value. So that was a great Skull. That was really, really good stuff. It does kind of get into the Mirror Guard, but they have enough armor not to care. And it looks like the Summoners of Rage are actually getting a ton of free damage right here on Cetra, which is really nice. And the Ushapti Grapos. Archeon working on the other group of Ushapti Grapo here. But the fact that Chaos Infantry are just kind of so out of a... Uh, out of position here. I don't know. I think that Black Phillip is probably going to take this one. His Cetra play has been pretty good, but Bounce of Power has normalized a little bit, so MG84 might be able to pull this one back for ODM. If if 84 wins this, essentially ODM wins the Clan War. If he loses it, it's going to go to Game 7, which is pretty awesome, because again, we're, we've all agreed to do the rematch. Um, both teams wanted it. And uh, the Aspiring Champions of the Low Ground do get the standard die. And the Summoners of Rage here, just, uh, yeah, tickle in the pickle, have it a good old time. Archeon never chosen. Could pretend, potentially pull the game back with a really good Burning Skull down the pipe, but there's just so many Tomb Guard with Halberds and Spears against the uh, Summoners of Rage and Archeon, I mean, who is a large target. I mean, as long as Cetra is able to kind of, you know, Tokyo Drift out of here and stay safe, I think they're going to be in pretty good shape. So, um, yeah, Tomb Guard with Halberds holding it up. The Aspiring Champion's trying to fight, but again, pretty decent armor piercing on the Halberds. The Mirror Guard's still fighting up at 73 kills. Archeon is going to be pulling back, and it looks like there's going to be a big old Chain Lightning being cast by the Summoners of Rage here. So he was uh, able to uh, get that ability off, and it looks like it's going to roast some skeletons. Not that uh, super devastating, but it's still pretty good. Chaos Infantry are grinding it out. Cetra's in there going after the Deathcaster, which is pretty good. Archeon is a little bit inundated in the back, but in a good place. He does have Summoners of Rage as well as uh, himself, who are going to be working on the Ushapu Grapos. And the Tomb Geeks are starting to look a little bit beleaguered. Uh, maybe if Cetra can get in there, the Summoners of Rage are just so beasty. And you can also see that the Marauder Horseman of Throwing Axe is going to be charging into the Spears. Cetra is a powerhouse, though. I mean, if Cetra is able to kind of stand amongst his Tomb King horde, but yeah, they're starting to get a little bit beat up. Mirror Guard have just been generating huge value. And remember, there's still Burning Skulls to be used, so Archeon could get some crazy Burning Skulls like right down this massive formation of the Tomb Kings. And that's really actually might be a really horrible situation. Somehow these Ushapi Great Bow got compromised, even with all these supporting elements nearby. So over here, Black Phillip's going to be kind of piling in. He might be able to kind of polish these guys off. I mean, I still think Tomb Kings have a decent chance to win here. Probably a, a better chance, considering the composition of their forces. But the Summoners of Rage and Archon are going to be pulling back. Marauder Horseman pulling back as well. And he still does have ammunition, but the last of the Mirror Guard and these uh, infantry here are pretty much offline. Summoners of Rage going to be charging down the hill to fight some of these guys, these other uh, skeletons, or maybe just pathing through them, but they're still going to be taking some uh, spears. Very close game. I mean, I can't believe he got like anywhere close, you know, back into this game. I really thought it was pretty much just over. So the Ushapti Summon has been dropped um, a little bit. I probably would have waited for the final battle because he can simply pull back at this point. And he still has some Marauders fighting, so he's not like breaking the rules or anything. So the Marauders are going to be fighting here and uh, negative seven leadership. So those guys are broken. And right now you can see some of the Aspiring Champions are broken off. So both armies probably going to be doing a little bit of regrouping. Fireball coming in from Archeon. And, uh, and yeah, it's going to be tagging Cetra right in the dome piece. So I'll let him know that uh, if there's no units fighting, he does still have ammunition on the Marauder Horseman. So if these guys, as long as they're throwing, which they will be in just a moment against these guys, like he's technically counts as an attacker. So I'll let him know that, uh, just give him a little bit of a rules reminder, both players must be attackers. And uh, at least using ammo on axes. So yeah, I mean, as long as he will give him a little bit of a warning here, and if he engages with the throwing axes here in a moment or some of his other troops here, looks like there is some combat going on between the uh, some of the uh, Summoners of Rage and the Summoners of who have actually caught one of the Dragon Ogres. Cetra's going to be pursuing as well, and the Marauder Horseman going to be charging in as well. So it looks like they have indeed seen the warning. Marauder Horseman going to be coming around the flank, and in the back it looks like some of the Skeleton Spearmen are going to be, be uh, pushing off these uh, yeah, Chaos Marauders. So good stuff here, chasing those guys off the battlefield. And it's a very close fight. Uh, in the back, you can see Marauder Horseman getting around the back, and they're going to be pushing in here. Those Marauders are fighting to the bitter end, so he is following the rules and definitely reacting pretty well to that warning there. And Sarcha the Imperishable uh, going to be getting hit with some throwing axes. Archeon's coming in for that bread, though. He might be able to get it. Archeon might be able to engage this bob and get like a burning skull if he's able to kind of uh, tarp at them a little bit. Throwing axes are shooting in there against Sarcha the Imperishable. Halberds over there doing their thing, but I don't know if Chaos is going to be able to pull this one out. I mean, if the Fireballs can finish off Sarcha the Imperishable, 
it, it definitely sucks that the Ushapti kind of got used in that way because uh, they're really just going to kind of dissipate here into the into the Sweet Knight. And it looks like a Fireball is going to be coming down from Archeon. He might be going in for the fight of fights. The rest of the Chaos Forces are going to be engaging in the front. It looks like the Sorcerer is going to be engaging at least. And Archeon's coming in with the Steel Chair. So Archeon's going to be attacking Cetra, getting a pretty good attack there. And uh, and yeah, honestly, Tomb Kings might just want to like sit still and just like, you know, use their shields to absorb the last of the Throwing Axe Fire. And, uh, and yeah, it's, it's going to, it's time. It's time, boys. The final fight is here, so the Setra the Imperishable is going to be getting assaulted by Archeon, as well as the Summoners of Rage. Setra needs to fall back on top of the Halberds, for sure. Chaos is going to be committing. He does have the Aspiring Champions fighting as well here in the front, so these guys looking pretty gangster fighting against these Tomb King's forces. Black Phillip, uh, it's it's a close fight. I mean, either player can pull this one out, but I think if Setra goes, that could be a little bit dicey. Setra needs to escape and just run circles and drag these guys through Halberds and Spears for all eternity. If he's able to do that, Summoners of Rage are very low. They're at negative 28 leadership, 19 right there, so they're definitely in a bit of a precarious situation. And you can see the Chaos Sorcerer with Death is going to be chasing down Setra, who does have Nero's Incantation and Protection right now. And he's done. He's doing a really good job pulling the Chaos Army through all of the Spears and Halberds, but Setra needs to live. Setra needs to live. He needs to be, like, back amongst these ranks. Oh, no, don't go this way! Because if Setra goes this way, it's going to pull him into open field right here. He's going to get slammed with the Spirit Leech. Oh, that is so disastrous. He needed to Tokyo Drift the other direction. I mean, he still might be able to win, but Setra the Imperishable is going to be falling to the Lord of the End Times, Archeon the Ever Chosen. And, uh, yeah, man. Setra's, Setra is down, but there's still a ton of Tomb Kings left. But if, if their leadership gets low, I mean, so many of them are crumbling, and Archeon's still alive. He's very, very menacing. And uh, there's some, still some throwing axes here who are going to be throwing some ammunition into these guys, I'm sure. But yeah, they're going to be engaging here in a moment, it looks like. Archeon's uh, going to be fighting. Throwing axes going into the skeleton, so he is using ammunition and counts as an attacker. And uh, let's see what else he's got going on here. He's got some Aspiring Champs, and the Mirror Guard is still fighting as well. So yeah, he has plenty of troops engaged. And the Aspiring Champs are actually somehow still alive. I mean, these guys have been doing, uh, been doing pretty good here. Let's go and look at their kills. I mean, only 34, but they cost 600, so there's some kind of give and take there. But the Chaos Sorcerer and Archeon are also both on a mount, so they do uh, have that large status. They're going to be taking extra damage from the Halberds and the Spears and some of these other units, so it certainly could, uh, you know, lead to their downfall here. So the Aspiring Champions still fighting. These guys still grinding it out. They're probably not going to be running here at this point. I think both players pretty much throwing everything they have at one another. Archeon and the Caster are going to be fighting against Tomb Guards with Halberds, which are a very elite unit. And you can see a little bit of poking damage coming onto the Chaos Sorcerer here. Some of these, uh, these Cav are going to be charging into the back. And the Mirror Guard are broken, and the Aspiring Champions are not long for this Earth. Those guys are actually going to break here in just a moment, it looks like. And, uh, man, what a just a close game. I mean, I can't believe MG84 was able to come back after, you know, forgetting about his Dragon Ogres for, like, the first, you know, half the battle, essentially. But, I mean, the Tomb Guard and the Elite of the, uh, of the Tomb King Infantry are able to actually defend that pocket over there. And, you know, these players, they're going to have to fight here. I mean, he could... He's, he, Archeon is just going to have to fight these Halberds to the death here. He has nothing else. I mean, everything else is pretty much running. Archeon's going to be staying and fighting. And, uh, yeah, the Sorcerer maybe is going to cycle charge, but, yeah, I don't know. He can do that if he wants. Archeon is very tanky. If Archeon has a Burning Skull, I think he's going to win. If he doesn't, if he doesn't, he might just get dragged down by all these Halberds. Archeon might be able to solo this. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I know. The Vortex, he missed that Vortex earlier, too. But even still, he's, he's been able to claw his way back into this game just through sheer attrition. Aspiring Champions and Archeon, pretty heavy metal stuff. But anyways... Chaos Sorcerer here is going to be jumping in. They're just going to be fighting and clubbing. And there's some Dragon... Oh, no. If they have Chain Lightning, that could be disastrous. Any sort of AoE right now will instantly win the game for the uh, for the Warriors of Chaos. But they're also getting very low. I mean, Archeon's getting Prison Shank down a little bit. But he's staying and fighting. He does have Slayer of Kings, which gives pre uh, pretty good splash damage. Summoners of Rage are just kind of lurking on the wings. Oh my gosh, this is so this is such a so many of these games today have just been just rock hard close. So the Dragon Ogres are gonna be piling in right now. Archeon's gonna be trying to refresh his stance here. Slayer of Kings has been popped, giving him massive splash damage. But I mean these are all spears and halberds and armor piercing. So it's like Archeon's at 3000 HP. Dragon Ogre is probably gonna be buckling. A couple of them actually uh, go down there and they're shattered. So now it's just this Chaos Sorcerer who's shaken. He's at uh at at you know zero leadership right now. He's he's definitely in the danger zone, and Archeon is starting to get low too. Slayer of, Kings giving, Slayer of Kings giving him so many buffs. And this is literally it. Yeah, this is literally it. I mean, this is uh, this is Archeon just fighting to the bitter end here against a bunch of Halberds. And the Chaos Sorcerer here might actually go down. Probably not. If he comes back, though, and he's able to get a couple charges off, that could be pretty nice. Archeon at 2,800 HP just fighting, doing his thing. Oh, man, what a fight. The bounce power creeping back towards the middle, but Archeon is, like, so tanky. 120 armor, 60 melee defense is just going to be crazy. Oh my god, uh, Tomb King's infantry crumbling too much. Chaos has got this. Well, perhaps. These ones are still in pretty good shape. 42 Tomb Guards with Halberds here. 48 right here. They're not crumbling. It's just the Skeleton Spears mostly are crumbling. 
And look in the distance, a group of 82 Skeleton Spearmen coming in. Archeon is getting so low, 2300 HP. And is Black Phillip going to be the hero of the Extreme Meme Team, or is uh, MG84 going to be coming in with the Steel Archeon Sword and, uh, and doing it to it? Lots of close games today. End times reversed. <laughs> but they're all crumbling. If Archeon can just hold, but he has 1900 HP, his leadership's getting low. Those anti-large halberds. Oh, but the Chaos Sorcerer coming in. That's going to lead to some crumbling for sure. So the Chaos Sorcerer came back, but immediately, immediately he regrets that decision as he takes a couple halberd pokes to the face, and he's going to be going down there. And the Chaos Sorcerer with death is going to be retreating and running off the battlefield. Man. Yeah, the Ushapti summon should have been saved. Like, if he had it now, the game would be over. It would be over. Man. And it looks like the Tomb Kings are going to pull this one back. It looks like the Tomb Kings are going to pull this one back because Archeon is in here. And, uh, yeah, he's not having a good time. He's not having a good time, guys. The Spearman broke before Nehekara did. Or the Nehekara broke before the Spearman did, right? Yeah, the, the old Kadian thing. I actually got to plug in my uh, my laptop or else it's going to die and I won't see chat. Oh. We'll, let, we'll let Archeon fight here for a minute. Oh, come on, laptop. Come back. All right, so let's go ahead and get that going. We might have been able to salvage the power, but I can't see chat for a moment, so uh, bear with me, guys. Oh my god, Archeon never chosen. 960 HP. The Tomb King Resilience. All these halberds and these other troops just, just doing their thing. And I think that might be that might be it. Let's check it out. GG. Yeah, Archeon never chosen. Popping the Slayer of Kings again, but he's at negative 13. And when he breaks, that is it. Chaos has nothing else. Man, he must have no winds of magic. One burning skull. I mean, that miscast earlier, like that, that, that could have been it. And the extreme meme team has tied up the series 3-3. And of course, a reminder for anyone who's here earlier and may have come back, uh, both teams agreed to do a rematch, just in the spirit of sportsmanship and uh, good fun. So uh, it's gonna be, it's gonna be 3-3. And let's go ahead and update the scoreboard here. Wow, what a game. All right, so we're gonna get the final competitors in here. So just give me a minute and I'm gonna jump over to Discord and make sure the lads are ready to go. And we will be back in just a moment, guys. So stay tuned for the finals. It, it'll be quick. We'll be back in like a minute or two, hopefully. So see you in a second. And we're back with the final game of the day. It's actually turned into a pretty long stream. It's almost like three hours and 15 minutes. So, um, so yeah, let's see. They're asking if they want to do the same races again. So um, let me go ahead and work out with those guys. 
and uh, yeah. Or we can do same. Yeah, we can do that if you want. Send me your blind picks. Or you two can agree. Gentlemen's. Or pick ban. So. All right. So we're just getting the last game set up here for today. And uh, we'll be ready in just a moment. And this is it. This is for all the cookies. This is for all the cookies. All the crumbles. It's time. I feel like we've been on quite a journey together. And for anyone who's joining later, I'll make sure to uh, have... have uh, Timestamps and everything uh, for for the earlier games, and it looks like we might have high elves for uh, sure. Oh boy, let me get chat back up here. Hold on a sec. Sorry, my laptop died there, so I had to like I had to like scurry and get it all fixed up. And guys, uh, we have 452 likes. If you don't mind, make sure to drop a like on the stream. I'm gonna work on the Wookie cam right now while these uh, players, these fine gentlemen, work out their uh, their their arrangements here. So ODM uh, Vengeance, Old Ones Vengeance has, or XMT, Old Ones Vengeance has picked dwarves and. Uh, I want to ban pick. So it looks like it's going to be Chaos First Dwarves. Okay. Okay, Bob. All right, hold on. So let me let me see here how I can do this. Um, okay, so if we add a second camera to the caster's desk. Um, hold on. See, that one's not going to have a green screen. Hold on here. Can you guys? How, it's, it can't quite reach, guys. I'm sorry. There's there's Wookie over there in the chair, see? But it just can't. You can't do it, unfortunately. I'll get it set up for um, for the next stream. So thank you guys for the donations, but yeah. I got to get that set up for future streams. Let's see. So these guys just working out their picks still. Uh, let me go ahead and message the clan leaders. All right. Almost ready. Yeah, it's a little wookie over there. Yeah, there was a disqualification for corner camping earlier, but uh, we decided to rematch it just in the spirit of, you know, sportsmanship and fun, so. Yes. All right. So dwarves versus chaos. Um... Cincinnati, vote for the Wookiee cam. I mean, it, it. the problem is it doesn't reach. I'd have to, like, move him over to the corner and put him in his dog bed and then put the camera down by him. Hold on, that might actually work. Hold here. <laughs> Wookiee is secretly plotting to change. Thank you so much for the donation, man. I really appreciated uh, Cincinnati of uh, VA. Cool. We're on River Amex on, which is a. Uh... It's up to you guys. You can play Skaven Dawi again. Play Skaven Dawi again if you want. Or a new match. Okay, Wookie looks like you might want down somewhere. I mean, normal like so for like if you're doing like a you know an anti tournament with prize and structure and stuff, typically you have like a pick ban system. I think we have to do a blind pick. Same. 
your picks to clan leaders if to can't resolve. Hold on. All right, Wookie. Let me, uh, I have an idea. I have an idea, but it, I'd have to go AFK for a second here. One second, get picks for your lad. Sure, are they just like negotiating on the races and stuff? So it looks like they've decided to do a blind pick, actually. Okay, fine. I gotta do it now. Hold on. I'll be right back, guys. Give me one second. Bed. All right. Oh, God damn it. Okay. So the guys are going to work it out. In the meantime, I'm just going to get Wookie's bed. I have an idea. So he can go there. Let's see here. Okay. Okay. So Wookie can go in his bed. He's happy now. He's very happy. Um, and we can get this camera across. Oh, goodness. Did that camera stay? All right. Here we go. All right, Wook. Oh my God, he's looking at it like that. Okay, so let's see how this goes. You guys ready for this? <laughs> His face, he's smelling it. Look guys, he's... Can you guys... uh? All right, let's see. Wookie. What's going on here, buddy? There you go. You go up here. Let me just like put something to make sure the camera doesn't fall. All right, there you go. It's the best I can do for now. All right, sorry about that, guys. Just had a little interruption there. Um, one second. Sorry guys, just a little bit of a uh, negotiating here. You guys like the Wookie cam? He's kind of like not looking at it. Wookie, I mean you got you're looking at me. The pop filter. That's my. That's actually a chair in the back. That's not a pop filter. That was another chair. My friend was actually watching while I was streaming. Wookie. What do you, what you got going on over there, bud? Here, let me, uh, let me hold on. Okay, that might be better. There you guys go. That, that's like a better look. Okay. All right, dwarves first chaos. All right, guys, this is it. This is the grand final, and the two players definitely taking quite some time to pick their new factions. There, they're they're both like just kind of like trying to figure it out so it took a little bit of time but 
Um, he's here. I don't know if you guys have a good look of him. Um, he, he definitely is, uh, Wookie. Hey, is that, is that just like your... Hold on, I have a, I have a, I actually have a next level idea, guys. Hold on. He's like, what's going on here? What is this? This contraption. All right, there you go. All right, is that better? All right. Um, good luck in the best. Hey, thank you so much for the donation, Mr. Uh, uh, Mikolai. Thank you. The Zloty. Jankuya. <laughs> Jankuya Bardzo. And uh, Cincinnati, thank you for the $20 donation. All right. Um, Wookie's here. Don't ask about the outlet, guys. There's a lot going on there. It's like, it's our tech hub. And we're going to see if uh, if the dwarves can take on the Warriors of Chaos. Now, historically, this is a pretty tough matchup for Chaos. I think. I mean, not for Chaos, for the dwarves. I mean, uh, sorry, I'm just so out of it. The dwarves um, are going to have to use a lot of thunders, have very good positional play, because Chaos obviously has a lot of tools with great weapons and, uh, and cha chariots and things like that. In the final match, we have uh, we have ODM uh, Vyash versus uh, XMT Old One's Vengeance, which is A-Move Hacker. So both players are picking their armies right now. Let me go ahead and take a look. Yeah, the Chaos Army looks as expected, and the Dwarf Army looks as expected. Yeah, both players, both players, perhaps, perhaps a little bad blood here between these two for the earlier disqualification. Some drama. I feel like we need some drama in the Total War community. But yeah, as soon as the battle loads in, I will switch to the battle screen so you guys can see that. So you guys can just take a look at Wookie. And I set up a Wookie camera. There's a Wookie camera. He's, he's a celebrity now. <laughs> you know, we had to we had to spice it up a little bit with the Wookiee. The Wookiee cam. All right, guys. So we're here in the grand finals. Tied up 3-3 in this clan war. And we're going to have the Cha Warriors of Chaos against the Dwarves. Now, Chaos has a pretty good matchup here, like I said. Chariots and Great Weapons just extremely cost-effective. They can typically just go with Warp Chicken, who's pretty much impervious to missile fire. He can just ride through the ranks, cause disruption, disrupt the missile lines. And, uh, yeah. It's time. So let's go ahead and jump over here. Oh, man, you guys want the Wookiee cam, don't, don't you, though? Because he's going to get... It's going to go here when I go to the battle. I like, I'm like, oh, I don't want to go to it, but... All right. Here we are. All right, guys, and here in the finals, the rematch from earlier, we have the uh, Old One's Vengeance, so A-Move Hacker is going to be leading the army of the Dawi, and he's going to be uh, facing off against uh, Vyash, who's going to be uh, using Chaos. I was about to say losing Chaos. Definitely not. I mean, this Chaos army is very, very strong. So so for Chaos, uh, as you would expect, an entire front line of Great Weapons. Great Weapons, Great Weapons into the Sunset. A couple of Marauders just to get troop saturation and the ability to swarm around the flanks. But yeah, just going into the Sunset with Marauders and Great Weapons. And he even has a group of Chosen. Now you can see here he's going to be utilizing the trees, which is a very good tactic. Obviously, you don't want to be taking that Dawi fire in open field. And uh, and yeah, on top of that, he does have a couple Chariots. So standard Chaos Chariots, not going for the heavy AP Chariots, opting to go a little bit cheaper and a little bit wider. So he does have two standard Chariots as well. For his Lord, I believe he does have the KFC Kinks somewhere around here, just eating his buckets in the trees. Let's go ahead and figure out where he might be. And in the back, yeah, Sartorial, final transmutation, which is good. Dwarves tend to blob up towards the end of the game, so it's going to be useful against, like, you know, pretty much, uh, you know, all those kind of guys. He does also have one group of Marauder Throwing Axes, probably to keep it honest against Gyrocopter play. And for the Dawi, looks like he has a Rune Lord and very, very good spatial analysis. So the Extreme Meme team coming out with the Dawi Thunder here. And yeah, he's got Miners in the front line, combination of Miners, Dwarf Warriors, Longbeards, Secondary Line, just Onions for days, Gun Lines for days. This is Dwarf play. This is, this is true Dwarf play. Just going super wide and having Crossfire with all your guns. I mean, Chaos will win all the individual infantry fights, but if you can pull them through the mud a little bit, you can do pretty well for yourself. So, cool stuff. I'll let him know to uh, start when ready. And it's go time. A-Move's going to corner camp. No, he's not. He's not going to, Reginald. He's, uh, the, the corner is, like, over here. So, yeah, he's, he's in a very fair position right now. Mm -hmm. Ugh. Let's see. 
Um, yeah, Xyphos, there, there was no issue like regarding them playing their original factions. I told them that they have the option. They can play the same matchup as before, or they can just, you know, pick again. Like, like a fresh start. Perhaps I should have articulated a little bit better, but for the most part, it's it doesn't matter. I mean, Chaos has a really good matchup for Storbs anyway, so... I mean, it should be a, a good matchup regardless. Yeah. And it's time, guys. Here we go. Here come the Dwarves. Dwarves are going to be marching forward, actually, so it looks like they're going to be surging forward a little bit. A tiny bit of lag coming in here, but for the most part, um, yeah, should be okay. Chaos is going to be marching forward as well with all their great weapons and the Chaos Chariots, which are, look like they're going to be taking like a steep kind of a drive down the Dwarf formation here. Same thing on the far side. So one Chariot on both sides to really kind of collapse on the Jawi Wings. And honestly, if the Chariots want to use the, the kind of the Shroud of the Trees and sneak up on the Miners, they can kill the Miners very, very quickly. Now, over here in the forest, we do have the first of the engagement. The Miners are going to be throwing some Blasting Charges against Marauder Horsemen. But it looks like the Horsemen might actually be charging in on these Miners to nullify their uh, their Blasting Charges. And Miners have pretty pitiful combat stats, so it's not a, it's not a terrible choice. And uh, yeah, the rest of the army is going to be advancing here. Thunders are going to be shooting downtown, going into the uh, Marauder Horsemen. But again, they're in the tree, so they're not going to be taking much damage. And they also do bait out some Blasting Charges. So pretty even trade for both players in terms of just raw resources exchanged. So yeah, the Dwarf Formation definitely looking pretty solid. He does have a Rune Lord, who's going to be using the Master Rune, I would imagine. So he has a Rune Lord with no Ruins. That is very strange. I mean, maybe he's just trying to go as cheap as possible, but that is something I... I mean, at the very least, take Master Rune to Wrath and Ruin. It is so good against Chaos, but regardless, we're going to see if the, the Runeless Rune Lord can uh, win this game. So Chaos is going to be moving forward. Chaos Marauder is going to be engaging the uh, the front line and the Longbeards. Same thing on the other side. And the Chaos Warriors are going to be pushing into the secondary line where they will be taking some uh, Thunder Fire. So a lot of it's going to come down to the Chariot play. We're going to see if Vyash can do uh, be you know pretty efficient here. But yeah, Chariot's definitely so good against Dwarves. But you can see this. Very good positioning here from uh, from Old Vengeance here, uh, from the Old One's Vengeance, who is a move hacker. He's able to get some really good Thunder Fire into the Chariots who are going to be sweeping in. And on the other side... We have a similar... I mean, there's a lot of Dwarf stuff up here, but maybe Chaos just wants to ignore, ignore this position and push up the middle. I don't know. It's a little bit of a tough position to uh, kind of work with. Chaos Words with Great Open is going to be moving forward. Obviously, we'll cleave through the Miners. And he does have a Gorby's Chariot up here, but there's Thunders, two groups waiting. I mean, that's a little bit of a, a scary situation to be in. Now, the Chaos Warriors and the uh, KFC King have engaged in the front line. He's going to be drumstick slamming some of these guys. Chaos Warriors fighting Dwarf Warriors, which is a good engagement. Marauders definitely took a lot of blasting charges and aren't in the best shape, but the Chariots are now free. So very, very good play here from Biash. He's able to get the Chariots in the back, and he's going to be riding amok just getting into the Dwarf Thunders. Now, if he can pull through and get like straight into that second group of Thunders and just keep that disruption kind of going... So the front line can then win, because obviously he has a much better front line. I mean, he's losing on the Marauder battles, but aside from that, he's in pretty good shape. And he's actually keeping some troops in reserve, the Chosen and the Chaos Marauders. I don't know if that's intentional, but he certainly is uh, kind of keeping those guys in the wings and being very patient there. So the Chariots in the back have been gunned down by a move Hacker. Those guys are in a little bit of trouble, but, you know, Vyash still has a lot of infantry. Uh, the Warp Chicken's in good shape. Chaos Warriors with Great Opens should win this fight. They're going to win this fight. And they actually lost the center versus the Longbirds, which I guess is to be expected. And he has his Marauder Horsemen uh, sneaking around the back and kind of hiding in the trees, which uh, is not a bad choice. So the Chariot's though kind of getting gunned down a little bit. It looks like the Warp Chicken might be getting ready for a final transmutation, but the Chariot play, maybe keep it a little bit higher and tighter on the periphery away from the central Thunder line, because it seems like they're just getting so much value with this uh, kind of spatial control. I mean, very, very good Dawi battlefield control. It's definitely pretty masterous here. Uh, Sartorial's in good shape though. Chaos Warriors winning here. Uh, some of the Marauders are going to be coming in. Chaos Warriors also winning that fight. So the infantry fight is going very well, but aside from that, the Chaos backline harass has been Maybe just being a little bit more patient with the harass. Uh, he's going to be charging in here. These Chaos Warriors will clean through these miners. So there's some give and take. But having all of those Thunders be online is definitely a little bit scary. Uh, but Sarthorial is pushing through the middle. You can see the Rune Lord is, uh, you know, surrounded by great weapons and also some Marauders and different things like that. But just leave the great weapons there. They should be able to win that eventually. And a big old final transmutation going down, which does slap the Dragonback Slayers and the regular Slayers. So a very good cast right there uh, by Vyash. But it looks like, uh, you know, the XMT A move hacker here is doing a pretty good job with the Thunders. Just kind of shooting downtown. And yeah, just just going into the Chosen. But the Chosen have emerged from the trees, but Ava Packer is very, very privy to this. He sees those guys coming out. He's going to be turning, allocating all of his resources here. And the Chaos Marauders are going to be uh, you know, charging back in there to butter the bread of these dwarves. But obviously, Ava Packer seems to be a very experienced dwarf player. He's pulling apart a lot of these Chaos Forces, and the Bounce Power is slightly in the favor of the dwarves, but there's still some backline pressure coming in. So you can see here the Thunders here getting compromised by the Marauder Horsemen and Throwing Axes. They're going to be turning to shoot, but if he can kind of turn and just cycle amongst these guys, the Chaos Infantry will eventually win the grind fight. Up on the high ground, Chaos Warriors with uh, weapons need to collapse down here. They need to get on these Thunders right now. Otherwise, this group is just going to get free fire on those, those Chaos Warriors. So it's just so micro-intensive. But you can see here, Vyash has gotten the Chosen through. They were able to kill these Iron Drakes and Troll Hammer Torpedoes. So some of the range tools for the Dwarves are finally starting to be compromised. But still, the Dawi have some healthy positions. Up here, this is pretty good. Having two Thunders cross-firing some Chaos Warriors. But this is a big thing. Vyash needs to get these Chaos Warriors and turn them to just either fight these Miners 
or swerve up and over the top and potentially take those guys out. So Chaos Warriors are being crossfired a little bit. They're going to get into melee with those guys, which is going to be tough. But the Chaos Grind down here is going pretty well, I suppose. The Marauders are being beaten down, but two groups of Chaos Warriors pretty healthy. And the Chosen are still fighting, but they've also taken a ton of Thunder Fire. Marauder Horsemen, definitely heroes of the people here, uh, able to disrupt the back line and the Thunders. There's two groups up there, which are in pretty good shape. But yeah, Chaos Warriors just fighting. I mean, down here, they should be able to beat the Longbeards, and they might even be able to get the Rune Lord. But it looks like he's going to be pushing through. And same thing over here. He noticed that he was a little bit tar pitted. He was fighting those miners for too long. He's going to be pushing them up here and trying to get into the back. But the balance power is pretty even. I wouldn't say anyone's in a super decisive position, but it's certainly a very, very close fight. And uh, yeah, so our Thoyle's just kind of slam dunking, just space jamming those guys. Dragonback Slayers are going to be rushing up here to attack the Warp Chicken. They do, of course, have that slowing effect, but it looks like he's going to be going back here to disrupt the uh, Thunders. And I mean, he has massive disruption capabilities. Now, over here, it's a little bit tough. Uh, these these uh, Marauder Horsemen definitely are going to want to charge back in and uh, get on top of these Thunders. These Chaos Warriors from Viash need to kind of swerve in here and get on these guys. And if you can do that, I think he'll be in okay shape. Now, these Great Opens are going to be coming down here, but Thunders, as far as speed, 28 against the 28 of Chaos Warriors. So the exact same. And the problem for Chaos is that he has two groups firing here. So he can simply crossfire these guys. And he's pretty good on ammo. I mean, he has ample ammunition. Chosen are still fighting down here in the pits, doing pretty good for themselves. But, uh... It's looking like the dwarves are in a relatively good position. I would say that they're uh, they're doing pretty well. It looks like someone might have had a question or something. So, uh, Old One's Vengeance says GG. Well, it's a little bit early to call GG, that's for sure. Anyways, the Chaos Warriors are going to be charging down the hill, attacking the Thunders. And over here, we also have Sarthoriel the Ever Chicken, who is marked by Ulthar. So, he is going to lose some of that sweet missile resist he does indeed have. And, uh, yeah, the uh, Thunder is going to be shooting downtown, going after the, uh, the Big Bird himself. Let's look around the battlefield. So Chaos doesn't have too much left. They have some Chosen over here still fighting, who obviously will win against those Slayers, but still the Slayers are going to hold them in place. Chaos Warriors marching over here, but the Miners should be able to intercept them. The Thunder Fire has been quite masterful here, doing a very, very good job. And I definitely think the Dawi have this game. I mean, it was it was like textbook Dwarves. The one thing that's a little bit unorthodox, in my opinion, is maybe the Trollhammer Torpedoes, and they didn't seem to do too much, but the Thunder is like just spreading them out and forcing Chaos to kind of march through the mud is just such a good tactic. And the Chariots, I think, might have gone in a little bit too early. I think they just kind of, like, got gunned down. Maybe they should have waited for the Chaos Infantry to saturate the battlefield a little bit more. And then from there, they could have uh, done a little bit more. So so that's uh, probably going to be it here. Yeah. And you can see here that the uh, the Marauders in the back kind of get gunned down. Some Chaos Warriors having a pretty good fight here, obviously. Probably a ton of kills in them, 71. And... Uh, Let's go ahead and see what else is going on. Yeah, just some Chosen Chaos Warriors across the battlefield pretty much crumbling. And the Warp Chicken, I mean, is able to cause some disruption up here and actually uh, tear out some of the Thunders, but there's just so many Dragonback Slayers and good tools against him, and even the volume of fire coming in from the Thunders easily could finish off Warp Chicken despite his missile resist. It's a lot of, uh, it's a lot of firepower for sure. It's a lot of firepower. Oh, man. All right, so Thunders are going to be shooting downtown, uh, going after the Warp Chicken. He has 2,451 HP left. Uh, Trollhammer Torpedo coming in with their bonus for Sarge. Chaos has some, you know, warriors fighting, but really, that's going to be all she wrote. And the dwarves are going to pull this one out. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty wild seeing a runeless rune lord. I mean, he really was just kind of stretching it to the bitter end to get, like, as much. I mean, his dwarf play was really good. That was, like, that's what you do. Wookie's like, I've had enough of my, my camera. I'm leaving the, the camera now. Okay, buddy. You've paid your dues. You've paid your dues, little friend. All right, guys. GG's. GG's to everyone. Apologies for some of the, uh, you know, confusion with some of the rules and the rematches and some of the structural stuff today and uh, some of the difficulty getting players in games, but I will absolutely have timestamps. I want to say big thanks to uh, both of these clans here, to ODM and XMT. It was certainly a lot of fun and uh, ended up being a 4-3 uh, for XMT, if I'm not mistaken. So they were able to pull that one back. But yeah, really, really well played to both teams. Uh, and big thanks to Shidoku as well as Professor Pipes. So ODM Shidoku and uh, Professor Pipes were the gentlemen who helped uh, organize this event and, uh, you know, got all the players ready. And, of course, it's a little bit tricky when you're working with, you know, uh, 14 different players from different time zones. It, like, you know, totally can uh, change things. And some people can't see lobbies and things like that. So it can be a little bit tough. But, uh, yeah, big thanks to those guys. And sorry if there was any confusion regarding that last match and repicking the races. I basically told the players they could just pick a new matchup if they want. I mean, and, and they could play the same races if they want. But he opted to play Chaos instead of Skaven, which... Chaos has a better chance against Warps and Skaven, so looks like that was it. Yeah, Trollhammer Torpedoes are good. They're just not my typical playstyle. I think more so you usually just see more Thunders because they're just so cost-effective and the range is better. Um, yeah. And that was it. That was it for now. 4v4. Yeah, the Dragon... Xyphos' game was, I think, one of the highlights with his Dragon. That play was incredible. He did such a damn good job with that. Oh, you're good, man. Yeah. So we're uh, we're pretty much wrapped up for today, guys. We're gonna we're gonna call it. It's been almost four hours. 
somehow this extended to quite a marathon of a stream, but that's okay. And uh, yeah, guys, if you guys uh, know of any other clans who want to go at it or, you know, have any suggestions for the format, typically they had their, their matchups and races picked beforehand, but obviously with some of the minor nuances, we had to change things up. So yeah, no, the Book of Grudges has been satisfied. And I think it might be a little bit late for, I know it's uh, pretty late over in France right now, so I, I'll talk to the guys and see if they want to do something. But I have a feeling that we're probably going to be calling it a, a go for today. Hey, yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. Hopefully you guys had fun. And let's go ahead and go through and make sure to give a special thanks to everyone. So big thanks to uh, Cincinnati US of VA uh, for several donations uh, for the Wookiee cam that we set up. Uh, Mikolai for the uh, PLN, Wicker, Nipple, uh, tip jar for Wookiee. Garrett, another two. Philip, another 10 as Lottis. Thank you. And Cincinnati with another fat 20. King Adjazal, Jason Denny, Cincinnati again. Professor Pipes with multiple donations supporting Clan XMT. Garrett, uh, Garrett Ratchford, we answered your gyrocopter question, hopefully. Anti Mage, uh, Cincinnati again. Oh my goodness, man. You donated a lot today. Thank you, man, so much. Um, Dasakt for the 10 euros. Holy Pilgrim for the fat 20. Klimbet for the 50 SEK, which I believe is Swedish, if memory serves. And uh, on top of that, Sinker, Jason. Airsick Hydra, we still have to play our uh, Battlefleet Gothic. We will do that this week. Sorry, I've just been caught up with a bunch of stuff. And Italian Spartacus, Professor Pipes, and Grant. And then also we have the gentleman over on PayPal. Don't want to forget that. We have uh, Cedric and uh, Gregor. All right. So I think we wrapped it up for today. I think everyone's probably going to want some rest now. And uh, hopefully you guys had fun with that. Yeah, we're gonna. I'm going to go eat. It's time. All right, guys. So thank you so much for joining. We'll see you on the uh, flip side. You can see here that the Wookiee bed has been abandoned. So the camera there, he's uh, he's left. So he's he's lost interest in his his webcam. Yeah, that's pretty funny. But um, that's it for today. So thanks again for joining, guys. And we will see you in the next couple days. Cheers.